so many people here. Um, welcome to this first Bank Watchers Conference, which has jointly been organised by the Money Macro and Finance Society and King's College London. My name is Paul Mizzen, I'm the chairman of the MMF, and I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you on behalf of both MMF and King's. It's a great pleasure today to see so many current and former MPC members here, and of course lots of uh, Bank Watchers as well, and to welcome Sir Dave Ramsden, who's going to be giving us a speech in just a few minutes. Um, Dave is a, <laughs> a very suitable choice for opening this conference because he wears three hats. Uh, Deputy Governor for Markets and Banking, of course, at the Bank of England, but also Chairman of the MMF and a visiting professor at King's. So he manages to cover all the bases and is a great, has three points of contact with this conference. So we're really grateful to have Dave with us. Um, before Dave speaks, I just want to say a few things to set, to set out some of the thinking that we have behind this Bank Watchers Conference. Um, our intention, first of all, is to make this a regular event. So this is the first of what we hope will be many uh, and we'll hold it every year. Um, and we want it to be a forum to discuss issues that are relevant to all policy areas of the bank. So that includes monetary policy, but also financial policy and regulation issues. And to meet the needs of bank watchers, whether here in the city, in think tanks, academia, or the media. So uh, we en encourage um, interaction from all of you uh, as we give opportunity to uh, ask questions. And next year, we've unfortunately had to turn many people away today. You can see the venue is pretty full. Uh, we'll choose a larger venue next time and hopefully be able to accommodate more of the demand that there is for this event. But we hope that this event will prove as successful as its older siblings in other countries, the Monetary Policy Forum in Chicago and the Bank ECB Bank Watchers Conference in Frankfurt. And whether that happens will really depend on whether this conference consistently focuses on the right topics and whether we have a genuine debate on those topics. And, and much of that depends on our in involvement in that uh, debate that we have today. So I should also say that it, uh, we've put a program together based on very topical issues, but if you have ideas for future topics, please uh, let uh, me or Richard Barwell or Dave Aikman know about this, and uh, we'd be very happy to discuss with you. The quality of the debate will depend no small part on the questions and interventions that you have make from the audience. So if you have interesting questions that you would think we should be addressing, please let us know. Um, the chairs will try to make as much time as possible during this conference for discussion. Uh, but if I could ask you to keep your comments short and to the point, that would really help us because we have a very packed program. And then as many people as possible can participate, and that would be very much appreciated. So back to th this session, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Sir Dave Ramsden, Deputy Governor for Markets and Banking. He joined the bank to become Deputy Governor in September 2017 and started a second term, five-year term this year. And as a member of the Monetary Policy Committee, the Financial Policy Committee, and the Prudential Regulation Committee, Dave spans all the main policy committees of the bank. He's the ideal person to open this Bank Watchers Conference. So he will speak today on the subject of that was the year that was. And after the speech, he'll take questions. So just a reminder, we'd be grateful if those questions could be short uh, to allow as many people as possible to ask their questions. So over to Dave. Thank you. Thanks very much for that introduction, Paul, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. I'm particularly pleased that I have close links with the two institutions, uh, the Money Macro and Finance Society and King's College London, who have organised this first back Bank Watchers Conference. Um, I noticed in uh, Paul's introduction that he talked about three points of contact, which as a rock climber, I'm, uh, I'm familiar with the concept of, uh, but I won't attempt any rock climbing uh, imagery for the rest of my speech, at least. So, um, look, in the spirit of the 60-year-old TV programme that inspired my title, I want to give my personal review of why the economy, and in particular inflation, turned out to be very different over the past year, and suggest some potential consequences for the MPC's approach to forecasting the economy and setting policy to hit the 2% inflation target. As a member of the MPC, I hope to be able to do justice to how our thinking has evolved, but I should stress at the outset that these are personal observations, which will nevertheless hopefully help set the scene for debate and discussions at this conference today, 
which Paul was just encouraging us to have. Now, in my other monetary policy speeches this year, I focused on the impact of shocks. Today, I'm going to look more through the lens of the uncertainty generated by those shocks, which has made the course of the economy in general and inflation in particular increasingly hard to predict. Uncertainty has come not just from new shocks hitting the economy, most notably huge increases in energy prices, but also from unexpected developments, particularly in the labour market, as well as from other sources, like the ongoing impact of Brexit and the pandemic. Now, economic uncertainty can be illustrated in various ways. The chart here shows a market-based measure of volatility, two years ahead, the horizon for monetary policy, which has been on a sustained and steeply rising trend over the last year, and spiked very recently at a much higher level, even than during the global financial crisis. Now, without wishing to downplay all of you uh, gathered here today, the bank watchers who matter most for whether the MPC meets its target of getting inflation back to 2% are households and businesses. Uncertainty is impacting directly on them, undermining their confidence to make decisions and plan ahead, and adding to what is already a very challenging economic situation in the face of the cost of living crisis and tightening financial conditions. Now, I want to frame my observations by going back 12 months. At that point, a year ago, the economy was recovering from the worst of the COVID pandemic and CPI inflation had started to rise. Market expectations then showed a 50-50 chance that bank rate would be increased from 0.1% to 0.2%, to 2.5% at the upcoming December 2021 MPC meeting. The MPC had recently published its November 2021 NPR, the forecast summarised here. The MPC forecast that GDP would continue to grow, though at a slowing rate, at 2.9% in the year to 2022 Q4. CPI inflation would rise in the short term, reaching a peak of 4.3% in 2021 Q4, before falling back to 3.4% by 2022 Q4, and be close to the 2% target by 2023 Q4. Other forecasters were predicting a similar outlook for activity, although their average CPI inflation forecast for 2022 Q4 was somewhat lower than ours at 2.7%. In its November 2021 NPR, the MPC stressed that there was a high level of uncertainty around the outlook, including for energy prices. The bank's forecasts at the time were conditioned on the declining futures curve for energy prices for the first six months of the forecast, but were assumed flat thereafter. And on that basis, the MPC concluded that, quotes, while the risks around energy prices are judged to be on the downside, those towards wage growth are judged to be skewed to the upside. Fast forward a year, and the November 2022 NPR forecast shows just how much has changed for the worse. Inflation is now expected to peak at 10.9% this quarter, over three times higher than was forecast only a year ago, before falling sharply from the middle of 2023 to well below target by 2024 Q4. With the economy already likely to be in a recession, which is forecast to be prolonged, GDP growth is negative in the year to 2023 Q4 and 2024 Q4. To, to end up 7.5% below what was forecast a year ago. Despite much weaker growth, unemployment looks likely to be lower in 22Q4 than was forecast a year ago, and wage growth is forecast to be much higher, 5 and 3 quarter percent compared with 1 and a quarter percent. As the recession is forecast to deepen, unemployment rises sharply throughout the forecast period. A significant degree of spare capacity opens up, and wage growth falls back. In response to significantly higher and more persistent inflation, the MPC has increased bank rate at every meeting in the intervening 12 months, from 0.1% to 3%. The latest forecasts were conditioned on market expectations, showing bank rate peaking at 5.25%, over 4% higher than the peak expected a year ago. Now, I want to review four of the main sources of uncertainty over the last year and draw out their interactions as well as their implications for the persistence of inflation, since this is the key feature of the MPC's latest forecast and the focus for our monetary policy decisions. First, energy prices. 
Whilst these had started to rise from late 2020, gas prices in particular started to accelerate more quickly a year ago in the build-up to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This shock was unexpected, large, and passed through quickly to consumer prices. As a net importer of energy, the sustained terms of trade shock to the UK from persistently high energy prices and from the smaller but still significant increase in food prices and manufactured imports, which has also taken place, has left the UK economy poorer. These price shocks have been the single biggest driver of the recession and very high inflation the UK, is having, the UK economy is having to contend with. The ratcheting up in gas futures prices has been a feature for most of this year. At the time of the August NPR, the futures curve peaked at 450 pence per therm, which would have implied average household energy, energy bills of three and a half thousand pounds from October 2022, nearly three times higher than a year earlier. Now, although the futures curve has fallen back since and remains on a declining trend into the medium term, persistence has become more evident. In the November 2022 NPR, the MPC moved to adopting the full futures curve for the conditioning assumption for the forecast of energy prices. In November 2021, energy prices directly accounted for only 0.8% of the inflation forecast uh, for the current quarter, compared to a direct impact of 3.8% in the latest forecast. Energy prices are also the biggest driver of the sharp decline in CPI inflation forecast in the middle of next year, contributing 2.7 percentage points of the forecast fall of 5.7 percentage points in CPI inflation, leaving inflation at 5.2% in 2023 Q4. Volatility of gas prices has also been a key feature. Greater security of European supply through this winter has helped ease pressures, but there remain significant concerns about next winter. And in November, the MPC flagged that a persistently higher path for energy prices remains a possible alternative scenario. And given the uncertainties and balance of upside risks, we incorporated a histo an historically large upside skew on our inflation forecast. <clears throat> Back at the time of the November 2021 NPR, most MPC members were concerned that the end of the furlough scheme could be material for near-term developments in the labour market, as some of the estimated 1 million workers still on furlough when the scheme ended in September 2021 moved into unemployment. The November NPR forecast was for unemployment to rise to 4.5% in 2021 Q4. As the economy recovered, employment remained resilient and unemployment actually fell to 4.1% after the end of the furlough scheme, only slightly higher than its level prior to the pandemic at the end of 2019. Successive NPR forecasts in 2022 have remained too pessimistic about the near-term path of unemployment. Rather than slowing as demand in the economy has slowed, demand for labour has remained resilient, at least until recently. Unemployment fell further through this year and at 3.6% in the three months to September, remains close to its recent 50-year low. Although labour demand has eased more recently, the level of vacancies remains high and recruitment dif difficulties remain widely reported in surveys of, form, of firms. This sustained tightness has been driven by a much weaker recovery in the participation rate post-pandemic in marked contrast to most OECD, OECD countries. Evidence for this participation puzzle for the UK only really emerged in the spring. Six months on, the causes remain unclear, though the latest survey evidence suggests some of this activity re reflects people with long-term sickness and those who have decided to retire early. Many more people moving into inactivity now say they don't want a job compared to the period after the global financial crisis. This points to the role of labour supply effects rather than cyclical weakness in labour demand and indicates that this increase may be persistent as there is a much lower flow rate into unemployment compared to those who want a job. Sorry, much slower, lower flow rate into employment compared to those who want a job. As such, it is one example of a pattern for recent shocks to have as much or more impact on the supply side than the, the demand side for the economy, which further complicates assessment of the economy and the appropriate 
policy response. As the MPC has learned more about the labour market, the trough in unemployment has been revised down in successive forecasts over the last year. However, such is the weakness of demand from the recession in activity that unemployment is forecast to rise from the start of 2023 throughout the three years of the forecast. The sustained labour market tightness seen to date, together with the influence of much higher inflation, have, have led to nominal pay growth increasing materially through 2022, at a consistently faster rate than expected in successive forecasts. Annual growth of private sector regular pay reached 6.6% in the three months to September. It is forecast to rise slightly further in the near term before falling back as unemployment rises, spare capacity opens up, and as inflation falls. Increasing evidence of second round effects in wage and price setting has been a key focus of the MPC over the last year. Given the size and duration of the price increases from energy, food and other price shocks, this is not surprising. It's also been reflected again, not surprisingly, in the pickup in the various measures of short term inflation expectations, which the MPC monitors closely. What would be more of a co concern is if increased short-term persistence of actual inflation was reflected in an increase in medium-term inflation expectations, as this would suggest inflation expectations might be becoming de-anchored from the 2% inflation target. Having increased during much of 2022 for households and businesses, medium to longer-term measures of inflation expectations have shown signs of easing back more recently. The October Decision Maker Panel Survey of Businesses showed that three year ahead CPI inflation expectations fell from a peak of 4.8% to 4%. Households inflation expectations as measured by the YouGov Citigroup survey eased from their August highs. The most reliable market-based measure of longer term inflation expectations shown in the turquoise line on this chart was on a sustained upwards trend through 2021 and into 2022, peaking at 4.7% in March it's been volatile around a declining trend since, albeit one distorted by the LDI episode. But whilst this latest trend is encouraging, it remains well above its long run average, shown by the, the uh, horizontal turquoise line, and further above its average than the equivalent measure for the euro area. In a higher inflation environment, some research has found that the distribution of inflation expectations can also matter. Views differ about the salience of this kind of historical research for the UK's current situation, but it does suggest that during, rounds of high, during periods of high inflation, such as those experienced in the US in the 70s, the change in the standard deviation and skew of expectations in, sur in survey results might signal risk to a de-anchoring of inflation expectations, even if the median doesn't change. In the UK, we've seen some signs from the bank's market participant survey and the decision maker panel survey of businesses of expectations becoming more skewed to the right over 2022 relative to previous years, with a larger share of respondents expecting higher inflation in the medium term. There's a range of views amongst members of the MPC as to whether developments in inflation expectations and the potential for them to become de-anchored add to the other risks around the inflation outlook. My concerns about the emergence of and embedding of an inflationary mentality has been one of the factors contributing to my minority votes for a faster pace of tightening, first in February and again in September this year. Global financial markets have been increasingly volatile over the last year, in particular as markets have responded to increasing evidence of persistence in inflation and central banks' policy actions and communications in reacting to that. The last year has been characterized by large moves in exchange rates and falls in risky asset prices, but the repricing of government bonds and of expectations for monetary policy have been particularly striking. Significant UK-specific factors emerged in September and October this year, which have been covered in detail elsewhere. The UK policy premium, which opened up, have now disappeared. The cumulative increase in yields on UK 10-year gilts over the last year is now very close in line with the change in US and, US and German 10-year bonds. Having peaked at 4.6% in late September, yields on 10-year gilts were back down at 3.2% at close yesterday. 
their level at the start of September. UK fiscal policy developments in response to the energy price shock have been a key contributor to the outlook for inflation. In early September, the government announced an energy price guarantee for households and a business equivalent to cap average energy bills at £2,500 up until April 2023. In the autumn statement on the 17th of November, the government announced an increase in the cap to £3,000 for the year to April 2024. Energy prices would otherwise have been significantly higher and more volatile given expected wholesale gas prices as embodied in the futures curve. The autumn statement extension of the EPG looks broadly consistent with the working assumption that the MPC made in the November NPR forecast. Overall, as set out in the, in the November NPC minutes, the EPC, EPG provides much more certainty about the near-term path for inflation, reducing the peak in CPI inflation by more than two percentage points and bringing it forward to Q4. The EPG and the accompanying more targeted measures also provide more support for household incomes and demand, and therefore more upwards pressure on inflation in the medium term. The autumn statement also included a number of measures that will significantly tighten the fiscal position in the medium term, pushing down on activity and inflation. However, the vast majority of these measures do not come into effect until April 2025, so will have very little effect over the MPC's three-year forecast horizon, relative to what was assumed in the November MPC. The MPC will be able to take full account of the autumn statement in its December policy round and its February forecast. However, given the ongoing uncertainties, global and UK markets remain febrile and sensitive to economic and financial developments. Those putting a forecast together recently have faced the challenge of what to assume about the market implied path of interest rates. In the November NPR forecasts, the MPC shortened the window for the conditioning assumption on market expectations of bank rate. This gave a path for expected bank rate, which still peaked at five and a quarter percent, and which together with all the other assumptions and judgments resulted in a forecast for a more prolonged recession and forecast inflation declining to well below the 2% target by the end of the second year of the forecast and to zero by the end of the third year. In response, the MPC took the unusual collective step of communicating that we thought the assumption for bank rate on which the forecasts were conditioned was too high. Now, I've set out some of the key sources of uncertainty over the last year and how the MPC adapted our forecast assumptions and judgments in response. Now, I want to bring together in one place some personal observations on how the MPC has developed its approach to the forecast and to setting and communicating monetary policy and how that has framed my thinking on policy. In a speech I gave back in July 2021, I set out the hope that as the influence of the pandemic waned, the MPC would be able to rely more on its forecast to navigate a path for setting policy to meet the inflation target. Things haven't turned out that way. The modal forecast presented in the text tables and charts of this speech, together with the mean forecast where, where we've introduced a skew, remains the best collective judgment of the MPC and a useful framing device. But speaking for myself, it remains further away, even than it was a year ago, from determining my thinking on the economy and therefore my policy response. At different times, and particularly since the pandemic struck in March 2020, the MPC has made increasing use of scenarios as a way of illustrating alternative possible futures on the basis of different assumptions or judgments, assuming other things equal. Over the last year, I've increasingly thought of the forecast as more of a baseline scenario out of a range of possible scenarios representing the future. But given the high degree of uncertainty at present, the assumption of all else equal is harder to maintain, particularly the further one gets into the future. To give an example, over the next two or three quarters, my assessment is that unemployment is likely to stay at, at close to its current level and perhaps move up to 4% as demand in the GDP and uh, demand and GDP in the economy remain weak. But I'm materially less confident that after that, unemployment will pick up quite markedly to end 2023 at close to 5%, as in the NPR forecasts, which are built up consistent with the past relationship between GDP and unemployment. There are many other judgments in the forecast where the risks for me are more balanced, but similarly uncertain, 
given the sources of uncertainty present. Now, I'm not advocating ignoring the forecast in the framing and setting of policy and relying instead on current spot economic data, but I do support the MPC continuing to be more explicit in recognising the uncertainties inherent in the future part of the economy and in the forecasting process. One consequence of this approach is that I'm more sensitive to errors in the short-term forecast than I am to forecast changes further out. A cross-check on the MPC forecast is to compare with other forecasters, which we facilitate by including an annex on other forecasters' expectations in every MPR. Because the period running up to the November MPC was marked by particular volatility in financial markets, other forecasts were more likely than usual to be based on different assumptions to the MPR forecasts. Even allowing for that, the differences are noteworthy, though also reflective of the uncertainties forecasters have to contend with at present, both on the demand side and the supply side. All other forecasts for GDP in each of the three years from 2023 to 2025 were above the MPC's modal projection. There was a similarly marked difference after the first year of the forecast period for unemployment. For inflation, the MPC's modal forecast was in the top half of the range for outside forecasts for 2023 Q4, but below the bottom of the range in 2024 and 2025. Both the setting of monetary policy and the language used to communicate it have developed significantly over the last year, which has seen the MPC increase bank rate at every one of, the, of its eight meetings by a cumulative 2.9% to 3%. By contrast, the MPC's approach to quantitative tightening has not changed. Consistent with the MPC's strategy, first set out in the August 2021 MPR, bank rate has been the active policy tool for tightening monetary policy, while quantitative tightening has been conducted gradually and predictably in the background, starting from March 2022. And I know the next panel is going to be discussing these issues, so I'm not going to cover it further here. As the MPC has become increasingly focused on the prospect of more persistence in inflation, it's tightened policy more sharply. In the five meetings from December 2021 to June 2022, bank rate was increased by 1.15 percentage points in total. In the three meetings from August 2022 to November 22, bank rates have been increased by a cum cumulative one and three quarter percentage points. The MPC's accompanying language has also developed significantly, communicating a shortening time frame for the outlook for interest rates and progressively strengthening our language while consistently emphasizing data dependency. Up until May 2022, when bank rate rose to 1%, the MPC's collective or majority communication still took what I would describe as a form of conditional forward guidance, emphasizing that some degree of modest or further tightening monetary, monetary policy was going to be appropriate in the coming months, depending on the balance of risk to inflation and growth. Whereas since June 2022, we've consistently emphasized the risk to more persistence in inflation and also made clear our willingness to act more forcefully if required by key developments, which I think of as signaling more of a reaction function based approach. On my interpretation, our, con our conduct in monetary policy has been lined with the literature on robust control in a world of increasing uncertainty. Such an approach is consistent with policy aiming to achieve the best outcomes in the worst case scenario. In this context, inflation expectations becoming de-anchored and leading to persistently above target inflation. Before concluding, let me provide a brief update on how my thinking on the immediate outlook for the economy and policy is developing. Some near-term sources of uncertainty have eased, but others remain. Because of the government's energy price guarantee, there is more certainty about the outlook for energy prices and government policy more broadly is on a more stable and predictable footing. This has been reflected in pricing and financial markets. The labour market remains tight and services inflation has hit 30-year highs and is, in, is contributing more to overall inflation. I'm not yet confident that domestically generated inflationary pressures from increased costs and firms pricing are starting to ease. Encouragingly, survey and market-based medium-term inflation expectations have fallen back from their peak, though they remain elevated. Assuming that in the near term, the economy evolves broadly in line with the latest NPR projections, 
and given my assessment of the balance of risks, then I expect that further increases in bank rate are going to be required to ensure a sustainable return of inflation to target. Considerable uncertainties remain around the outlook, but if the outlook suggests more persistent inflationary pressures, then I will continue to vote to respond forcefully. At the same time, I'm mindful that there are other uncertainties that I haven't covered today. For example, relating to the transmission mechanism for policy. We've increased bank rate very rapidly over the last year, and on past experience, the change in interest rates has its peak impact on inflation only after around 18 to 24 months. It is possible that the increased proportion of households on fixed rate mortgages means the full effect of policy takes longer to come through and or is larger when it does, such that meaning that inflation comes down more quickly through 2023. Given the uncertainties we face, it's important also to be humble about what we don't know or still have to learn. I favor a watchful and responsive approach to setting policy. Although my bias is towards further tightening, if the economy de de delivers, if the economy develops differently to my expectation and persistence in inflation stops being a concern, then I'd consider the case for reducing bank rate as appropriate. Let me conclude with two salutary tales. First, a personal one. In a speech I gave in February 2022, I repeated the MPC's collectively agreed line that some further modest tightening was likely to be appropriate in the coming months. I stressed the word modest as being significant and went on to say that, quotes, I do not envisage bank rate rising to anything like its pre-2007 level of 5%, let alone to the kind of levels we used to see before the MPC was formed in 1997. That speech was on 22nd of February, two days before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Given the experience of the last year, we have to expect and plan for there being further shocks and be ready to respond accordingly. Second, a historical one. That was the week that was, was a popular TV programme which ran for two series in 1962 and 1963. That was the time when inflation was just starting to rise. And although it averaged well below 5% throughout the 1960s, it picked up sharply in the early 1970s and didn't fall back to below the MPC's current 2% target until 1998. Nine, 2022 has been a very challenging year for the UK economy. Millions of households and businesses are experiencing great hardship as a result of the cost of living crisis. As a member of the MPC, I'm acutely conscious that our actions are adding to the difficulties caused by the current situation. The past history of the UK economy demonstrates the damage to households and businesses that would result if high inflation persisted. Unlike those earlier periods of high inflation, exacerbated by ineffective policy and policy frameworks, we now have a monetary policy framework which empowers us to take action. However challenging the short-term consequences might be for the UK economy, the MPC must take the necessary steps in terms of monetary policy to return inflation to achieve the 2% target sustainably in the medium term. By restoring low inflation consistent with its remit, the MPC can best contribute to securing stability and certainty, the foundations for sustainable growth. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dave. That was such a, a helpful speech. No, normally, people would review uh, a five-year period or a 10-year period, but so much has happened in the last year that there's enough uh, to discuss in one speech just over the last 12 months and really illuminating to see how the MPC has been uh, approaching uh, matters uh, in this environment and, and your discussion about scenario analysis and so on. Um, there is now time for questions, so uh, I'll take two or three if I could take uh, you first and then over, over to you and over to you. So. Thank you. Krishna Guha with uh, Evercore Partners, formerly of, of the uh, New York Fed. Uh, Dave, thanks for your presentation. Um, so you discussed, you know, the outlook, the uncertainty around the outlook, particularly as we go further out. And you also referenced the uh, MPC's unusual decision to very explicitly state that it judged the market rate path uh, as of the time of the November meeting was too aggressive. Um, I'm sort of struck by trying to understand what exactly you mean by that. So is, should we interpret that as meaning the market rate path 
is unlikely to be appropriate in the baseline case in which the world evolves in keeping with the bank's uh, you know, sort of the basic economic assumptions, or that the market rate path is uh, inappropriate taking into account the risks and skew to the distribution of potential outcomes. They're quite different ideas. And if it were the case that the market pricing was in a sense inappropriate in the base case, but quite reasonable taking into account the right skew to the distribution, perhaps on energy prices, fiscal, uh, other potential risks, how ought the bank then to respond? Because it would have a rate path that would be too harsh for the baseline case, but rationally priced for markets. Thanks very much. <laughs> we'll, t we'll take several questions. So there's another person in the middle. Thank you. Uh, David Marsh from OMPIV, thank you for your speech and reviving memories of Millicent Martin. Now, your old friend Nick McPherson uh, the other day in Edinburgh said that this policy premium that you said has disappeared hasn't in fact disappeared because he feels it's going to take a long time to, quote, win back credibility as a result of what you termed as these uh, significant UK specific events. And although the guilt yield has returned, as you rightly said, um, Nick and others seem to feel that this has been achieved as a result of some cost, i.e. some built-in greater degree of tightening macro, both fiscal and monetary, than would otherwise be needed uh, had it not been for those events of the 23rd of September. So who is right? Is it uh, Nick or Dave? And please don't say you're both right. We'll take one more question, which I think was over in the corner, and, and then we'll, we'll take another round. Thank you. Michael Saunders now at Oxford Economics, uh, previously on uh, your side of the fence. Um, so I wonder if you could just talk through the thinking behind the decision to raise rates 75 in November, as opposed to the 50s seen at the previous couple of meetings. To what extent was it a response to changes in the data and the central forecast, pay, prices and so forth? And to what extent was it driven by a desire to reassert the credibility of the UK's commitment to low inflation? following the uh, market and political turmoil of late September and early October. Right, well, there's probably three speeches um, <laughs> in all of that, whilst, you know, trying to remember some hazy videos from 60 years ago. I knew I'd get some pick up for my, uh, for my, my title and framing. I mean, uh, let me, let me uh, try and do them in the order that um, they were put to me. I mean, it, your, Krishna, your, your, um, your question on, on the, the unusual dis, um, communication that we gave in um, uh, November, I think it's, um, in, in, in a set, although you said that, although as you put it, those, those two different ways of thinking about it are very distinct, I would almost try and... Um, combine them in the sense that um, yeah, we, 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 we have a long-standing assumption that we, we take the market curve. That's our conditioning assumption. And given, even for, even for someone such as myself with, you know, as I've stressed, uh, less confident in the forecast further out than I used to be, you know, the, the forecast condition on the market curve had, uh, you know, a recession that's eight quarters long, had uh, inflation getting down to zero in 2025, um, and well below target in 2024. Um, but, it, but our forecast also embodied, given where we saw the balance of risks around that inflation forecast and upside skew. Now, the market curve could be, in terms of given where market, uh, you know, the weight of market views is on the assessment of risk, that market curve, you know, could, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sort of commenting on whether the market curve is right or wrong, because as you say, if, that, if that's where the skew of risks are in the market, then the curve is just uh, representing that, as it were, saying that interest rates will have to stay 
high, you know, or have to peak higher uh, and, and uh, certainly be higher than where the market curve now is in order to get, you know, to get inflation back to target. I guess what I'm, I'm saying is I recognise that, but for us, it's more of a, a, not a mechanical thing, but in a world where we're having to use these um, conditioning assumptions that are moving around a lot, in this case, I think it was reasonable for us to highlight uh, what, the, what the curve did to our forecasts and to therefore call that out. I mean, it's also worth saying, and I think this points to it being unusual, it, although I said that markets remain febrile, they were particularly febrile when we were putting that forecast together. You know, we shortened our, you know, the window that we took our assumption from to seven days. I think the OBR went even shorter. In fact, they had slightly different windows for their two forecasts. And, you know, you had had the market curve up at, you know, at some points, I think even at 6% during, uh, you know, the, the, the turmoil of, of late September and early October. So, I mean, I think you're right to draw out that distinction. I'm really just explaining how we approached it. Um, on David Marsh's question, and, you know, to sort of, um, I mean, I've disagreed with Nick McPherson at various times in my, uh, you know, he was my boss for years, and, 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 and there were quite a few issues that we, uh, we do, do, do disagree on, as, as reasonable people can, but I won't go into any of those. I will, just on the specific one that you flag, I think just on the, on, on the, you know, just looking at it rather factually, I think the Premier have, have gone, you, you know, you, you can look at the measures I showed, um, yeah, you can look at where uh, sterling dollar exchange rate is, you know, compared to its low point of about 106 in uh, September or early October. It was back up, back up you know, to where it was before um, that challenging period. But I, I think where I would agree with Nick, and it's a, it's a version of something that Andrew... Um, well, I, I would put it more in terms that um, Andrew put it at the... I think it was at the Treasury Committee last week. And it's a point I made um, at the Treasury Committee um, a, a while back is that um, credibility is hard won but easily lost. So whilst on the surface uh, the facts point to this, um, this premium having disappeared, there's no doubt that our reputation has taken a hit. Now, uh, you know, when you look um, as, as a kind of economic policy-making jurisdiction, um, and, we, you know, we'll have to work... Um, across the authorities to, to restore that. Um, however, I'm, I'm not going to get into speculation, and this is probably where you won't be happy with my answer. I'm as very, to, very happy. <laughs> I mean, I, I do think that, um, you know, you do get credibility from the strength in your, and the track record and the approach that your institutions, your economic institutions take. And obviously, our institutions were under pressure at certain times over that period in different ways. Um, but I think we're back in a position now where the institutions, whether it's the OBR, whether it's the Treasury, whether it's as us at the Bank of England, us as the MPC, are, are in, in a situation where we're, we're being allowed to get on with our jobs take, uh, um, deliver on the responsibilities that we've been given. And over time, I think that will, uh, you know, people can already see that, you know, I see that I, I've just come back from quite extensive travels. And people can see, you know, whether they're kind of uh, in Southeast Asia or over in the US, that, you know, we, th those institutions are being allowed to operate again. But I'm not going to speculate on what that might mean for... It's like in Star Wars, the Empire strikes back. Uh, anyway, on Michael's question... <laughs> um, 
This is quite an easy question for um, me to answer in a way, because I voted for a 75 basis point increase in September. The committee went for 50. Um, but by the time we got to November, the committee went for 75. So for me, there was still work to be done. I think for the committee as a whole, um, the you know the reason that we went for the 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 you know the largest ever increase during the history of the MPC going back to ninety seven you know does come down to more um, you know accumulating evidence of persistence in inflation. Um, they're also taking account of, uh, as, I, as I highlighted, although in November we hadn't got the full picture, we'd got most of it, that although um, the interventions on energy markets, such as the energy price guarantee, helpfully brought down the short-term peak in inflation, uh, which, you know, given my concerns about inflation expectations, uh, you know, if you've got if you're not looking at an even higher short-term peak in inflation, I think at the margin, that's, hope, that's helpful. But they did provide significantly more support in terms of demand to the economy in the medium term. Um, and so I think that was a, a further factor that pointed um, to that even more forceful uh, rate rise. That's probably... That's I know there are many people who would love to ask more questions, but uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to bring this session to a close in order to keep to the timetable. So apologies to those who would like to ask more questions. Let me just thank Dave for a really illuminating speech and answers to questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Hello and welcome to today's first panel where we'll be discussing and trying to shed some light on one of the most controversial and misunderstood monetary policies of modern times. Quantitative easing has been a feature of the Bank of England's monetary policy framework for more than a decade now. Yet many are still not entirely convinced it works. And even those that do, often struggle to quantify exactly how. During the course of the next 90 minutes, we'll try to address the impact of the policy on markets, look at the appropriate sequencing for combining bond sales with rate rises, and try to decide what the appropriate size of the central bank's balance sheet ought to be. I'm delighted to introduce our three panelists. To my far left, we have the Bank of England's chief economist, Hugh Peel. To his right, we have Lucrezia Reichlin, a professor of economics at the London Business School. And to her left, sorry, to her right, Gert-Jan Vlai, a former member of the Monetary Policy Committee and chief economist at Element Capital. First, we're going to have Gert-Jan take the floor. Gert-Jan, over to you. Um, thanks very much for inviting me to speak here. Um, just a quick uh, disclaimer, these views are mine, not the views of the firm uh, that I work for. So um, I was given 
some homework for this uh, session, and I was asked to talk about the following things. QE effectiveness, what have we learned? Uh, can QE run out of ammo? Is there such a thing as too much QE? Uh, what should we think about the sequencing of rates and QE? Uh, how should we think about the steady state balance sheet? Um, and maybe I chose to comment a little bit on the uh, September not QE uh, episode. Um, so I'm going to do all these things in 10 minutes, I promise. Um, so what have we learned about QE? A, a lot, it turns out. Uh, so the, the very first estimate hot off the press after the first round of QE in the UK, we thought that 200 billion of purchases had had a 100 basis point impact on long-term yields. The final tally of QE ended up 875 billion. Uh, so do we really think that we had a 440 basis point impact on 10-year yields? Uh, no, I think reasonable people don't think that. And that's another way of saying, over time, we revised down drastically the impact that we thought QE had. There was a similar downward revision uh, in the US. Again, very first papers hot off the press thought that QE1, the first phase of QE, had done 100 basis points on yields. Uh, and then a few years later, we said, actually, no, we think that QE1 plus QE2 plus QE3, which was two and a half times bigger, that had a 100 basis point impact on yields. And so there was a big downward revision over time. Um, I made this point a few times while I was on the MPC, and I'm going to continue making it, um, that I think that the reason why there's this confusion, you know, how can you say it was one impact, and then later you could say it was another impact, uh, it's because it's not something that changes gradually over time. It's not something constant that we change our mind about. No, actually, the impact of QE is state dependent. So in some circumstances, QE is very powerful. In other circumstances, I don't think it actually does all that much. Um, and what I'm showing here is a, a chart where on the horizontal axis is um, the... Uh, QE announcements, and in particular, the extent to which they were a surprise. So how much of the QE announced on the day was not anticipated? Uh, and then on the vertical axis is how much uh, yields move. Uh, and what I've done is I've distinguished three episodes of QE, which were done in highly volatile, highly stressed market circumstances. So you know, the original slug in the, right in the middle of the financial crisis in early 2009, then the dash for cash in March 2020, uh, and then the most recently not QE episode, we really need to find a better name for it, but I haven't found one yet, in September 2022. And what you can see is that there were very big yield effects of all those three interventions. But all the other ones, which were done when markets were relatively calm, the economy needed more stimulus, was too weak, etc. but markets weren't particularly stressed, and you can see these things are clustered almost around a horizontal line, and my interpretation of that is they didn't do all that much. Um, this is not deep analysis, but I think for the people who haven't seen a chart like this, I, I want to tell you anyway. So for all the people who make these facile observations that, well, yields were so low for so long because the central banks bought all the bonds, it's obvious. Um, I just want to make point out that that is very much not the case. So what this chart shows, the black line going up, is, this is a chart for the US, but you can draw a similar one for the UK. So the black line going up is the amount of government debt outstanding held by the private sector. So I've subtracted the part that the central banks had bought. So what is the private sector being asked to hold? And the gray line is a measure of long-term forward real yields, adjusted for inflation expectations. Um, and so what you see is that this goes precisely the wrong way. Uh, if you thought that uh, you know, the more you ask the markets to hold government bonds, the higher yields go, then these lines should go in the same direction, but they go in opposite direction. And what that tells you is that bond supply as a persistent key driver for yields is just not a very good model. Then the question, um, can QE run out of ammo? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I made this point in real time when we had run out of ammo. Uh, so what happened in uh, a good part of 2020 and 2021 is that not just were short-term interest rates at the effective lower bound, but long-term interest rates were at the effective lower bound too. 
And so you can still buy more bonds. You can buy more billions of government bonds. But it's not going to do anything because if it's supposed to stimulate the economy by lowering yields and yields can't go any lower, then you have effectively run out of ammo. And I made that point at the time. Uh, and so, yes, absolutely, there is a limit to uh, QE in the sense that uh, in certain circumstances, like when long run yields are close to zero, you just wouldn't expect it to do anything anymore. And then a slightly different question is, how much QE is too much? And I think there are some good arguments there, and then there are some arguments that uh, I, I don't think are very well underpinned. And the good arguments have the green ticks, uh, and the arguments that I don't agree with have the red crosses, and let me take them one by one. So first, as I've argued, um, in calm markets, uh, QE doesn't have all that much effect. And if you keep doing a lot of it, and you build up a very high stock of QE, then you get to a point where, since the positives of your QE in those circumstances are not very big, the negatives might actually outweigh. One of those negatives, again, this is not hindsight, pointed this out in real time, one of those negatives is that you do shorten the effective maturity of, the, of government debt by quite a lot, and I'm going to talk about that more in a second. And so, indeed, when the stock of QE is already very big and markets are not very stressed, then you do need to start thinking about, well, if I do more, probably not going to stimulate the economy very much. I'm doing quite radical things to the interest rate sensitivity of government debt, and so maybe that's not such a good idea. Another argument, which I think in the UK we never got to, but potentially you could get there one day, is a market functioning argument. At some point, the central banks just own so many of the bonds that there is not enough left in the private sector to trade liquid in a, in a liquid way. Um, and you know, we need government bond markets to work well. Uh, we don't want to damage that. So that's another way in which you can theoretically have too much QE at some point. Then a third point, again, this is not something where we've been yet, but you know, uh, in the next few decades, we might get there one day, I hope not. Um, is a point about fiscal dominance and inflation credibility. And this is slightly controversial, and I think quite a few people will disagree with me, but that's okay. That's why we have these conferences. Um, so the good kind of QE is when the economy needs stimulus, inflation pressures are too weak, you want to push inflation back up to the target, um, and you are cutting rates and you are supplementing that by buying government bonds. That's how QE is supposed to work. There was another kind of QE, which is that the central bank is persistently buying bonds because nobody else wants to buy them. That is a very, very bad kind of QE because that is, the kind of, that is exactly the definition of fiscal dominance. Nobody trusts the authorities anymore. Nobody trusts the combination of government and central bank. And therefore, nobody wants to buy the bonds because they think that either the government is going to default or is going to inflate away the debt. Uh, and therefore, nobody wants to buy these bonds. And this is a situation where I think if ever we were to go into that situation, if the central bank buys bonds, what you will see is that yields will go up, not down. And so that'll be a signal that you have done too much QE is once you start buying bonds and yields, in fact, rise. And so this idea that the central bank can always control long-term yields and can always squash them and can you know, have these... Uh, concepts of uh, financial repression, I just don't believe that. Uh, the government bond market is too big, and I think there is a limit, and that limit is at some point if you buy and government yields goes up, then that means that your buying is in fact undermining uh, the credibility of the central bank. Again, we haven't gone there, um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that possibility. Then the arguments for potentially too much QE that I don't like is these things about, well, QE just makes rich people richer, and it does very bad things for the distribution of wealth, and it causes asset price bubbles, etc. cetera. Um, I think these arguments are very loose. I, I think they completely lack rigorous evidence, and any time somebody shows me what they say is evidence uh, for this, then I will counter and say, actually, you haven't convinced me at all, because all these effects uh, could just as well be explained by the fact that interest rates are very low. Short rates are very low and have been long for a long time. If you want to tell me that you know, there's a risk that that causes asset price bubbles and that that causes asset price inflation, 
that I'm on board, but the idea that it's QE specifically that does these things, um, I just, you know, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I'm saying I have not seen any convincing evidence of it so far. I want to talk a little bit about QE losses. Um, this has been uh, in the papers again recently, um, and, you know, Claire said it, QE is uh, one of the most misunderstood policies. QE losses are also uh, very much misunderstood. From the government's point of view, you can very simply think of QE as switching some debt from fixed to floating. The more QE, the more the government has floating rate debt. So what does that do? All the people in the room who have mortgages will understand. If you have floating rate debt, that means that when interest rates go up, there's a faster pass-through of that to your debt servicing cost. That goes in both directions, by the way. If ever we get to circumstances again in the next few years where interest rates are cut, government debt servicing costs will also fall faster. So this is not an asymmetric effect. But in the medium term, it makes a little difference to the level of servicing cost. All you're doing is you're making the pass-through of interest rates a little quicker, both on the way up and on the way down. That's the first thing. The second thing, really important, is that the net benefit of QE to the economy, to society, is not at all equal to the financial gain on the Bank of England's balance sheet. And this is a huge mistake that a lot of people make, is that you know, if, there, if somehow a loss is registered, then that must mean that the whole thing was a terrible mistake. So the QE loss, the one that we observe on the Bank of England's balance sheet in accounting terms, is basically the opportunity cost of not having borrowed more fixed when rates were rising. You know, obviously, when rates rise ex post, you wish that you had more fixed rate debt. Um, and that shows up on the Bank of England's balance sheet. The QE gain is the fact that when there was a lot of QE done in these episodes of very high stress, if we hadn't done that, the economy would have gone into a persistent deflationary depression. The recovery would have been much slower, much weaker, but we did do QE, and therefore we had much stronger recoveries, and therefore we had higher income, we had higher tax revenue, and that is the QE gain that you need to offset against the loss. And, but unfortunately, you only see the loss on the Bank of England's balance sheet, you don't see the gain, and that's why people um, get this very, very wrong, and I'm also looking at UFT um, for not helping um, making this argument. Okay, QE rates uh, and sequencing. Um, so what the Bank of England has done, and what most other central banks have done as well, um, if I remember correctly, is uh, they have either started or are talking about um, doing, sorry, this was at QT, uh, quantitative tightening sometime after uh, rate hikes. I think that is absolutely the right policy. Uh, the biggest reason for doing that is to emphasize that the policy rate is the primary instrument. So when it comes time um, to uh, turn the policy stance around and to start tightening, you do it with interest rates first, everybody gets the message, and then at some point you add quantitative tightening in the background. Um, the only question I have with the sequencing uh, is that uh, you know, there was a, a plan laid out for the Bank of England very clearly about the different thresholds of rates, first at which you stop reinvesting, then at which you start selling. Um, and by my count, that plan would have involved uh, starting to sell gilts in May 2022, but it took uh, another six months or so, uh, and I'm not sure why, and I'm not sure that the delay was particularly helpful. Um, Steady state balance sheet, I'm going to go very quickly on this, uh, even though there's four bullets. I think the biggest thing I want you to take away is that you know, operationally, if you're a bank, if you're a central bank, uh, this is hugely complicated, this is hugely important. Um, but as a macroeconomic issue, or as a monetary policy stance issue, this is actually really not that interesting. Uh, and you can run an economy with a very big central bank balance sheet. You can run an economy with a very small central bank balance sheet. Um, there are lots of very small, not terribly important decisions that make a huge difference as to whether the balance sheet is large or small. Um, but mostly, I want you to take away that if you're interested in the macroeconomic aspect of this or the monetary policy aspect of this, it's just not that exciting. And then finally, let me talk a little bit about the... Uh, 
the not QE intervention of late uh, September and early October. Um, so first of all, the cause. Uh, my interpretation uh, is that it's not that the government all of a sudden made an announcement out of nowhere that was a few billion more generous than people expected. And then people said, okay, these people are totally not serious about fiscal sustainability, so I do not want to hold any more guilt. Uh, that's a, a very simple story that I think is not right. What I think is right is that the government did do that, but they also spent the summer brutally undermining the independence of the Bank of England and of the OBR and making lots of noise about how maybe the Bank of England's mandate wasn't fit for purpose and you know, maybe the government needs to have a lot more say over how things get done and maybe you know, we try some new mandates that are, don't involve inflation targeting but targeting other things and that was deeply unhelpful. And if you do that and then you have an overly generous unsustainable fiscal policy people are going to conclude that where is this government going? Well, maybe where it's going is it wants to inflate away the debt uh, because that's exactly what you would see. You would see them undermining the Bank of England's independence and you would see them announcing unsustainable spending plans. And I think it's the combination of those two rather than just the fiscal announcement that caused the damage. And then a secondary transmission was poor collateral management by pension funds and LDI providers who had, you know, as far as I could tell, planned for uh, moderate increases in yields and what kind of assets they would need to shift around uh, in order to meet their collateral requirements, but had not planned for drastic increases in yields. Uh, and so, as the Bank of England very clearly said at the time, and other commentators, this was not a question of solvency. These pension funds were, in aggregate, completely fine financially. Uh, they just had the wrong assets in the wrong place. So then my take on the Bank of England's response. So um, I think overall it was a success. Uh, it was a big success. It was very important that they acted uh, quickly. Uh, the two things that I'll particularly highlight is that there was minimal Bank of England buying rather than maximal Bank of England buying. And so even though they announced a, an up to amount uh, of what they would buy, they in fact bought much less. And it was very clear every day that they were buying just the, the very lowest amount they needed to, to achieve some stabilization. That was very different to the experience in the March 2020 episode when I was on the committee and when, in fact, we just bought vast, gigantic amounts without feedback to our market still as disrupted as yesterday. Do we really need to buy that amount? We just kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it. And, and now, in retrospect, I think, waited far too long before saying, hang on a minute, markets are quite stable now. Uh, maybe we don't need to buy these huge volumes anymore. So I think that was a huge improvement. Uh, and also being quite clear, quite explicit, that what they were doing was to cap volatility and not to cap yields. Uh, because capping yields, as I suggested a minute ago, is a very difficult uh, and dangerous thing to do. If you say, well, private investors don't like these government bond deals, but me, the central bank, uh, I'm going to try to suppress them, uh, then that gets you very close to the fiscal dominance territory. And by saying, no, no, that's not what we're doing. We are allowing yields to find a higher level, if that's what investors now believe, but we want to get there in an orderly way uh, without doing unnecessary damage to the financial system uh, in the process. Uh, and so and that was very good. Um, the two bits that I think were not so good and need some reflection. Um, uh, first of all, if the problem is liquidity, as I think everyone agrees that it was, then the solution for a central bank is to lend, not to buy. Uh, the same point applied in March 2020 uh, when I asked after, you know, not in the middle of the crisis, but afterwards I say, I ask, can somebody explain to me why we had to buy and why we can't lend? Uh, I'm not sure the question was ever answered. Um, in the heat of the moment, the answer is always, oh, because we don't have the necessary legal arrangements, operational arrangements, etc. cetera. Um, but of course, that's not, uh, that doesn't get you that far as an excuse because then the answer should be, well, can we put these things in place so that the next time we can lend rather than buy? Uh, and then the second thing is one of, of governance. Um, so the FPC was the one that recommended to take this action. The bank, the bank executive actually took the action. The MPC was informed and, and nodded it through. Um, and I just want to make one simple point, which is that the MPC has a symmetric target around inflation. And so when the MPC is in charge of QE, uh, it's very clear about 
you know, why would it not want to do too much? Well, because too much would be too much stimulus and would cause them to overshoot inflation. And so there's sort of a natural bound uh, on uh, how they would take these decisions. The FPC does not have a symmetric target. Uh, and so who caps the FPC's purchases? Uh, who decides that the right amount is 20 or 50 or 100 or 200? Um, and I think, you know, in this case, like I said, there was minimal buying. I think it was done very well. Um, but I think it needs a little bit more uh, governance structure to make sure that in future the incentives are aligned uh, so that there is no excessively generous buying for uh, no uh, obvious return. Um, that's it. Those were my comments. Thank you very much. So thank you for such um, clear, topical, and in places rather strident and critical remarks. I think they got us off to a really good start to the panel. Um, Professor Reichlin, you've got a lot of experience at the European Central Bank. You were the director of research there for a period. So why don't you talk us through the, the European experience with QE? Your experience, right? Well, everybody, uh, good morning, everybody. I, my time at the European Central Bank is ages ago, so that really, so I hardly remember what was the, you know, the world that was very, very, very different. But uh, I've been following, you know, so let me just give you my remarks. I will just pick some topics uh, and uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about Europe, but a little bit also about, um, in general, how we should think about balanced sheet policy. As a matter of introduction, uh, uh, let me say that, uh, I mean, this is a very important topic because uh, after 15 years, uh, uh, you know, since the great financial crisis, the operational framework of central banks has changed beyond recognition. And uh, we are in kind of a situation in which we are try still trying to understand what will be, you know, the normal operational framework uh, when everything settles, if anything will ever settle. Now, of course, now we have different tools, uh, not only QE in the sense of purchases of government bonds, uh, but, uh, you know, special lendings and neg negative interest rates, uh, uh, forward guidance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, is a multi-instruments uh, operational framework. Oh, now, uh, Typically, all these different tools are called balance sheet policies, but actually they work by affecting different spreads in financial markets. So in that sense, they are interest rate policies. So it would be very useful if we had a unified language to translate quantity into prices, because you know, actually we are doing prices. You know, it's not that there is something, you know, not, you know, by changing quantity, you are actually affecting spreads and you're affecting levels of interest rates. Now, uh, Hugh and I, when we were writing together, we tried to distinguish between two types of uh, uh, balance sheet policies. And I think that distinction is still very useful today, in particular today, actually, with the recent uh, episodes uh, of uh, liquidity issues and central bank intervention. So we, uh, looking at the ECB experience, uh, which at the time was not doing active QE, we tried to distinguish between two different types of policies, those policies which are complement to interest rate policy, in which uh, central banks intervene as market makers or intermediary of last resorts. Okay, so there are many, inter many examples of those interventions. I'm thinking about the liquidity policy at the ECB in 2007, 2008, or the COVID response most, more recently, or even you know, the recent uh, uh, Bank of England intervention uh, uh, in September. Now, uh, these policies have nothing to do with uh, uh, you know, intervening because we are at the zero lower bound. Uh, they can be understood uh, as a complement uh, to interest rate policies. And their purpose is uh, financial market st stability more than monetary policy purposes. And then there is classic QE that everybody is uh, thinking about. Uh, and those are the, you know, the purchases uh, and now you know, Q tightening uh, that the central bank operate for monetary policy purposes. So those two things uh, are quite different. So conceptually, I think it's quite useful to keep them separate. 
And uh, um, so the size of the balance sheet uh, is an endogenous consequence of these policies. It's not, uh, it's not a target, but it's what happens uh, you know, when you actually you, you do these policies. And in fact, if you look at the ECB experience, the size of the ECB balance sheet increased much you know, just after 2008, much earlier than when they actually implemented the QE, which was only implemented in 2015. So uh, in my 10 minutes, I will just look briefly at the past of what we learn uh, on the ECB experience uh, since the crisis. I will then say something about where we stand today and what are the risks of the tightening cycle. And then uh, uh, I will you know, just address a few questions on what should be the normal operational framework in the steady state. So uh, lessons from the ECB. Uh, and to what extent do they matter today in general for central banking? Um, let me say, as you know, what I just said, even before classic QE, which only started in 2015, the ECB had, view, had used various non standard tools, uh, which have been very effective for liquidity purposes and in general financial stability. So I would cat categorize those policies in my first category, the complements. And uh, actually, you know, extensive research at this point shows that early liquidity policies were very successful. And actually, the operational framework uh, that, uh, uh, that the euro system had, characterized by large central bank's balance sheet and interest rate on deposit, uh, was appropriate uh, for uh, that role, which I would call a role of intermediary of last resort. Oh, but of course, there were many other questions, and the questions were, you know, how those policies later on, how those policies interacted with the regulatory framework, with the fiscal framework. For example, you could argue that later the ECB did too much to deal with solvency issues in absence of regulatory and fiscal tools. And the lesson here, I mean, for what we are thinking about today, is that central banks don't act in a vacuum. And at the end, they end up to do what they have to do, but uh, you know they tend to jump in when uh, you know others don't. Okay, and so this may be you know you know something that uh, Gertian touched upon at the, at the end of his remarks. In terms of fiscal consequences, we can also say that indirectly, you know, especially in, in the bad part of the debt crisis, uh, the ECB, what the ECB did had some indirect fiscal consequences. Uh, again, you know, that was, uh, um, you know, the consequence uh, of, of a framework uh, that revealed his weakness uh, uh, during the debt crisis. At the end, uh, what calmed, uh, you know, the turbulence of that period in 2012 was the famous whatever it takes uh, pledge of Mario Draghi. But the lesson there, the important lesson there is that the credibility of that pledge uh, actually rest, uh, you know, was, uh, was actually, uh, you know, was, uh, is explained by a strong political backing from the fiscal authorities. So here, the second lesson I would learn from that, uh, from that story is that uh, Draghi was successful because the euro system, uh, you know, and the fiscal authority and the government uh, of the eurozone had come together with, uh, you know, with uh, a commitment to reform. And so, you know, it was not just the central bank, uh, you know, voice uh, that, uh, that made the difference, uh, but, you know, because at the end, and this is the lesson, the credibility of central bank's uh, policy rests on the shoulder of the sovereigns. So both points, the interaction with financial policy and fiscal backing, I think are relevant today. So where do we stand today? I'm coming to the, my second point. Uh, today, with... Uh, to tightening, uh, we have seen some bursts of financial instability which have called for central bank intervention. We have seen it in the UK, we have seen it in the US with the stress in the treasury markets. We haven't seen it yet in the, in the, Euro, uh, in the Euro area, but in a way we have been prepared to face those, uh, those stress with uh, you know, new instruments including uh, the TPI and, uh, you know, and, uh, and the possibility of using flexible purchases uh, with the PEP program. Now, um, 
here, uh, you know, the question is uh, whether while during the, 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 the cycle of easing, these monetary policy functions and the fiscal stability function of central bank policy went hand in hand, there is a question today to ask whether the monetary policy function and the financial stability function of, of, of the balance sheet policy, uh, you know, will actually go one against the other. So there are one question is just a pure monetary policy question. To what extent we can use balance sheet policy to tighten for monetary policy purposes and to ease for financial stability purposes? Now, here I think that uh, in principle, central bank have the capacity to act as market maker in stress emerges in financial markets and implement QT for monetary policy purposes at the same time. So you could actually, you know, have the strength to, since you have a lot of tools, uh, you know, to you know, manipulate volatility and rates in such a way, unless the shock, of course, is very, very large, in such a way that you can do both. For example, you can send long, buy QT, buy short for financial stability purposes. And, uh, you know, and this in the... In, I think, you know, I am talking under the eyes of Isabel, but this is the idea of the TPI in, uh, in the euro area that you could actually, if during the tightening cycle, you know, stress would emerge in the periphery, in the sovereign market uh, in the periphery, you could actually, you know, intervene in some pocket of the markets uh, while tightening overall, okay? So this is something that in principle can be done. Of course, this is something that we will learn you know, in the, during these cycles. But I think actually that this is not the key question. The key question is really how monetary and financial authorities, and I would add also maybe fiscal, should share the responsibilities uh, in this kind of much more complex, uh, uh, you know, uh, use of tools and so on. So we are very far away from the world of uh, inflation targeting where monetary policy just did one thing uh, and then, uh, you know, there was a Chinese wall with the other authorities. So in that way, in that sense, today we are facing similar, in, in different clothes, but similar questions of what we face just the post-financial crisis. And so this leads me to the, to the second question, which is what kind of architecture do we want in the steady state? Um, so how is the use of central bank's balance sheet policy for financial stability pur purposes interact with financial regulations, in particular with the new financial regulations introduced since 2008, and what are the key issues today? Now, for example, it has been observed that even with the system of ample reserves, let's think, you know, that in the U.S., you know, the, the, we have more than $1 trillion uh, of reserves, so we cannot, you know, you know, these uh, reserves are huge and they have been increasing uh, a lot. Even with that system of ample reserves, we have seen episodes of liquidity stress. So, and uh, in, in all ju jurisdictions, uh, as, I, uh, as I said. Uh, so in the US, you have seen it in March 2020, but also in September 2019, for example. So is this a paradox? Now, I would argue that actually this is not a paradox, but uh, not for the reasons that, you know, large, large, that past QE has absorbed collateral, but more for, uh, for you know, the regulatory and, uh, you know, development uh, uh, in financial markets since 2008. First of all, from the supply side, so for the market-making side, uh, the U.S. regulations on capital charges on treasuries uh, have penalized market makers to run large balance sheet. So, in fact, if you look at the inventories of market making banks, they have collapsed since the financial crisis, as you can see it from the New York Fed data. And on demand side, you know, on the asset manager side, what we have seen is an incredible concentration in the asset management industry. So now those guys, the asset managers, have balance sheets which are way larger than the balance sheet of the market makers. So this is a mismatch which has made the market prone to liquidity issues and then has called repeatedly for central bank interventions and maybe this will happen again and again in the future. So it's not something that is done. So the question is, what kind of architecture do we want? So do we think that we have to change the regulations or do we think that we want the central banks to be market makers as a matter of routine, okay? And, uh, you, know, a, you know, provocative questions 
is should the central banks be the market maker and uh, you know and replace uh, you know the market completely? Is this the direction of travel? So I'm asking here to the central bankers. So that leads me to uh, my third point, the last point, which is uh, you know steady state issues. Okay, what? How should we think going forward about? Uh, um, about the size of the balance sheet, okay? So I agree with Vertian, this is not a macro issue, but it's an important issue for the operational framework. Now, since the financial crisis, uh, central banks have been able to operate a system of ample reserves. Now, with interest rate on reserves uh, and accommodating demand of liquidity, they were able to do so without uh, creating inflation. Now that policy is normalizing, the question is what should be the size you know, in, in normal times? Now a common view should be as large as the demand for reserves, okay? So, but not larger. Okay? So that's the Friedman rule, so you provide liquidity to the market association. Why not larger? Uh, well, the usual answer, fiscal footprint, moral hazard, killing the market, etc. Now, this is fine. I mean, we even wrote it in a report on the, on the ECB strategy with, uh, with other economists, uh, but actually it's much more complicated than one thinks because, you know, the demand of reserves uh, in the present regulatory environment, and this is what I was refer referring to before, is hard to, I mean, it's not that easy to, you know, to predict. For example, there is a, a recent studies of the BIS uh, which shows that even in a system of ample reserves, banks rely on incoming payments to fund outgoing payments in the interbank market. So in other words, even with huge reserve, there is still a liquidity constraint, a strategic cash hoarding, so that rates in the market of reserve are still sensitive to shocks. So again, here the conjecture is that there is something that are regulatory frameworks um, that, uh, you know, create incentive for hoarding uh, uh, liquidity during times of stress. And here again, there is an issue of architecture, so, and, the, and the, the relation between monetary policy and financial regulations. But if you think that this type of things will persist, that this is, an, this is a case for, you know, continue to have large balance sheet. And this, again, this is not a monetary policy issue, but is a financial, you know, monetary versus operational framework financial stability issues. Um, so, okay, the question is, uh, do we want to change the regulation or keep, you know, abundant reserves and a large balance sheet uh, in the steady state? Finally, there is the issue of the fiscal footprint, very, mm, very fast, uh, because, I mean, that was touched uh, by, by Gertian. Uh, obviously, with large balance sheet uh, and increasing interest rate, there are possibility of losses, and this has been, uh, you know, has been on the paper, exactly. So central banks uh, will run in negative capital, the Bank of England, the, the Riks Bank, et cetera. As we know, this is not a problem per se. I mean, that's, uh, that's obvious. But there is an issue of governance. And there is, uh, there is an governance uh, which, uh, uh, you know, relates to the credibility of monetary policy. And this is actually, I want to refer to the second lesson from my mini ECB history, that actually negative capital and uh, a, 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 a framework which relates the relationship with the central bank and the, with the treasury or with the fiscal authorities, uh, you know, a framework which is not sufficiently clear can create uh, uncertainty about uh, the credibility of monetary policy and go ahead. This was uh, the case, for example, when, uh, uh, you know, in 2010, the ECB implemented QE. The first attempt of QE was in 2010 with the S&P program, which, you know, was a, fail a failure because the market did not believe that they could actually do it, uh, you know, on, on an open-ended way. So I think that uh, we are now in new territories with a lot of uh, kind of the, you know, developed world central banks will be in negative capital, so that the framework, uh, relating the relationship between uh, uh, the monetary authority and the fiscal authorities will be tested. Thank you. Thank you, Lucrezia, for that excellent reminder that when it comes to QE, we are really not operating in a vacuum and that it's essential that all of the arms of economic policy making are acting in a joined up manner 
Um, and I think as you alluded to in some of those remarks, it's essential that we remember that now that it's come in time to unwind the policy. I'd now like to introduce Hugh Pill. Floor's yours. Thanks very much. Um, so good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for all coming. Uh, thank you very much to Paul, Richard, and David for inviting me to participate. I would just like to take a second to say that based on my uh, experience in Frankfurt of the sort of elder brother version of this conference, the ECB Watchers Conference, I think it is a great uh, forum there and can be here for deepening understanding on all sides uh, in these important topics. So I hope this is the first of many uh, such events. It's also a great pleasure to be uh, sharing the stage or the floor, I guess, more strictly speaking, um, with such esteemed co-panelists. And one of the difficulties of being the last to speak with such an extreme group is they have said it all already, especially when uh, one of them, as was mentioned, is a former colleague and co-author. Um, so, of course, I would like to maximize the amount of time for questions. Um, I don't have much new to say. But in the nature of these things, it won't stop me showing my slides anyway. <laughs> So I only have two, and this is the first one. And actually, this is almost identical, I think, uh, although, albeit in Bank of England colours, so uh, you can see them more easily, uh, to the chart that uh, Jan showed. Um, and I think it's essentially trying to say QE worked. So just like Kurt Jan, we have some measure of how much you bought against how much, some measure of how much guilt yields changed. And it seems like by buying things, buying gilts, you drove down gilt yields, you created some monetary easing. But you can also look at that chart and hear a bit repeating things Jan said. You know, I used to do a little bit of econometrics on my all those. There's not many dots on that chart. So there is a small sample problem here. There's also a question of what is on the bottom axis. So we implement QE at a time when things are generally going badly. Um, so the question is, are these guilt yields moving because things are going badly or because we did QE? So there's an identification problem here. We're trying to solve that by looking at surprises and doing event studies and looking at tight windows. But I think there's an open question about whether that's really capturing what you might call the broader macroeconomic effect. And maybe that explains some of the differences in the results reported through time. But I think crucially, if you look at that chart, what's generating the strong downward negative slope in that chart is two episodes. In the rather arcane language of the bank, it's QE1, which was the March 29 episode, uh, 2009, and QE5, which was the March, sorry, Mar it's not March, is it, but March uh, 2020 episode. And if you look at the, the other blue dots, which is everything that happens in between, I mean, there probably is a negative slope, and actually, uh, Jan had that negative slope, but it's not a very uh, steep one. And uh, if we had more dots, it's not clear that they wouldn't just look like a cloud. And I think that's very much in the spirit of saying, we don't know much, even though we hope we know the direction. We don't know much about how to calibrate. It seems like there's a lot of state dependency or state contingency. It's not always the same effect. And crucially, it seems you get big effects when there does seem to be some dislocation in markets. And the way I think about that, and maybe this is more a quantity-based view rather than a price-based view, is that what's generating the size of the impact is in part, in large part, in a very simple model, is the degree of substitutability between bonds and money in the portfolios of the non-bank private sector. And it's not surprising, perhaps, that that degree of substitutability is less at times when there is market turmoil, and that creates a steeper relationship between bond prices and, uh, and injections of money in that type of context. So, you know, what do I take away from this is, if you view it from what Lucrezia talked about as the monetary policy lens, and you think about QE as a substitute for traditional interest rate policy, then it does seem that you have some leverage, more leverage at some times than others through doing QE, but it's a hard thing to calibrate easily because of the state contingency. And I think that probably is the framework that I would have in mind for thinking about 
how QE has an effect from a monetary policy point of view. And I think that naturally leads in the manner of what uh, uh, Volker Wieland and Athanasios Orphanides have said is, you probably want to hold QE up your sleeve. You do as much as you can with bank rate. You put bank rate to zero. And then if you still need to do additional easing, you do that additional easing to create at that point. But there are some dangers in knowing how much, how far, how quickly, and so forth. And I think that has been the rhetoric of the bank and indeed other central banks as well. So the other chart I wanted to show you was this one. And this is much more recent. This is, I should have said that the previous chart was taken from a paper written by colleagues at the bank, uh, summarizing a lot of research at the bank over the last decade plus. This is a chart <coughs> taken from John Cunliffe's letter to the Treasury Select Committee, and basically just traces out the time series of developments in 30-year bond yields um, through uh, the end of September and early October, the period of the financial stability operations, what Jan called a little bit cheekily, but nonetheless accurately, the non-QE. Um, and I think what you see is, well, yes, when the bank starts buying, you get very big movements in bond yields. So, you know, we can look at what happened on the 28th of September. As Jan said, the bank actually bought very little, and yet bond yields moved a lot. So should we see that as, oh, QE is working really, really effectively in this context? I'm not sure that's the right way to think about it. I think it gets a little bit to this point Lucrezia was making about here we should think about these interventions as complements, and their intention is not to shift the risk-free curve, but really re-establish the risk-free curve at where monetary policy workers want it to be. And I think if you think about this in terms of the multiplier effects, Lucrezia mentioned the famous whatever it takes intervention. With whatever it takes, at least initially, nothing was bought, and yet yields moved massively. And that looks like you have the infinite money multiplier. This is the costless impact in terms of implementing monetary policy. And yet, crucially, of course, it's, I think, because there was a deep dysfunction in markets in the euro area at the time of the euro sovereign crisis associated with fragmentation and so forth. And in the context of this picture, a deep dysfunction in sterling long dated markets. And I think it's that deep dysfunction that is being addressed through asset purchases in order to re-establish the underlying, if you like, or desired monetary policy stance. And that's the sense in which these things are complements. That's the sense in which you can have interventions away from the lower bound because you're not trying to ease monetary conditions. You're just trying to transmit and ensure and conduct monetary conditions the way you want them to be. And of course, whether as a side product or as a parallel ambition, you're also trying to make markets work better and preserve uh, financial stability. So, you know, I think there's an importance, and Lucretius has already emphasized this, but I just want to reemphasize it. There is an important distinction between these two types of operations. I gave a talk last night which had the title uh, Monetary Policy and Asset Purchases, Complements or Substitutes. So it was exactly based. I copied some of our old papers, Lucrezia. I didn't tell you that, but uh, I did uh, reference us. Um, so, so, so I think, you know, I continue to uh, agree with Lucrezia and, 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 uh, and have that in mind. And I think a key question, uh, and I worry that I'm now being put on the spot to give an answer to this question, and I don't have an answer at this stage, but a key question is how you run the governance of policy both within central banks and between central banks and other policy actors, and indeed between central banks, other policy actors, and the private sector, in order to uh, keep the kind of integrity of this distinction that I've described, and yet internalize the fact that these financial stability operations have implications for monetary policy, and equally monetary policy operations have implications for financial stability. So I think that is still an open question. Uh, an area where there's a lot of activity among central banks going on, including at the bank, and the bank has been a leader in work undertaken at the BIS on this topic. Um, but I think that is, remains uh, a, an open question. I just had two more things to say um, in this context. And I think what I'm going to try and say here is there are two things that I think illustrate why this is such a difficult thing. So the first thing I would say is if you think about historically Central banks have run monetary policy, and then they've worried about potential bank run type situation or whatever, or problems in individual institutions. 
And we've always had the capacity, we've had budgets rule, we've had, you know, the Fed was set up to contain banking panics. So we've always had this situation, and we, we sort of think we know how to deal with that with the banking system. But there's always been this sort of distinction between we run monetary policy, establish a risk-free curve, ensure liquidity is not being rationed in line with Friedman's rule, so forth, on the monetary policy side. On the financial policy side, if an individual institution gets into trouble because it doesn't manage its liquidity well, we have budgets rule. Provide liquidity uh, against good collateral at a penalty rate um, freely. But what we sort of learned in 2007 is if you have a problem in one bank, you can have contagion to the system. So there's this sort of intermediate state of systemic risk. And, and that was dealt with, and I think I'd agree with Lucrezia, but we were kind of both there at the time, so we may be biased. I think the ECB system worked quite well in that context. Um, what I think has happened, and it's a little bit of the same story, but perhaps a slightly different read from what Lucrezia was saying about the consequences of regulation post-financial crisis, is regulation post-financial crisis has made the banking system much more resilient, much more stable, much more robust. But has it reduced risk, or has it just shifted risks into the non-bank financial system, what we used to call shadow banks? Right? And I think that there is a kind of question here is, maybe it has reduced risk, but some risks have shifted. And the episode that's reflected in this chart was an episode that had its locus in the shadow banking or non-bank financial institutions, et cetera. You look at the front page of the FT today, it's talking about these famous LDIs. I mean, they are the, an exemplar of that sort of space. And I think it does get exactly to the point Jan was making around the practicalities of this, is central banks might be, in badger sense, in the world of trying to provide liquidity to ensure financial stability and ensure that we don't have this dysfunction. But you run into sort of two problems. First is, how do you get the liquidity there? And that is a practical question, but the shadowier, shadowier, shadowier parts of the shadow banking system are quite difficult to reach. And crucially, if we're in a world of market dysfunction, it's quite difficult to think that you can lend to someone else that will on-lend to the shadow parts, because it's, or, or interact with the shadow parts, precisely because the dysfunction means that that link in the mechanism may well be broken. And I think that gets to the points that Lucrezia was making about central banks acting as market makers of last resort. I mean, I think the kind of key question there is, if that intermediation of instruments in markets between non-banks has broken down, what role can or should central banks have, as the ECB did in 2007-2008, when German banks were no longer prepared to lend to Italian banks and the whole euro area money market seized up, what role do central banks have in playing, in acting as intermediaries, if you like, in the non-bank financial sector uh, in markets? And of course, the easy answer would be to say, well, let's act as a central counterparty of last resort. So we use our balance sheet just to match orders uh, on the buy side, orders on the sell side, we put them together, a price pops out, we don't take any risk, we're just, if you like, a computer system that's matching buys and sells, right? But once you move into the world of acting as a market maker last resort, you end up having some assets in an inventory on your balance sheet, and then the question is, what risks are you taking, to my mind, by having those? And, and the point I wanna make here in this chart is, here, we don't just have the blue line, which is 30-year conventional gilts, but we also have an orange line, which is 30-year uh, index-linked yields. And okay, this is a hard pitch to make in front of an international audience, because the Fed and the ECB, as part of their regular QE programs, bought index gilts. But in the UK, the Bank of England, as part of its regular QE program, did not buy index gilts. Now, we could debate whether that was right or wrong, but the bottom line is, from the UK perspective, buying index gilts was an exotic thing to do. And I think there's a kind of key question, by buying them, the Bank of England brought inflation risk onto its balance sheet. It's more than just liquidity risk. Now you might say, okay, does that matter, does that not, or we could debate that. But I think it goes to the kind of punch that I want to make here is, it's two parts. First is, if you want to keep markets working, the logic of these Bank of England's interventions means they should be temporary, but they should also be targeted. So it's a question of what risk are you trying to address? 
And is that a risk that's targeted by institution, by instrument, or by nature? And I don't think we have a clear answer to that, frankly. And then the second point I want to make is, I agree, for the reasons that have been discussed, the size of the uh, central bank balance sheet is probably not a key issue, but I think the composition of the central bank balance sheet can be a key issue. And that's where you may have, in terms of what risks you're absorbing, and crucially, at what price you absorb them, that may have macroeconomic effects. And I think trying to shift the debate from quantities to risks and how those risks are priced is an important thing. And it comes back to this point about losses. The reason why these losses are all paper losses is they're basically shifts of duration risk between public and private sector, where a lot of the accounting issues are actually shifts within the public sector. But once central banks start taking risks beyond duration risks, beyond managing liquidity, and you know, we've seen interventions, asset purchases that have assumed credit risk, for example, both in the ECB, at the Fed, and here in the UK. I mean, I think it's quite a different issue when you start taking those or credit risk or other risks, because they have much deeper, I think, fiscal implications. And that goes to points that were made around governance and how you maintain the relationship between, but also the distinction among monetary policy, regulatory policy, financial stability policy, and fiscal policy. So as I said, I don't have answers. I have the same questions restated a different way. But I do think we've identified the key issues, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thanks a lot for that, Hugh. I mean, one thing that I just want to turn to now before throwing it open to questions from the audience is, um, you know, you get a sense from your comments that, you know, when it comes to monetary easing, when it comes to you know, solving the issue of too low inflation, you know, central banks have to put the money where their mouth is, if you like, whereas there's this distinction between that and um, monetary transmission, whether through QE or not QE or OMT or whatever acronym you'd like to use to label it, that it's more an issue of less is more and about credibility. Um, however, you alluded to this, throwing up some governance issues. Um, you know, the most recent episode, the LDI episode, that was done by the FPC, not the MPC. Get, you know, I'm just wondering, as a former MPC member, how would you have felt as a policymaker that, you know, there's a crucial operation that you have, you know, no say in, if you like? Do you think that's appropriate, or does the bank maybe have to rethink the way it organizes these things? I mean, it's, you know, it's an uncomfortable situation, but um, I, I, you know, I do accept that you can do these operations which superficially look very similar for very different reasons with different time horizons. Uh, and so in principle, uh, there is nothing wrong with saying, you know, look, we're going to split it, uh, and even though it looks the same, you know, this is for monetary policy purposes, this is for financial uh, stability purposes, and as Hugh said, the fact that some of the instruments were different is actually helpful because that makes it easier to distinguish. Um, so that's all good. It's just, uh, you know, there is no history of the MPC having uh, an asset purchase tool. Uh, and so just, you know, spent a long time building that infrastructure for the MPC, thinking about how that should work and thinking about how those decisions should be made, should be explained. Uh, and so I think there's just some work to do to lay out that infrastructure on the other side as well. And of course, you can't do that in the middle of the crisis and nobody's saying, oh, you know, it should have taken three weeks first to <laughs> write down all these rules before you bought anything. Yeah. Not at all. But now that we've done it and now that we think, you know, having done it once, there is at least a possibility that we might have to do it again. I think it's important to lay these things down and spend some time going through that, which I'm, I'm sure they are doing, but I don't work there anymore, so I don't know. <laughs> sure. I mean, is the, Lucrezia or Hugh, is there any other remarks that other panelists made that you'd like to pick up on or on this point before we turn to the Q&A? Well, I'm, I'm just uh, uh, curious to find, um, I mean, what is your opinion about this uh, mismatch between uh, the supply and the demand uh, in the market making, because this seems to be something that, uh, you know, is there to stay, and, and is really an issue about regulation. And so this is uh, really not even about uh, the non-banks, okay, which uh, is more like a, 
you know, that these, you know, the, the investment banks are now running very small balance sheets, while the, the asset managers, uh, you know, have these huge balance sheets. And so, you know, so there is a, a kind of undersupply of, uh, of market making, uh, which calls the central bank into action. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, this is a very, I mean, it's an issue of great concern in the US, okay? So maybe less so in other jurisdictions, but yeah. you know, that's. I mean, look, I, yeah, you, on, on, on your point, Lucrezia, I mean, I, I think it's no accident that um, as uh, the market making capacity in the private sector declines, the demand for, if you like, central bank provided market making capacity increases, right? Of so course. That, that's, of course. Uh, that's the problem. Um, and I, I think you're right to say that the former is a consequence largely of regulation. I mean, it's interesting, you know, before the global financial crisis, the thinking was exactly the other way around, right? The thinking at central banks, at least at the ECB was, we should have the narrowest balance sheet because we don't want to interfere with the market. The perfect solution is we should set interest rates by operating in swap markets such that we could literally have a zero balance sheet in the limb. We do our, our interventions and our steering of interest rates off balance sheet and intermediation would all take your place in the private sector, right? So, and that world has totally uh, swapped around. I mean, whether we have found the right balance, which is your point, I think, I think that remains an open question. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, uh, you know, to ask these people to, you know, to have more liquidity and to, you know, less leverage. But, uh, you know, that means that the central banks will be called to do much more than in the past. So, yeah. you know, yeah. what do we want? Yeah. So I think that's a, a good point. Can I just pick up on one thing you said as well, which I meant to mention, but I think it is important because there's, you know, we talk about confusion created by the FT, so this is another example we're giving our chairperson. Uh, I, it, it does seem sometimes that people criticize, and I understand this, right? The bank is wanting to sell with one hand and wanting to buy with another hand. Does that mean the bank has kind of lost its mind? But if you go to the notion of what is central bank intermediation about, what is acting as a market maker of last resort about? It means you buy and you sell, right? You might not buy and sell back to back, which is what being a central counterparty of last resort would be, so you don't take any risk. But you have to buy and sell, and presumably relatively quickly, and you take some risk by holding the inventory you hold in the meantime. Um, so I'm not sure there's so much confusion in the thinking there. In, in my view, I think there's a kind of a coherence that if you are going to act as the central, uh, sorry, the, the market maker of last resort, it's natural you will buy and sell. What's that sort of brought that to the fore is the point you made about back in 2020, um, looked like everything was pointing in the same direction. And in a world where I think I'm putting, trying to interpret things Jan said here, he was on the NBC, I wasn't, in a world where everything's pointing in the same direction and you think risks are skewed in one way, maybe the incentive is to err on the side of doing more rather than less. And perhaps that explains a little bit why you didn't have such targeted temporary. You were using a tool, you were justifying it in part on monetary policy grounds, and with the benefit of hindsight, maybe that wasn't the ideal place to be. Maybe some learning has been done. We have been more targeted now. Is that because we really learned, or is that because the circumstances are different and it's more like the situation that Lucrezia was saying, that because not everything is pointing in the same direction, we feel a bit more conflicted. And I, I think that's, that's there. And just to your point, and I just want to make two points there, is one, um, I don't think it's, it's right to say the MPC was not involved. The MPC was informed and so forth, right? So that's just a practical question. We could debate what that actually means in practice, and I'm not going to give you away this, the tick by tick uh, discussion, um, although that may come out at some point, who's to say? But what I'd also say, which I think is also important, is now that bank rate has moved away from its lower bound, and at least is unconstrained in that it can move up and down, the monetary policy side, so it's very clear that the MPC determines bank rate. So there is an instrument, the active instrument in the language of the MPC, that can be varied in both directions. Now, whether I would go as far to say as there's a kind of perfect substitutability between bank rate and asset purchase of various sites. I mean, I'm not sure I would want to go that far. Others may want to. But I think we do have an instrument available which we can operate in both directions at present that allows the MPC to ensure that it fulfills its mandate vis-a-vis -vis the inflation target, even as these operations are going on. 
If we were to get to a situation where the MPC was constrained in its use of bank rate, and the obvious example of that could be if we weren't back to the lower bound, then I think some of the concerns you point to would become much more acute. Thanks very much for that. Um, I mean, just to defend the FT, I don't think we're the only <laughs> ones who were... I mean, I remember letters from Trichet to the Czech National Bank talking about how big an issue negative capital was. And the Bank of England actually talking about how it was a really good thing to have a small balance sheet. So, you know, I don't think <laughs> we're the only ones who've ever been concerned about these topics, but there you go. Um, okay, can I see a show of hands, please? So I think we have three roving mics, I believe. So, so if we maybe go to the men in the, in the green chairs first, then to Francis there, and then to the, the woman in the, in the pink jumper over there. So if, if we go to this man first, please. Then... Thank you. Uh, Ashok Bhatia from the IMF. Uh, two questions, if I may. One more on sort of stance issues, the other touching more on governance. So the first question is, you know, is, there, is it useful to th to think in terms of some sort of a neutral setting on balance sheet policies? And, and if so, you know, is that something to be thought of more in stock terms or flow terms? You know, I mean, would one argue that full reinvestment, which you know, is neither QE nor QT, is the neutral setting? Um, so just some thoughts on that from any or all of you. Uh, the second question, coming more to governance, is, uh, you know, Lucrezia and I were at an event last weekend where I at least was struck by the number of sort of special pleadings for special causes, you know, green, uh, green taltros, uh, various other calls for central banks to influence the cost of capital. Um, the Euro systems balance sheet has now risen to, footprint has risen to something close to 70% of GDP. Is there such a thing as QE space? I mean, the idea that, uh, you know, one could imagine a future crisis where we end up with a balance sheet at 100% of GDP and the one after that at 150. I mean, is this a path to mono banking and should one do QT for governance reasons? And Francis, we'll just take the three in all together. Francis Coppola from Coppola Comment. Um, I want to talk a little bit about bank reserves, if I may, and the remuneration of them. Because um, obviously, at the moment, there's, because of QE, there's an enormous stock of bank reserves, which are being remunerated at bank rate at the moment. There have been some quite loud calls recently for um, remuneration of bank reserves to be reduced um, either on the whole stock or on part of the stock, and perhaps even eliminated completely in order to reduce the cost to the to the Treasury. I was wondering if the panel could comment on that, please. OK, uh, Petra Gerard, so University of Cambridge. I have a question about the uh, so-called non-QE intervention, uh, which more appropriately can be referred to as a financial policy committee, large-scale asset purchase, an FPC LZAP. Um, what was really awkward about it is that it happened at a time that the MPC was engaging in quantitative tightening. And in fact, the MPC had to postpone its plans for active quantitative tightening uh, uh, while engaging in this emergency intervention. The question is whether, in principle, any future FPC LSAPs conducted for financial stability purposes should be sterilized so that they do not interfere with the MPC um, monetary policy um, operations. And that also is in line with like, this distinction uh, between conducting large-scale asset purchases for financial stability purposes or for monetary policy purposes. In this case, the target was really long-term gilds. Uh, it could have been sterilized without interfering with monetary policy. Okay. Hugh first, then Lucretia, then yeah. Why did we first? Well, it was a quite a kind of like policy relevant question, I think. So, as the bank's representative, it's on you, I'm afraid. Um, okay, I think they're all very good questions. Um, so, on Petra's question, let me say one thing first. I think it is quite important to say that the so called, well, we can, whatever they're called, these, what I will call the financial stability operations, 
They were blessed by the FPC, but they were conducted by the bank. Now, you know, we could get into a lot of discussions about what that means and what the implications are and so forth and so on. But, I mean, there is a governance system, and the governance system is the FPC is not taking that decision. That's a decision taken by the bank. The MPC, sorry, the FPC blesses that, and the MPC was informed about that. So I think that is the nexus in which this took place. Um, I think you make a, a point uh, about uh, stabilization and so forth. I mean, what I would say is, the way I see it is, the MPC has, has decided, and maybe in Jan's mind it decided a little bit late, but it decided to move to sales of gilt, having already in February decided to stop reinvesting the maturity, sorry, the proceeds of maturing bonds. So QT started in February, and then there was going to be a... But the MPC at that point set a target for the year of reducing the overall portfolio by 80 billion, which given a bit of jigger of progress means that you have to sell about 35 billion bonds. Now, that was a target the MPC set for a year. And I think there is a kind of important point there that in my view at least, monetary policy in the sense of steering the risk-free curve in order to get back to inflation target, given all the famous long variable lags in monetary policy, it's a low frequency gain. So the people who took the decision to postpone the sales from the beginning of October, essentially in practice to the beginning of November, that was a taken again, taken by bank officials, not by the MPC. And the MPC still expects the bank officials, the bank machine, to deliver a quantitative tightening over the year that it envisaged it of the same amount. So that the MPC's decisions is still in place. The MPC has not changed. There is no postponement from the MPC's perspective. And I think that reflects the fact that, you know, monetary policy, especially monetary policy working through large-scale asset purchases and QE, a bit reflecting the pictures that Jan and I showed, that is a, a low-frequency, slow-moving slow thing. Whereas these financial stability operations, by their nature, and I think also Jan pointed to this, they have to be nimble, agile distinction between the substitutability and complementarity view of these two types of operations. It's coming from the nature of transmission and so forth and so on. Now, the, the point you make about sterilization, I think, is right. Of course, you could sterilize, right? And it goes to the point is, why are we doing these financial stability operations? And it gets to the point of what you mean by liquidity, right? So if you sterilize, in terms of the provision of central bank liquidity in, sterilization means you cancel out its effect. So if the liquidity problem is a lack of central bank liquidity, this would mean you are having ineffective operation. But central bank liquidity, for the reasons Lucrezia talks about, is massively ample right now. So I think the liquidity Jan has in mind is sort of funding liquidity, market liquidity, or and that's why it's the market maker of last resort issue rather than just... And so to me, the whole kind of thing, the right way, in my view, to think about the market maker of last resort issue is what risk you're taking out of the system. So is the reason why LDIs could not transact in long-dated gilts and index gilts is that something to do with the inability of the market to reprice the risk in those assets in a smooth way? And in order to facilitate that repricing, did the bank need to take some of that risk onto its own balance sheet temporarily? Right? And then it's about risk. So, for example, you could have done the operation. So let's say it's because the market cannot hold that 30-year conventional guilt risk. You could have done a swap operation. Right? It doesn't have to be, and that would have been off balance sheet, right? or potentially. So, you know, do you see what I mean is, is that I think if you think about it through that lens, you, it, it helps you say financial stability operations are more about dealing with risk, how you price risk, how you warehouse risk, and if necessary, in the center. whereas the monetary policy part is much more about traditional things, QE, the size of the balance sheet, driving the risk-free curve. And I think that does create a little bit of a national separation between the two. That was more than you wanted. Sorry, I'm taking... That was a long answer. But if you make me go first, I'm going to give you a long answer. <laughs> um, on Francis's question, I'm sure others will have views on that. I think it gets to the point that others have made. I didn't talk about this, so maybe I should let them talk about this, is that you know, from the bank's point of view, from a monetary policy perspective, we want to be able to set bank rate and have it transmit through the money market effectively. We need to be able to have a system of operational framework, including the possibility to remunerate reserves at bank rate, that allows that to take place. Anything that interferes with that is something that I think the bank cannot accept, because it's interfering with the core task of the bank. 
I mean, there is a question, which is fundamentally a fiscal question, which is around, if you think that, that the bank rate is established and transmits at the marginal decision, then maybe you only need to remunerate at the margin, and intramarginally, you could do other things. But crucially, that intramarginal is, that is a fiscal issue, right? That is something which I think it's not really for the central bank to have a, a big like, view on, because it's a fiscal question. Now, my view would be is if governments want to tax banks or they want to subsidize banks, whatever, they should do that transparently. They shouldn't do it intransparently through the central bank balance sheet, hoping that nobody notices, because that seems counter to a lot of principles that in general we would like to have in the overall macro framework in the UK. And crucially, I think it does begin to blur some of the governance and distinctions and, and relationships between central banks and other actors that I think are very important. So I, frankly, I'm not a fan of that proposal. Others may have views, but I think you should see that through the lens of its fiscal implications, which are really not my business uh, as I see it. And then on uh, uh, um, uh, Ashok's questions, I thought those are very interesting. Um, I mean, it's a bit, the second question you ask is a bit related to this, is that once you have a big balance sheet, then you get lots of special pleading and you end up having to engage in lots of distribution on fiscal issues. I mean, I have enough trouble with monetary policy, right? So I don't want to be a fiscal policymaker too. I didn't sign up for that and I wasn't appointed to do that. So I would prefer to be plain vanilla, et cetera. Let me focus on the risk-free curve and there's plenty of people who want to make allocative decisions and deal with pricing of risk and things like that. I think that's for someone else to deal with. Um, but on the neutral setting of the balance sheet, I think implicit in a lot of what we've been saying is it goes back to the old pool story. Right? The pool story is if there are shocks to money demand, those should be accommodated in order to stabilize interest rates, in order to ensure that the provision of liquidity is appropriately priced. Right? And I think that's, that's endogenizes, I think this is the word uh, one someone used, and I think that's the right way to think about it. The point I would make, and this links back a bit to the remuneration of reserves, and again it goes to the notion of what risk you take and what you price. So in the system that the ECB had pre-financial crisis, I mean, it still has in some way, but it's operating in a different way, the famous corridor system. The corridor system is you set the price at which you're prepared to borrow from banks. You set the price at which you're prepared to lend to banks. That's like a bid-ask spread. That's determining the terms on which the central bank will intermediate interbank flows. And the idea at that time was you want that bid-ask spread to be wide enough that there's an incentive to operate in the private interbank market. And it does seem to me that that's a, a version of saying is you provide a backstop for central bank intermediation at a certain cost, but you're actually trying to encourage market activity. And I think it goes to Lucrezia's point, which is do we want this type of intermediation to take place on the central bank balance sheet or not? And one way of encouraging it to take place on the central bank balance sheet is to make it very cheap. Lucretia, would you like to come in there? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, uh, with, what, uh, with what you said. <laughs> That's not surprising. Um, on, the, on the neutral set, setting on, on, the, on the balance sheet policy, um, I think that, um, you know, the, the, sim the, the system of ample reserves, which we have been uh, running since the financial crisis, uh, is probably there to stay. It makes sense to accommodate demand for liquidity. The central banks can do that at zero cost. So that's, that's what I refer as, as the Friedman rule. Um, so I think that one way to, 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 to say is that, okay, so we want the central bank in the, in the steady state as large as it is required to respond to the demand for liquidity, but not larger and not larger because of the fiscal footprint, because you don't want to kill the market, et cetera, et cetera. However, this is a kind of an abstract principle, but, uh, you know, I, I tried to discuss about it. Uh, you know, we have learned recently that, uh, you know, to, the demand for reserves uh, has behaved uh, in a kind of funny ways, and that uh, because of regulatory, uh, you know, changes, uh, you know, there are incentives uh, for the market to hold liquidity for strategic purposes so that, uh, it seems to me that this is a case for uh, running a rather large balance sheet in steady state for precautionary uh, reasons. But, you know, I put it more as a question that uh, as a firm answer. But I think that this is the way to think about it. Uh, 
Now, uh, I was with you at that conference, indeed, where people were saying the central bank should do that, they should do this, and they should do, you know, finance investment in infrastructure and so on. So clearly, you know, after, you know, 15 years of increasing the uh, role of the central bank in the market, uh, this is a temptation. Of course, this is the issue of governance. Uh, and uh, I think there is a, there is a, there is a, you know, a case for green purchases and for uh, central banks to, uh, uh, for, for simple reasons. Because if we are asking the private sector, you know, to uh, to be mindful of the risk related to climate, uh, that kind of assessment uh, of risk on, on the corporate bond portfolio, which is not something that the Bank of England is particularly concerned. Of, but the bank, uh, you know, the ECB is. Then uh, I think the principle of neutrality is it doesn't make much sense. And I think Isabel wrote about it, and I'm very much convinced about, about what she said. Uh, I'm less convinced, of course, that the central bank should do fiscal policy for obvious reasons. So I think that to keep in mind the governance and the, you know the relationship with the fiscal. And the monetary, uh, it's an important question. It's a question that will stay with us because, you know, in the moment in which we have a large fiscal footprint, then all kind of uh, new issues, uh, you know, will, uh, will arise, including the fact that uh, the fiscal consequences of what central bank does are much more material. In any situation, what monetary policy has fiscal consequences, but when balances are larger, those, those consequences are are larger, and this is the issue of the of the interest rate on reserves, and I think this should not be a question about the treasury, you know, is making money or is losing money. Okay, you, you know that is a monetary policy decision, and it should stay as a monetary policy decision. Um, okay, so I guess on on the governance. Okay, so uh, you know, answer to your question. So we have to think not just about the size, but also about the composition. So when I say the central bank should not do too much, it's really because uh, we don't want uh, the central bank to get too much risk in the balance sheet. And this has to do with the composition rather than with the size. So the rest are for the Bank of England, so that uh, you are the expert. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll try and be quick. On the, the question of what's a neutral um, central bank balance sheet, uh, it's, a, it's a very inter interesting question. So I, I will just restate what I said before is that you, you can run an economy with a very big balance sheet, with a very small balance sheet. I think the way I would define a neutral one is one whose size and composition is not changing. Uh, and as long as, you know, it can be very large, but if it's large and steady, then, you know, the policy rate can adapt to whatever that is doing, which I think after a while is not very much. But if it's changing, either in size or in composition, then it's m much more likely that it is doing something and that therefore it is not neutral. Um, on the question on, uh, on interest on reserves, just for public education purposes, I know you know this, but I just want to <laughs> restate. So there's a really simple version of this argument that says, let's just not pay interest on reserves. After all, we used to not pay interest on reserves, and that was fine. Uh, of course, reserves then were tiny. Uh, they were, you know, 1, 2 percent of GDP. Now they're 40 percent of GDP. Uh, not paying interest on reserves is a disaster. Uh, interest rates will go to zero. You will not be able to implement the monetary policy that you want to set. So please, can we just establish that? Now, there is a more sophisticated version of the argument that says, yeah, yeah, but you can have, you know, you can increase reserve requirements. You can have tiering uh, such that you can still control interest rates, but you are paying a lot less, say, half of what you're paying now. And it was half of a big amount. So what's wrong, uh, what's wrong with that? So first of all, it, is, it, it can be done. It's quite complicated. There's a risk that if you miscalibrate it, you still lose control over some uh, part of the interest rate structure. But I think there's a, a, a much, and, and, and you know, as you said, look, if you're going to tax banks, why not just tax them in a more explicit way? But I think there's a, another thing that you hasn't mentioned that I put a lot of weight on, is go back to this thing that I talked about at the beginning, which is QE is basically like switching between fixed and floating. So, you know, think about outside investors looking at the UK and say, okay, so collectively the central bank and the government decided to move from fixed to quite a, a, a big part of floating rate debt. That's fine. That works just as well. Um, 
And now the government's saying, oh, and by the way, on the floating thing, I'm not going to pay interest. Uh, when you're in an environment where you are worried about perceptions of fiscal dominance and perception that the government is trying to, you know, reduce the independence of the Bank of England and, and, and maybe in the long run inflate the debt away, this is a really, really bad signal to send. And I would not recommend to any government to do that. And if you want to tax the banks, fine. Just put a tax on them rather than saying, you know what, I owe you a lot of money. And as we know, when you owe money, then you pay interest on it. I'm just not going to pay it. You know, that's a default in my book. Um, then on, on, on Petro's questions, very interesting, this idea of should we sterilize uh, these transactions. Um, I want to think about it more, but my first reaction is no. Uh, and, and there's two reasons for saying no. So first of all, um, the, the fact that when you have a planned QT program, or even a QT program that's already active, certainly when I was helping design this, you know, we were always very clear that we only wanted to sell these bonds in orderly markets. And when markets are disorderly, you want to stop. And so if somebody else is then saying, well, they're now so disorderly that in fact, I want to buy some stuff, then I think it would be entirely unhelpful for me on the MPC to say, no, no, but I insist, I still want to go and sell something. Um, and I think it is entirely joined up in a macroeconomic way to say, let's just put our thing on hold while this gets taken care of. And then we'll see if conditions normalize, then we will keep going. The other reason why I don't like the concept of sterilization in this, concept, in, in this context is because it gives much too much credence to the idea that the size of reserves equals the stance or the size of the guilt holdings equals the stance. And that therefore, you know, just because you know, you're pausing this transaction for a little bit, that all of a sudden now you have a very different stance and it must be sterilized, otherwise it's interfering with the monetary policy transmission mechanism. Um, I, you know, as I explained before, I just don't believe in this stock equal stance thing. I think we need to move away from it. And I think sterilizing like that would just kind of create an impression that you really believe in that and that you really think that that's an important thing. And so for those two reasons, I think we can discuss further. I would not be in favor of sterilization. Very good. So I think we're, yeah, we're exactly at 12 o'clock now, so we're out of time. So I think it's been an excellent session, a lot, of, a lot learned, also a, you know, a sense that not all the questions are answered here. Still a long way to go in terms of determining you know, how this policy works, how it fits into modern central banking. Um, but I'd like to, um, to thank the organizers for, for, for putting this event on. Thank you to the panelists, you've all been great. And thank you to you, the audience, for sitting and listening and for some excellent questions. Thanks a lot. Cheers.
So, hi everyone. So I hope you can hear me. And great, you're taking your seats. So let's get started with uh, this afternoon's session. Um, well, I'm delighted, absolutely delighted, that Isabel Schnabel from the ECB is going to give our second keynote speech. Isabel is, of course, a member of the executive board of the ECB. She's responsible for market operations, research, and statistics. Before joining the ECB, she was professor of financial economics at the University of Bonn and a member of the German Council of Economic Advisors. She received a PhD from the University of Mannheim, has been a visiting scholar at the IMF, LSE, and Harvard. And in 2018, she was awarded the prestigious Gustav Stolper Prize by the German Economic Association. So I can't think of a better person to give our keynote address. Thank you very much. So thank you, thank you so much, uh, David. Uh, it's a great honor to deliver the second uh, keynote speech at the first Bank of England Watchers uh, Conference. Um, and it, it's a real pleasure to, to be here in London to have a, a physical conference uh, again. That's, uh, that's I think, is it's, it's much better for, for all of us, for the exchange, for the networking, and, and so on. Uh, as you may have expected, I'm going to talk about the euro area. Uh, and not about uh, the UK. And in fact, as you can see from the title of my speech, I'm going to talk about the interaction uh, between monetary and fiscal policies at times of high inflation. And even though this is a speech on the euro area, I think many central banks are facing quite similar situations. And therefore, I hope that this speech also carries some interesting messages for other central banks. So over the past few years, the interaction between monetary and fiscal policies in the euro area has changed decisively. In the years before the pandemic, monetary policy faced the challenge of inflation being persistently below target while being constrained by the effective lower bound. It became widely acknowledged that accommodative monetary policy on its own may not be sufficient for inflation to return to target. At the effective lower bound and with inflation too low, monetary policy needed support from expansionary fiscal policy that would increase aggregate demand and thus inflation. It was only with the onset of the pandemic that monetary and fiscal policies started to pull in the same direction, reinforcing each other. And the combination of a strong fiscal response at both national and European level, and a forceful monetary policy response proved highly successful in lifting the economy out of the deepest contraction since the Second World War and in preventing a downward spiral of prices. But these large-scale policy interventions coincided with a broad shift in the macroeconomic environment. Persistent constraints on production meant that supply could not keep up with demand, putting upward pressure on underlying inflation. Russia's invasion of Ukraine fueled price pressures further, pushing euro area inflation to double digit levels in October. And in my remarks today, I will argue that the new macroeconomic environment requires a different mix of monetary and fiscal policies to effectively fight the current cost of living crisis limit the adverse distributional effects of high inflation, and tackle the long-term challenges facing our economies. Fiscal policy needs to protect the most vulnerable parts of society from the consequences of the energy and food price shocks. At the same time, governments must avoid an overly expansionary stance that fuels inflationary pressure and adds to the historically high public debt burden. They should give clear priority to reforms and public investments that support potential growth and stabilize debt dynamics in an environment of higher interest rates. And in doing so, governments should preserve relative price signals, which are needed to pave the way towards a greener and more sustainable economy. Unfortunately, this is not what we are seeing today. 
many of the fiscal measures taken so far have not been targeted. They have been directed towards consumption rather than investment. And they often weaken the incentives for businesses and households to reduce energy consumption. In any case, fiscal policy needs to observe intertemporal budget constraints. Broad-based debt finance transfers, subsidies, or public consumption today imply higher tax rates or lower expenditures tomorrow. Credible commitments preserve fiscal sustainability and help to anchor medium-term inflation expectations, supporting monetary policy. Central banks, for their part, must remain determined to bring inflation back to target in a timely manner, so as to prevent current high inflation from becoming entrenched in expectations. Doing so requires raising interest rates further for as long as needed to put inflation back on a sustainable path towards 2%. So let me now explain these arguments in more detail. So the years before the pandemic were characterized by an environment of persistently low real interest rates and below target inflation. Structural forces such as globalization, digitalization, and demographic change were putting persistent downward pressure on both real interest rates and underlying price dynamics. Monetary policy aimed to tackle low inflation by stimulating demand, first by lowering interest rates and when getting closer to the effective lower bound by embarking on unconventional monetary policy measures. However, historically accommodative financing conditions did not stimulate aggregate demand as expected. And this was mainly, and this is shown on this slide, because they failed to spur public investment, which remained at the low levels reached after the sovereign debt crisis. As a result, despite the unprecedented expansion of central bank's balance sheet, inflation remained stubbornly low, and years of subdued price pressures threatened to become entrenched in longer-term inflation expectations. It was increasingly acknowledged that monetary policy on its own could not lift the economy out of the low inflation trap. Instead, monetary and fiscal policies needed to reflate the economy together. And when monetary policy is constrained by the effective lower bound, fiscal policy is more effective as a boost to aggregate demand does not immediately trigger expectations of a tighter monetary policy in an environment of persistently low inflation. The measures taken during the pandemic showcased the powerful interplay between monetary and fiscal policies. The ECB introduced a new asset purchase program, the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, or PEP in short, and offered new targeted longer-term refinancing operations at highly favorable rates. Fiscal policy, meanwhile, supported demand through job retention schemes and broad support measures at national and European level. Expansionary monetary and fiscal policies reinforce each other, successfully countering the sharp decline in demand and swiftly lifting the economy out of the deep recession. Yet, these large-scale policy interventions coincided with fundamental structural changes in the global economy. As the recovery of supply was held back by persistent disruptions to global supply chains, labor shortages, and social distancing measures, demand started to outpace supply, putting upward pressure on prices. Inflationary pressures were then reinforced by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which led to a surge in energy and food prices. Over time, inflation broadened substantially, creeping into most goods and services, and pushing up underlying inflation to historically high levels, with no clear signs of reversal so far. ECB stuff analysis suggests that both demand and supply have made a significant and broadly even contribution to the recent rise in underlying inflation in the euro area. And these price pressures are unlikely to dissipate quickly. Even if the deterioration in the euro area's terms of trade and the significant loss in purchasing power will dampen private consumption and investment, the current macroeconomic environment differs from that before the pandemic in at least four key aspects. 
First, excess savings accumulated since the start of the pandemic remain significant in both nominal and real terms. This is shown on the left-hand side. Second, due to supply constraints, firms in the manufacturing sector continue to have full order books with a backlog of more than five months. So this is shown on the right-hand side. Third, euro area firms continue to add new jobs and unemployment rates remain at record low levels despite elevated risks of a technical recession in the winter. And finally, there is increasing evidence that the pandemic and the energy crisis may have more permanent negative effects on current and future potential output, implying that inflationary pressures may, persi may persist if demand does not slow down accordingly. Potential output growth may be constrained through different channels. The first is labor scarcity. A significant share of euro area firms continue to identify labor shortages as a major factor limiting production in manufacturing and the services sector. So this you can see on the left hand side. Research shows that the pandemic has led to lower labor participation in sectors where it is hard to work from home and that those sectors are likely to experience some scarring, facing a loss in their trend output. And you see examples of that on the right hand side. So this development reinforces pre-existing trends driven primarily by demographic change. This second channel works through the capital stock and uh, through productivity growth. The energy crisis is likely to have hit investment in total factor productivity, especially in energy intensive sectors. Higher energy prices devalue part of the existing capital stock. Curbing production or raising the number of insolvencies due to higher costs and lower profitability. The car industry is a case in point. Since the summer of 2021, the extraordinary increase in energy costs has gradually become the most important factor holding back, back motor vehicle output. So this is the blue part in the chart. Demand side factors, this is the red part, by contrast, continue to support production. More generally, ECB staff analysis shows that a persistent increase in energy prices significantly and persistently lowers potential output across euro area countries. And this is shown on the right hand side. In fact, for more than two thirds of euro area countries, Potential growth projections for the period 2022 to 2027 are below their long-term average from 1999 to 2021, a period that itself was already characterized by subdued growth in many countries. This is shown on the left-hand side. Potential output has only been revised up in some of the high debt economies. In part, this probably reflects the fact that allocations under the recovery and resilience facility are tilted towards countries with lower GDP per capita and higher public debt ratios, thus advancing convergence and reducing macroeconomic imbalances. So this is shown on the right-hand side. In sum, the important role of both positive demand side and negative supply side shocks in spurring inflation clearly shows that the current macroeconomic environment differs from the one before and during the pandemic when downside risks to price stability call for an expansion of both monetary and fiscal policy to support risk sharing and counter weakening demand. In the current high inflation environment, monetary and fiscal policy should pull together rather than working against each other. Fiscal policy needs to focus on two types of measures. First, protect the most vulnerable households and firms from the energy price shock in a targeted way. And second, foster potential growth and energy independence through public investment and structural reforms. Regarding the first point, targeted support to low income households is important from both a macroeconomic and a distributional perspective. Low income households are not only more liquidity constraints and have less room to buffer sharp increases in their cost of living, 
but they also face significantly higher effective inflation rates than, uh, than high-income households. The difference between the effective inflation rate in the lowest and highest income quintiles increased to 2.2 percentage points in October 2022, its highest level since 2006. And this is shown on the left-hand uh, chart. This inflation gap between poorer and richer households is mainly driven by relative price increases for energy and food, as illustrated on the right-hand side. Monetary policy can do little about such relative price changes. Even tighter monetary policy leading to lower headline inflation would not have prevented some, such uneven effects across households. Only governments have the mandate and tools to address distributional issues. As regards the second type of measure, governments must address the underlying sources of the supply side shocks that are likely to affect the structure of the economy more persistently. This requires public investment and decisive structural reforms that foster potential growth and at the same time help to dampen inflationary pressure over the medium term by reducing supply side constraints. In this regard, the Next Generation EU program offers a historic opportunity. Disbursements under the Recovery and Resilience Facility are expected to stay at high levels over the coming years. A swift and efficient implementation of the key investment projects and reforms envisaged in the national plans under the RRF is key for boosting investment and potential growth. So far, governments have often not followed the above prescriptions. They have focused mainly on a combination of untargeted measures, fossil fuel subsidies, and government consumption to soothe the damages inflicted by the energy crisis. Only a small share of the temporary fiscal measures implemented to alleviate the burden of rising energy prices target low-income low households, as shown on the very left-hand side of this slide. Rather than cutting taxes for vulnerable households or providing transfers to those in need, governments have mostly resorted to broad-based tax cuts or subsidies or to outright energy price caps. In addition, many measures support short-run fossil fuel consumption, thereby working against efforts to move away from fossil energy sources. In terms of their budgetary impact, only 1% of the total measures, and you can hardly see this, this slide green bar on the, on, on the slide, contribute directly to the green transition. Tax cuts and subsidies for fossil fuels unless properly de designed, incentivize neither the efficient use of energy nor investment in energy-saving technology. Moreover, and now we are moving to the right-hand side of this slide, public investment will remain subdued this year and next. So these are the light green parts on the very right-hand side. It is only expected to pick up in 2024 and 2025, mainly reflecting increased defense spending which helps to support our security, but has a low contribution to potential growth. As a result, fiscal policy measures hardly help to accelerate the green transition or tackle the sources of supply-side constraints while contributing to aggregate demand and high inflation, making it, making it more difficult for the ECB to deliver on its mandate. Indeed, ECB staff simulations suggest that war-related support and energy measures may dampen inflation in the short run, especially if they directly affect energy prices, but will contribute positively to HICP inflation over the medium term. Sound fiscal policy is also a key factor for stabilizing debt dynamics. The fiscal support measures taken during the pandemic resulted in a sharp increase in public debt ratios, which were, which were already elevated before the pandemic started. Euro area public debt as a ratio to GDP has increased by around 20 percentage points from 2007 to 2019, and by another 10 percentage points by 2021. Initially, higher inflation had a beneficial effect on debt to GDP ratios, due to a temporary windfall from the boost in nominal growth. You can see that on the left-hand side. However, an inflation increase due to a supply-side shock 
cannot be expected to significantly alleviate the debt burden over the medium term. ECB staff simulations, and this is on the right-hand side, show that the resulting decline in real growth, higher interest payments, and deteriorating primary deficit would increase public debt ratios over longer horizons. Rising interest rates as a result of tighter monetary policy or higher public debt lift up the interest rate growth differential for a given rate of potential growth. The negative interest rate growth differential before the pandemic helped to contain or even reduce debt to GDP ratios. The differential still stands near historic lows, but is about to become less favorable. And this is shown on the left-hand side. Against this backdrop, current circumstances call for responsible fiscal policy. Governments need to be clear that current budget deficits are backed by future primary surpluses via either future higher tax rates or lower spending. If governments do not credibly signal their commitment to responsible fiscal policies, the private sector may eventually expect that higher inflation is needed to ensure the sustainability of public debt. This would be the case if high unfunded budget deficits ended up eroding the credibility of the central bank to pursue its monetary policy objectives, endangering price stability. If, by contrast, the central bank is fully credible because it has, it, it has earned a reputation of safeguarding price stability, monetary dominance prevails, implying that monetary policy is going to tighten by more if fiscal policy is too accommodated. Fiscal expansion during and after the pandemic, combined with the activation of the general escape clause under the Stability and Growth Pact for a period of at least four years, from 2020 to 2023, and the lack of a functioning EU fiscal framework, risk contributing to higher inflation by weakening public perceptions that governments would stabilize public finances by taking the necessary future fiscal adjustments. Recent developments in the United Kingdom have served as a wake-up call. They have shown that expansionary fiscal policy has its limits. Without clear communication about how fiscal spending or broad-based tax cuts are to be funded, markets are likely to expect higher inflation, higher real interest rates, or both. Abrupt increases in sovereign yields can put debt sustainability at risk and jeopardize financial stability shown by the example of the liability-driven investment funds. So far, in most major economies, inflation is expected to return to target over the medium term. In the euro area, investors do not currently expect high debt levels to cause inflation to persistently deviate from the target, in spite of an upward shift to levels slightly above 2%, speaking in favor of central bank credibility and monetary dominance and that you can see on the right-hand side. Fiscal policy is hence at risk of contributing to inflation at a time when price pressures remain unabated. Inflation in the euro area has continued to surprise on the upside, and significantly so, shown on the left-hand side. While fears of a technical recession have increased, economic data surprises have recently also turned positive. In this situation, monetary policy must remain firmly focused on its mandate and restore price stability as quickly as possible. Determined policy action by the ECB has already led to a notable tightening of financing conditions. Euro area real GDP-weighted sovereign yields, shown on the right-hand side, have increased across the maturity spectrum since the turnaround in monetary policy in December 2021. Yet, real rates remain in negative territory for most tenors, meaning that policy is likely too accommodative. Markets' expectations of a pivot have recently worked against our efforts to withdraw policy accommodation, bringing the actual policy stance further away from the stance that is required to bring inflation back to target. You can see that on the right-hand side. This raises the risks that first-round effects from higher energy and food prices eventually turn into second-round effects. 
The longer inflation is unacceptably high, the larger the risk that inflation expectations adjust in a way that puts medium-term price stability at risk. According to ECB staff analysis, higher perceived inflation appears to have a substantial impact on households' inflation expectations. And this impact has been rising, as you can see on the left-hand side. As a result, inflation expectations of households have been on a notable upward trend, and a significant share of survey uh, respondents expect a sustained period of high inflation, as you can see on the right-hand side. Surveys among professional forecasters yield very similar results. Hence, recent financial market developments, broad-based fiscal stimulus, and high inflation persistence call for further determined action to prevent the anchoring of inflation expectations. At present, the largest risk for central banks remains a policy that is falsely calibrated on the assumption of a fast decline in inflation and hence on an underestimation of inflation persistence. And I was very happy to hear Dave this morning talk about robust control because that was also a word that I had used in my Jackson Hole speech. In light of this, we will need to raise interest rates further, probably into restrictive territory, so as to ensure that inflation returns to our medium-term inflation target as quickly as possible and second round effects do not materialize. Incoming data so far suggest that the room for slowing down the pace of interest rate adjustments remains limited, even as we are approaching estimates of the neutral rate. The extraordinarily large degree of uncertainty surrounding such estimates of the neutral rate implies that they cannot serve as a yardstick to inform the appropriate pace of interest rate adjustments. Instead, policy needs to remain data dependent. While interest rates will remain the key instrument for calibrating our monetary policy stance, we will complement our actions with a measured and predictable normalization of our monetary policy bond portfolio. In our December policy meeting, we will lay out the principles for our balance sheet reduction. At the same time, we continue to stand ready to counter fragmentation in financial markets that is not justified by economic fundamentals and hampers the smooth transmission of our monetary policy throughout the entire euro area. Our toolkit, PEP flexibility, the Transmission Protection Instrument, TPI, and the Outright Monetary Transactions OMT program allows us to swiftly respond to destabilizing dynamics in financial markets. But the use of this toolkit also relies on an effective fiscal framework, making a timely agreement on a credible European fiscal framework all the more important. So let me conclude. In the pandemic crisis, monetary and fiscal policies reinforced each other, preventing a collapse of the euro area economy. In the current environment, there is a risk that monetary and fiscal policies may pull in opposite directions, leading to a suboptimal policy mix. Many fiscal measures that are popular among the electorate, such as tight price caps or broad-based subsidies, risk fueling medium-term inflation further, which could ultimately force monetary policy to raise interest rates beyond the level that would be seen as appropriate without fiscal stimulus. Governments need to internalize the effects of their actions on future inflation and monetary policy. They should support fiscal sustainability and price stability by targeting their measures to the most vulnerable parts of society, fostering potential growth, and accelerating the green transition. Such measures would dampen inflationary pressures over the medium to long run. Monetary policy can best contribute to macroeconomic stability and social welfare by ensuring a timely return of inflation to target, thereby preserving people's purchasing power and supporting investment by reducing uncertainty. Thank you very much. Fantastic speech. So let's take some questions. So we'll have three. So I saw three hands go up here. So those two and 
this gentleman here. I love you, Ben. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bert Siegenthal at UBS. Um, second round effects. One thing that is often mentioned, wage growth. Now, we had uh, in Germany just had this, this big agreement of IG Metall, which uh, many people would have said uh, was was actually relatively modest if you analyze it. It might be 3.4 or 5 or something like that, which doesn't look like um, massively inflationary. Uh, could you tell us what, what kind of, do you take any direction from that or what's your general assessment? The labor market, as you said, remains very tight, but so far we haven't seen much wage growth. Thank you. I'll take a few drinks there. Andreas, go ahead. Um, Andreas Billmeier, Brevin Howard. Um, so I wanted to contrast what you said today, in particular on the fiscal interaction, with something that one of your board colleagues um, said about a week ago, a bit more than a week ago. Um, and so I think his point was he was substantially less concerned about um, fiscal policy contributing or supporting demand in a sense that he almost reversed the burden of proof to say, um, you know, supply side issues are gonna go away. Um, demand is actually, or fiscal support is actually reasonably well targeted. And the risk is that we're falling into a state of low demand that causes potential, that causes damage to potential growth and to the downside. And so the question is, is it really just the assessment of the fiscal stance and the, the targetedness of fiscal policy in the euro area that you see differently because you seem to be very consistent with the view that you have voiced in the past and that uh, Madame Lagarde has voiced in the past. And I'm just, I'm trying to distill what the, what the key difference is, how you can end up with two very different views looking at the same topic. Okay, and the last one is two, yes. Reinhard Kluse, UBS. Um, in Jackson Hole, you argued that given the uncertainty, I mean, very high inflation, given the uncertainty over the persistence of inflation, also the fact that inflation expectations are at the risk of de-anchoring, actual rates of inflation rather than forecast inflation need to have a much bigger weight on your monetary policy decisions. So actual rates of inflation rather than future inflation. So at the moment, in, the ECB is almost like steering the car through the rear mirror rather than looking through the windscreen to the front. So what conditions need to fall into place in your view to, for the ECB to become forward looking again, rather than backward looking based on actual data? Thank you. All right, so th thank you very much for these very good questions. So let me start with the, with the last one. So I think there is, a, there is a misunderstanding of what I said. Of course, monetary policy needs to be forward-looking. I mean, given the lags that we are facing in our policy measures, of course, monetary policy has to be forward-looking. It's, it's, it's more a question about, I mean, how do we do that? So and one tool, of course, that we have is our projections and the models. And of course, these remain important because they give us structure to think about what's going to happen in the economy. But of course, we've also seen that these projections and the models, they have certain limitations. So they, uh, they help us less when we are in a period of structural change. They, um, uh, they also they, uh, cannot really uh, tell us um, um, what's happening when we actually get a de-anchoring of inflation expectations. I mean, of course, you could still do something. But in the standard model, you would assume that central banks are credible. And so you have this natural tendency of, growth, of inflation going down uh, towards uh, 2%. And this is why I argued, in order to understand what's actually happening in the economy, we have to very carefully monitor the data that is coming in. Because this tells us something about the medium term. So we are not starting to, to control you know, like current inflation, because we cannot, we cannot do that anyway. But we can see how certain shocks feed through the system, and we can learn, and we actually have learned a lot about like the pass through, uh, for example, of uh, from, from wholesale energy prices to retail energy prices, how that depends very much on institutional features in different countries, and so on. And uh, this is why uh, it's, it's very important to also look and to give a, to give a larger weight to the data that is coming in 
uh, because we need that in order to understand what's going to happen in the medium term. So we are as forward looking as we have ever been. So that's the answer to the, to the last question. Okay, so the question on the wages. So I'm not sure I would entirely agree with you saying that there is not much wage growth. What I do agree with is that wage growth is much lower than current inflation. And so this is why most people would probably agree that we are not yet seeing an actual wage price spiral. But that is not the same as saying that wage growth can still put some upside pressure on inflation. And we have seen that uh, wage growth uh, has been picking up. And uh, I mean, there are different readings of the number from uh, IG Metall. If you also consider kind of the one-off payments, the numbers are in fact a bit bigger. And they're certainly much bigger than they have been in the past. As you also mentioned, we have this very tight labor market. Um, initially, the, uh, the, the workers were basically bearing 100% of the burden from the terms of trade shock that we have faced. I mean, of course, there will be the attempt to, to, uh, to catch up, right? So, and this is uh, why we're looking so carefully uh, at, um, uh, at, the, at, these, uh, at this wage data. Uh, and I, th I always say, you know, you cannot say, okay, we don't have a wage price spiral, so we can relax. I mean, we need to prevent a wage price spiral. So we cannot wait until it's there and then we respond. But we have to... Uh, to anticipate that something is coming. And so far, if you just look at the trends, it's moving up. It's moving up relatively quickly. It's very different across different euro area countries. I mean, some countries have indexation. Uh, others, uh, you know, have, have much uh, longer lags and so on. It's very heterogeneous. But on average, we do clearly see that it's picking up. And so that is something that we need to monitor very carefully, and so I would not agree to your statement that there's not much wage growth. I think that's, uh, I, I think that's um, um, an understatement. Okay, so, um, uh, of course, I, <laughs> I, I don't talk about uh, differences in views between different, uh, different board members. Um, <laughs> that's, that, that, I, that I won't do. Um, so, um, let me, because you alluded to the, um, oh no, actually it was not you, sorry. Um, but uh, uh, your, the, the other speaker alluded to the Jackson Hole speech. So what I said in the, in the Jackson Hole speech, and as I said, I was delighted to hear that, that Dave made a, a somewhat similar point, is that the, uh, that the proper way to pre proceed in this situation is using a kind of robust control approach where you are thinking about uh, what is, which mistake is worse, like overestimating the persistence of inflation or underestimating the persistence of inflation. And um, so I argued that it's, it's much worse, and actually that's also what comes out of, of the models, that it's much worse if you underestimate the persistence uh, of uh, inflation. Uh, and therefore, even though I don't know answers to all these questions that, that you raised, I think uh, there are reasons to believe, and I, have, I showed you some data which, uh, which explain why I do believe that this is not unlikely, that, uh, that things could materialize which uh, lead to more persistent inflation. And in such a situation, the proper way to react is to err on the side of determination. So that is basic, and that maybe is uh, kind of a bit of a discussion uh, whether you kind of, uh, whether you need to be sure that the problem is there or whether it's sufficient that you think there is a reasonably high probability that this problem is there. And I mean, I cannot tell you conclusively whether the supply effects uh, will, uh, you know, whether they will disappear uh, or not, whether there is a, uh, you know, a decline in, in potential output and so on. But I think there are reasons to believe that that is happening. And in that, uh, in that situation, uh, in my view, uh, a prudent central bank uh, should err on the side of uh, determination. We have time for a couple more. So you were certainly quick. So what did I do up. to this pencil? I'm sorry, I destroyed your pencil. Actually, a part of it seems to have been lost. It's the price. So <laughs> go ahead. Um, thank you very much. So Georgia support is from GIC, Sovereign Wealth Fund of Singapore. I have two questions, but I'll be quick. One is... And I agree with you, fiscal policy is too loose and there's too much of it, but should we think of it in isolation 
or next to the shock. So if let's say, and I don't know, you'll tell me the numbers, uh, maybe the energy shock is a 3% of GDP, does fiscal compensate that fully or is still like kind of a negative hit in the economy from the combination of the two, energy shock and fiscal? The second question is, you show the potential stuff, which is very interesting. Could it be that the Nairo is now higher than before and effectively to get the inflation from 11 down to two, how big of an output gap we should generate? Are we looking for the unemployment rate to go up to three points, two points? Your forecast, not your, but the ECB's forecast is too benign. I don't think 0.4 higher unemployment rate will bring inflation down by nine points. I mean, if I take the forecast at face value, that assumes most of the inflation is transitory and we don't need to generate lots of slack. So I want your view on how much slack would be uh, needed. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Jamana Salahin, Vanguard. Um, my question was more about the inflation um, profile. And, you know, you don't have it returning to target until 2024, which is not next year, but the year after. So I just wanted to ask how confident are you in that forecast? And I think it's over 5% end of next year. And what are the things that you worry about the most? Thanks. And then if it's a very brief question. Thank you, Krishna Guha, uh, Evercore Partners. So, Isabel, you uh, emphasize, I think quite appropriately, the absolute resolute focus on anchoring inflation expectations through determined action at this point. Over time, what would you need to see to become comfortable that you had achieved that goal? Okay, so um, very interesting questions again. So, I, I uh, go backwards again. All right, so. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a tricky question, what precisely we would need to do, because uh, need to see, because of course it's always a collection of, of many things that we would need to, to see. And uh, I, I know that you know, market participants like to, like to know what is the one thing that you need to see in order to finally pivot and so on. But I cannot give that to you, I'm afraid. It's much more complex than that. Um, but what I can tell you is what, what, what I don't like about the, uh, what I see in inflation expectations. And this is, I mean, I don't like that uh, the, the right-hand side tail has become so fat. And we see that in, in different types of surveys. So there is an increasing share of respondents in the surveys that expect very high inflation in like in three years or something like that. And so that is something that, uh, I mean, there's research on that by uh, Ricardo Reis, for example, who, who has argued that this is kind of, kind of an early warning uh, signal. And uh, so uh, I think that is something that we would like to see to reverse so that, that this kind of uh, moves, moves a bit back and so that the whole distribution a bit shifts, shifts uh, to, to the left. I mean, I think that would be, that would be uh, very, uh, very desirable. So on the inflation profile, um, well, in a period as today where uncertainty is so high, we cannot have a lot of confidence in, in, our, uh, in, in our projections. I mean, that's precisely uh, the, the problem that we are facing. And I mean, we've seen that again and, and again, that um, uh, you know, our point estimates were not particularly good. Uh, and actually, um, I mean, I think we should talk much more about, uh, you know, the uncertainty around estimates that we have. Everybody's always focus focusing on this one number, but the, the uncertainty bands have, have gone up uh, quite a lot, which makes it, of course, much harder for us uh, uh, to, um, uh, to respond. And then you need this kind of decision rule which tells you how do you deal with that uh, uncertainty. And I told you how, uh, how I uh, deal with that uncertainty. But of course, I mean, so one thing that uh, I would like to stress is that, you know, uh, headline inflation can do many things next year. So, uh, I mean, what, who knows what's going to happen to energy prices? And you have all these base effects kicking in and so on. There will be a lot of volatility probably. And uh, I personally do not find that particularly informative. So uh, I have started to focus much more on measures of underlying inflation. Uh, because they are much better uh, in capturing what we want to capture, namely the persistence uh, of uh, inflation. And, uh, and I think that is actually uh, quite, uh, quite important um, because this tells us how uh, the original shock then basically feeds, feeds through the, the economy. But the uncertainty is unfortunately uh, very high. So, um, so the, last, the last question, no, I mean, of, of course, the, the fiscal package 
has to be judged relative to the size of the, uh, of the shock. I mean, that's, that's for sure. Um, so um, I, I think, you know, after, after the pandemic, there was a bit the perception that, I mean, that was a really, really deep contraction, right? And there was a perception that, uh, that we can easily get out of such deep contractions by having very accommodative fiscal and, and monetary uh, policy. And so kind of, I, I think that, uh, that a bit shifted the reference point that people now expect everything can be compensated. But, I mean, uh, the, the, I mean these big terms of trade shock uh, has made uh, countries that are net importers of energy poorer. And so this, this burden, of course, uh, has, to be, uh, has to be shared uh, uh, somehow. And you cannot simply compensate so it has to come, it has to come uh, from somewhere. I mean, if I look at what most people now expect as regards the, uh, the recession, the potential recession in the euro area, I mean, most projections point to a relatively short and shallow uh, recession. So it's, it's, you know, it's not the, the, uh, the disaster that many people feared when, uh, you know, when, the, when the war uh, started. And uh, so relative to that, also then the packages appear to be uh, very big. Okay, and then your, uh, I mean, the, the issue about output, output gaps and so on, I mean, it's a tricky one. Because, in, I mean, we, uh, uh, of course, nobody, uh, nobody knows precisely what the, what the output gap is. I mean, I tend to struggle when I see uh, big negative output gaps, a closed unemployment gap, and high core inflation. So I somehow struggle with that. So there is a somewhat an, an inconsistency there. And this, um, I mean, this could mean that actually our estimates of the output gap are wrong. And one reason why they could be wrong is that our estimate of the potential uh, output is, is simply wrong. And that was a point I alluded to uh, in this speech. So I cannot give you a precise answer to, <laughs> to your final question, but maybe that helps you a bit to understand how I think about these things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, we don't have a break. We're going straight into the next session. Okay, everyone's everyone's mic'd up. Wonderful. Well, um, hello everyone. Um, thanks for thanks for sticking with us. Um, my name is Samaya Keynes. I'm the Britain Economics Editor at The Economist. Um, and this current session is about inflation. Um, now, I'm not sure if you've noticed, but if you haven't, then let me tell you, uh, inflation's quite high at the moment. Um, and so what a, what a great time for this session. Um, I think my objectives generally are to maximize discussion, maximize questions from you, minimize interventions from me, um, uh, so my one, my one commitment to you all is that um, interventions include me looking very distressed when someone talks for a very, very long time. Um, so I hope that we can kind of pack in um, as much as, as possible. Um, so this session is going to um, talk about how we got here, how we got to, to this position we're, we're currently in, what is most worrying about the, the predicament that we're in, and, and how can we get out of it with as little pain as, as possible. Um, I've got a wonderful um, panel here. We've got, we're going to start with Charles Goodhart of the London School of Economics. Then we'll hear from Ben, ben Nilsson of Baliazny Asset Management. And finally, we will hear from Catherine Mann, who is, of course, um, on the MPC at the Bank of England. Um, and with that, uh, Charles, take it away. 
Do I start from here? And what do I do for putting up my slides? The slides are up, um, right. and I think wherever you feel most comfortable. OK. Right, I would like to start by arguing that inflationary pressures largely depend on the state of the labor markets. Now, take as an example that the central bank forecast the errors that they made in 2021 mostly came about from a failure to appreciate how tight labor markets would become from the autumn onwards. They had expected a much larger flow return of labor from lockdown and furloughs than actually occurred. I've just actually been at a conference on care and dementia, uh, and that was the reason for such a reduced inflow was quite largely the great retirement and also long COVID. Now, by much the same token, the Bank of England and OBR assumption in their forecasts that inflation will return to target and stay there or even go below uh, in two years' time is very likely to be wrong. Actually, one constant is that the central bank, not only the BOE, but the ECB um, and indeed the Fed, always forecast that their current policies will return inflation to target in two years' time. If you look back at the forecast made for two years' time in 2020, you will find that they forecast that it was going to be 2%. In fact, if you look at virtually any forecast of any major central bank, it is always that in two years' time, inflation will return to target. Now, I think in particular, this is certainly going to be wrong at the moment for a couple of reasons. First, the UK labour market has become divided into two really rather separate parts. The first being a private sector market where a wage price spiral is already merrily underway. But wages are not growing as fast as they are in the private sector overall because there's another part, a public sector labour market, which is held, being held down absolutely forcibly for the time being, by direct government constraints. It's a form of prices and incomes control. And the latter is causing all kinds of mayhem, a combination of declining recruitment, worsening services, and increasing industrial strife. You name it, nurses, postal workers, railway men, even shock horror, university lecturers are going out on strike. Now, you, some of you will remember the winter of discontent in the 1979, which brought the conservative Mrs. Thatcher's government into being. It's not going to be a winter of discontent. It's going to be a year or so of discontent. And it's not going to succeed and it's not going to last. There's the, the pressures imposed are so great, there's going to have to be a blow. There is going to be a public sector wage explosion and certainly no later than after the next general election when the incoming government, probably a Labour government, is going to have to rectify the distortions that already occur. The second reason why we're unlikely to get back to target, at least not on a sustainable, permanent basis, is that the growing scarcity of Labour and its resultant increase in bargaining power overall implies that the natural rate of unemployment has got to go up. That is, the rate of unemployment, which is consistent with stable inflation, whatever that may be. But there's going to be a huge amount of opposition to the idea of running our economies at a higher level of unemployment than we have at the moment. And there is already a clamor growing up, and it's going to become great, much higher. The, the pressures that are going to be put on central banks to pivot before they have sustainably reached the target rate, and unemployment is, high, is, high, is much significantly higher than it is at the moment, are going to be uh, too great for them to resist. And of course, they don't know the future, so they will, uh, they will inevitably compromise. Now, all this reflects the reversal of beneficial demographic and geopolitical trends that were the main, main reason why the three decades from 1990 to 2020 were so disinflationary. And it's these trends much more than 
better monetary policy that drove the disinflation. But now the trends are in reverse, and as the three slides that I'm going to show uh, indicate, I have to turn around. Basically, you can see that in 1970, the Chinese population charts were much the same as the world had before the Industrial Revolution. Then you got the fall in the birth rate, exaggerated by the one-child policy. And what you got was possibly the most beneficial, from an economic point of view, uh, movement in dependency ratios, massive rise in the working age population relative to the falling proportion of young. Um, and indeed, the old were hardly increasing. Then you move down to the present. The working age population in China is already beginning to fall, fall, absolutely, as in many other countries like Russia, Germany, much of Central Europe, and so on. But even now, the old have really hardly begun to increase. And what you've got in the fourth looking forward is a massive increase in the old. And the old are very expensive. As being old, I'm not expensive. The old are expensive. <laughs> because of those who need care. They cannot undertake the ordinary activities of daily living. And I can tell you that they are extremely expensive. If you have to put somebody into a care home and they need medication, it is massively expensive. Um, and the proportion of those needing care rises exponentially uh, with age. And the oldest of the population are going to become those rising most uh, rapidly. On to the next slide, please. <laughs> there you've got the dependency ratios. Uh, you can see that the dependency ratios in the advanced economies are rising now dramatically with the increase in aging, and that they, in the other uh, emerging economies, the decline in the dependency ratio is, is now uh, flattening off. And you can see how it's sort of, there was a, a, a point of inflection about 2010. It's all getting worse very sharply. Uh, the, the worsening was hidden by the fact that labor had become so bashed, decline in private sector trades unions, et cetera, et cetera, that there wasn't an increase in wages. Uh, and COVID has provided a trigger point. It is the trigger between the disinflationary uh, sort of, uh, period and the labor scarcity, much more inflationary, and it's inflationary for fiscal policies. Last slide, please. This slide is taken from the Congressional Budget Office, and it is intentionally done before COVID. Because what I want to show you here uh, is that the problems of medical dependency in particular meant before COVID struck that the outlook on present policies, as it then was, and to some extent still remains, on present policies, uh, of our taxation and our expenditures meant that primary deficits and public sector debt ratios were rising exponentially. Situation has only got worse, and we haven't begun to deal with the, the fact that we are shifting from a disinflationary demographic and geopolitical situation to one that is now going to be inflationary as far as the eye can see. Thank you, Charles, for that chirpy and upbeat analysis. Um, ben? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here alongside um, such uh, distinguished um, economists and with such a distinguished audience. Um, so I wanted to sort of help set the scene for our uh, inflation discussion. Um, Here's the really juicy stuff. Um, the disclaimer, these are my views, not those of my employer. So uh, here are my key points. <clears throat> um, the first is a simple point, but I think it's worth stating up front, as I'll discuss. I don't view there as being much uh, trade-off uh, between output and inflation at this juncture. Uh, inflation is high both because of the external shocks that we've seen and uh, domestic overheating. That's pushed the labor market uh, beyond its sustainable potential. 
notwithstanding the terms of trade shock that we're experiencing. Uh, so to first order, there's not much reason to delay bringing inflation back to the target currently. The debate's really about um, how this should be done in the context of a historically large real income squeeze that's just really getting started, recalibrated short-term fiscal support, um, high household savings, and the monetary tightening that's been delivered thus far. Um, one concern has been that with high inflation, household inflation expectations begin to behave unusually. <clears throat> On that, I see some relatively reassuring evidence uh, currently. I don't think that expected inflation has become um, sort of non-fundamental in some way. I think um, ex infl inflation expectations are high, and that's because realized inflation is high. So it's, it's sort of rational uh, to expect high inflation. <clears throat> I see the same in market-based measures, um, although there are always nuances and caveats around that view. One bright spot on the horizon is that global goods price pressure may now be easing. Um, uh, we see that in supply chains, and we see that in some of the China and the US uh, PPI numbers. Um, so while not taken for granted, uh, it, it suggests to me that a key focus for policy should be uh, on the labor market. Uh, and I completely agree with Charles here. Um, and here things are too tight. Uh, we've hit kinks in both the, uh, the wage Phillips curve and the beverage curve. And as a consequence, we see regular pay in the market sector rising at about the same rate as core inflation, but without the productivity to match it. And so on that simple measure, the real product wage that's relevant for the determination of inflation is not yet falling, despite the substantial decline in um, real purchasing power that's going on in the economy uh, instantaneously. Um, and it's on this final observation that I want to make an analytical point at the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, so you have to bear with me on that. But the point is that if the real product wage is rigid downwards, uh, so it can't go down, but it can go up, two things happen. Even if you have sort of mean zero cost push shocks in expectation, inflation will be biased upwards. And the second thing is that as the uncertainty around those shocks increases because of a European war, say, um, that also raises inflation in expectation, given that real wages can go uh, up but not down. So my view is that the standard sort of risk management approach to monetary policy, which emphasizes the inability to ease in response to large negative demand shocks, that should be modified to account for this. The constraint on monetary policy on the downside should be balanced with inflation risks on the upside. And it's the second of those that is more pressing uh, currently. Um, so here are some stats uh, just to set the scene. Um, we're all quite familiar, I suppose, with this, but CPI inflation shown on the left was 11.1% in October. Core was 65 Median CPI shown here on the right was about 55 on my calculation. This measure has been emphasized by the likes of Lawrence Ball, among others, as a better guide for underlying or cyclical inflation. As a median, it's sort of more robust to extreme outliers. In the UK, it used to run at about 1.4% when headline inflation was averaging 2 and core was averaging 1.7. And it clearly, at this point, points to excessive underlying inflation. Um, international comparisons, I think, are quite interesting. The UK's headline inflation rate is quite similar to that of the euro area and many major euro area countries. But the UK's core inflation rate is more US-like. We're both in the 65 range. And in fact, it's a little further nuanced because the UK actually has similar services inflation rates to the US and similar core goods inflation to the euro area. So in a sense, we have um, the worst of both worlds. We have some of the services related overheating of the US uh, with the globally tradable goods price pressures um, of the euro area, even on a core basis once you take out food and energy. So high realized inflation has triggered this uh, concern about the anchoring of inflation expectations. Um, when people talk about sort of de-anchoring, it's, it's not ever completely clear what they're describing. The evidential test they're applying isn't, isn't always spelled out. I would say that it, expectations are certainly high, but so is uh, realized inflation. And em empirically, that tends to push measured expectations up. So one very simple way to examine 
the anchoring would be to see if recent variation in expectations looks odd uh, relative to historical behavior uh, under the null that they were sort of anchored in the past, even though they moved around. So here I'm looking um, for the sake of argument at the five to 10 year measure from the city YouGov survey, um, hat tip to Ben Nabarro for sharing his data here with me. Um, so what is clear is that expectations do vary with realized CPI. The top left chart shows, however, that they've behaved pretty much as you'd expect, given the high inflation that we've had. Um, expectations also move with oil price shocks. But the top right chart shows that, if anything, long run expectations are moving a little bit less with spot oil prices than they typically do. Uh, the bottom left chart shows that uh, lagged expectations seem to be having about the same effect on contemporaneous expectations as they have in the past. So it's not obvious that there's a rise in sort of expectational persistence. Um, and then finally, short run expectations seem to be passing through. So 12 month ahead, say, inflation expectations seem to be passing through to long run expectations in about the same way as they have in the past. So this is sort of my way of saying that looking across this and no measure is perfect, et cetera, um, you know, one can sort of gain some tentative evidence that expected inflation is high, but sort of rationally so, if you like. Um, I would say something similar in market based measures of inflation. These are five-year, five-year forward rates referencing RPI in the UK. Uh, these measures are also highly imperfect, subject to several biases, definitional changes, variation in risk premium and so on. Um, it's important to have those sort of caveats in your head. Um, but what we see on the left is that implied five-year inflation five years forward has risen everywhere in the past three years, most notably in the euro area, where prior to the uh, pandemic, they've become very, very low. In the UK, the rise has been less sharp than that. Inflation, and to be fair, that's because inflation was already expected to be high post-Brexit. And we've seen sort of two-year, two-year inflation has been persistently elevated since 2016. So it's partly that effect. But the rise we've had recently is to a level just a little bit above the GFC level that we had um, in uh, 2009-10. But recall that um, CPI peaked at 5.2 in September 2011. That's you know, less than half the current rate. And despite that, inflation forwards are not far north of the GFC high. Um, so like household inflation expectations, if anything, forward inflation has become, uh, sorry, uh, the second point would be like household inflation expectations, um, the forward inflation rates have become a little bit less sensitive to oil shocks in the pandemic era than in the past, despite some very, very big shocks indeed. Um, so at face value, these don't suggest an obvious problem to me with monetary policy credibility conditional on, that is, conditional on the current sort of constellation of asset prices that is out there. So we should think of this as like a general equilibrium. All these things have to be consistent with each other. And the fact that uh, these things are not looking too alarming is consistent with the pricing, say, for the, uh, the path for bank rate. So however, domestically, it's clear that we've got um, some major bottlenecks in the labor market. Vacancies are very high, it's about one per unemployed person. And instead of pull these pulling the unemployment rate lower, we've actually hit a kink in the beverage curve shown here on the left. And this excess labor demand is translating through to wage growth shown in the wage Phillips curve on the right. The relationship is, you know, reduced form usually has a, a slope of about minus a half and it's clearly much steeper currently. Um, labor supply issues have accelerated this effect, I think. In the UK, like the US, we've had inactivity rates rise relative to December 2019, shown here on the left, and quite a big difference actually with what you see in the Euro area. Within this, um, substantial numbers of older workers have become economically inactive. And among working age, um, on the right, you can see around 400,000 um, additional workers report long-term sickness as a reason for their um, labor market inactivity. So partly the consequence of these supply shortages, wage growth is strong. Uh, private sector regular pay is up 6.6% on the year in the latest data and has accelerated 1.7 points in the last six months. So although um, real consumption wages are now falling sharply, 
wages relative to some measure of output prices, shown here on um, the on the right, real product wages, have remained resilient. And I would just say there's no sort of perfect way to measure the real product wage. So this is just a sort of you know quick quick way to do it, taking the, the ratio of regular private pay to core CPI. Um, on that simple measure. Um, Compared to the GFC, there was also some sort of initial real product wage resistance in that period, but it's, it sort of faded about a year after the shock. And, and that sort of slowing is not actually yet evident in this cycle. Um, and it's not obviously being offset by greater output per job uh, either. So um, my final point is that if the real product wage displays some downwards rigidity without being offset by productivity, then this has um, implications for monetary policy strategy. And, and here's my sort of bunch of analytical kind of diagrams. Um, so, so bear with me. Um, so, so what I've done is I show a, a simple labor market demand supply diagram on the left. I've shown a kink in the labor supply schedule. Uh, for whatever reason, maybe there's a wage norm or a concern to recoup purchasing power or a rise in bargaining power. Sub, you know, the, the real wage, let's say, it's, it displays this downwards rigidity. I've made it extreme here um, by assuming the real wage can't fall at all. Of course, you can imagine um, less extreme cases. Um, but what matters is that there's an asymmetry, that there's a sort of form of convexity in the labor supply schedule. Um, if the real wage cannot go down as easily as it can go up, then it's harder to bring inflation down than it is to push it up. And the output costs of disinflation become higher. Anticipating that effect, the private sector comes to expect higher inflation in a completely, you would say, rational way, um, given the constraints operating on the economy. So the chart on the right, um, which is a sort of version of a chart that um, Mark Carney showed in a speech, a very good speech in 2017, <laughs> I think, um, uh, uh, shows how a policymaker might try to balance higher inflation with lower output and vice versa when faced with a sort of cost push shock, which you can think of as uh, being proxied by demand uh, on the, on the um, x-axis. Except that if the Phillips curve becomes flatter um, for some part of the distribution of shocks, then uh, inflation is higher for any given level of output. Um, in expectation then, and accounting for both high and low uh, cost shocks, high and low demand, uh, expected inflation will be away from the target, even if the cost shocks themselves are symmetric around zero. Um, so again, this is like a sort of rational, rational expectation for higher inflation. There's sort of one last point I want to make based on this, which is that, and it has to do with risk management. So um, I've described the sort of way that mean inflation can, expect, expectations can move higher, but suppose also that you get sort of more uncertain about cost shocks you get both high and low draws for cost shocks, but they both become more likely. And arguably, that's the sort of environment that we've, we've been in. And because of the asymmetry, that pushes inflation up more when cost shocks are high compared to when they are low. And so a consequence is that higher sort of inflation risk raises expected inflation. And um, I would say that a risk management approach to monetary policy would respond with a higher policy rate um, all else equal. So this idea sort of modifies a bit the standard, the more standard, say, risk management approach to monetary policy set out um, very elegantly by uh, Charles Evans and co-authors in 2015. And that emphasizes patience around liftoff when there's a risk that you're going to hit the lower bound again in the future. Um, an asymmetric real rigidity like the type I've discussed can have sort of similar implications, but I think with opposite sign in terms of the implications for policy. Um, and in a high inflation environment with policy now away from the effective lower bound, this might tilt the balance in the direction of favoring a more aggressive approach to monetary policy tightening. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I thought we were going to be chirpier and then uh, I'm now not so sure. Um, Catherine. Okay, great. Uh, Thanks very much. Uh, it's a great opportunity to come here to uh, King's College. It's right down the street from my new apartment that I've been in for three nights. Very excited to be actually in, in situ here in, in, uh, in the UK, uh, where I'm under, undertaking some really exciting monetary policy um, activities. 
Uh, it's also already, always good to kind of see who's watching. You know, this is Bank of England watchers. I've been on the other side of the table uh, in some of my previous um, incarnations watching others. So um, as I say, it's, it's, and it is, I agree with Hugh when he says it's a very good opportunity for some of the kinds of exchange across, across some of the boundaries that, that uh, we, we tend to have um, kind of rigidified uh, somewhat. And uh, I, I, I look forward to these opportunities. So what, what I'm going to do today, and, and in some sense I've been very attuned to the conversations and the discussions and the questions and the presentations for the specific words that were being used. And what I've done here in, in my presentation, and maybe it's a good thing that it's, it's the wrap-up um, presentation uh, on, this, on this topic, is to uh, give us a, a set of voca a vocabulary um, for, for ways of talking about inflation. Um, I think this is going to be important because uh, it's partly, this vocabulary is, will partly help us understand the evolution of our understanding of inflation over time, so where we count, how we got here. Um, but I also think it will be helpful uh, when we think about um, some of the other uh, voices that are not in necessarily in this room. There are a couple of questions about other participants in the, in the monetary policy decision-making process and how perhaps they had a slightly different view. Um, so what I'm going to suggest uh, with this vocabulary is to you know, go get those people who know how to do word clouds and uh, go start going through speeches and doing word clouds on this vocabulary because I think it will be both very useful to help understand this evolution of our thought process about inflation uh, but it will also be, I think, very useful as you think about uh, pos uh, possible ways of projecting forward um, votes. And I know that's what you like to do, or at least some of you like to do. Uh, so first vocabulary were external shocks, also called terms of trade shocks. Uh, here are the two that are the favorite ones that we look at. And we say, yes, inflation has been driven by uh, energy and global goods prices. Um, we've seen these charts, uh, the left-hand chart before uh, uh, in Dave's presentation. It gives you an idea of going back to 2021, you can see that there was nothing, there was no there there. There was nothing to talk about in terms of um, inflation coming from the energy side. It only became a dramatic uh, driver of underlying inflation in the most recent periods, in the last six months, basically nine months. Uh, and you, yes, you can look forward at the futures curves as a way of describing prospects and risks going forward. Uh, but those people who will continue to talk about external shocks in terms of trade shocks increasingly now talk about those in terms of uh, the underlying cost to purchasing power. The are, we are poorer. Uh, which I, you know, I say that, other people have said that already. We are poorer, and monetary policy cannot offset that. Um, so you know, this vocabulary um, of, you know, these are external shocks, these are terms of trade shocks. Uh, back in 20, uh, beginning of 2022, we should look through them. These are not domestic. Uh, they are potentially transient, uh, and they were considered to be transient, ending up the lockdown periods uh, before, of course, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. Similarly, we can look at uh, goods prices from world good prices and, and UK out, output prices uh, as again, you know, where is this pro This is an external shock. It's a terms of trade shock. It's because of US fiscal support being so dramatic um, uh, or kind of late in the COVID period and the supply chains being so uh, bollocked up uh, and that those will resolve. So let's turn to the sort of the next vocabulary word, uh, and that is uh, a word that I also heard this morning. Um, it's the ratchet. Um, I used it in one of my speeches, um, also called base effects. Um, and what this point is is that indeed, um, you know, there have been these shocks. The price level has has increased. Well, you can see that on the left hand side. Um, that uh, you know that's caused inflation over this, this time period, which is on the right-hand side in the turquoise. But, you know, these shocks that have generated this increase in the price level, those will resolve. Prices will stabilize, as you can kind of see in the forecast there in orange. 
And once the prices stabilize, inflation dynamics are for deflation or disinflation, which you see dramatically in the CPI forecast on the right-hand side. Um, and so this is all, again, about uh, there was a ratchet, there was an increase in prices, but then they will stabilize, the base effects will start to kick in, and inflation will, will fade away. Now, again, the price level effect does represent a cost of living crisis. It does represent a, a being poorer, but again, not something that monetary policy can do too much about. Uh, or at least some of us think that. <laughs> um, or some of us don't think that. <clears throat> uh, so next vocabulary word, word, embeddedness. Heard that one a couple times today, too. Maybe I was particularly listening for, for you know, my words. The second round effects, It's another way of terming embeddedness. Um, now, we are in domestic inflationary terrain. And you can see over time how we have moved from, from shocks to ratchet to embedded. We are now in the terrain that domestic monetary policymakers have to address because you start to look at the services component in the turquoise there, 43% of the basket, and that used to be running at well below two for a long period of time, and now it's running at a very strong three. Um, those services um, are, are uh, 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 more domestically driven, more labor oriented, uh, and so all of a sudden now we are in, as I say, terrain where the domestic monetary policy authorities really have to, to kind of pick up, pick up their socks and do, do more work. Um, food and, uh, the food and beverages category, 11%, not, uh, not a big percentage point in percent of the basket uh, for, some, for some of the uh, people in the country, uh, much higher than that for others. Um, again, that uh, is used to have a zero, basically a zero contribution to the inflation dynamics in the past, now being much more, um, uh, much uh, higher contribution, about more than, more than 2%. Um, and I might note that my colleague um, uh, Swati at the uh, Treasury Select Committee uh, noted the role of Brexit in, from some of her students' research and the role of Brexit in affecting um, food prices. So embeddedness implies domestic dynamics. Monetary policy really needs to respond. We can also look at this embeddedness by looking at the time series of the prices of farms, uh, both their current prices realized as well as their one year ahead price expectations from the DMP survey and from on the wages side from the agent survey as well. These are both running more than five uh, to six to seven percent. Next vocabulary word, spillovers. Uh, you know, there is a, this is a small open economy in the UK. It matters a lot what happens in the global, uh, global economy, both with regard to policy, with regard to macroeconomic performance, um, and uh, with regard to the way that the sort of the global investor interprets all of that is in the form of the dollar sterling exchange rate, which is, which is the line that you see there. So we can de do this decomposition um, for, from looking at policy and macroeconomic effects um, in, the, uh, in the, the UK turquoise and the US um, orange. And you can see that basically the global factor for the United States has a consistent role in uh, playing for the uh, depreciation of the pound, which was then augmented by the uh, UK-specific risk-off factors. Uh, we have lots of different ways of terming our, our summertime um, issues. Uh, but even preceding that, even preceding that, it was already the case that there was a UK-specific risk-off factor that was driving the uh, sterling depreciation. And there was a bit of an offset there when it looked like there might be some more uh, aggregate demand coming through in the green. Uh, but, and, uh, but then, uh, of course, that has, uh, that has faded away uh, under the most recent set of programs. The, way, the one point I think I want, to take, uh, want you to take away from this um, uh, presentation is, this particular presentation, is there were a number of other um, uh, comments that the risk, uh, sort of the, the UK uh, uh, premium had, had disappeared. 
Um, and I would guess by looking at this chart, I would say not so much, that there's still a UK risk premium. It's being reflected in the exchange value of the currency. Uh, once again, we care about this because of imported inflation playing a role in um, affecting monetary policy choices. And the more you think about the importance of spillovers and, and the driving uh, factor, perhaps, of what happens in the United States and from the Federal Reserve, because, of course, they have a very different kind of uh, system that they are focusing on. They are above potential, whereas we are very much below potential. It creates some tensions in how we proceed. The next vocabulary word, again, this is, we're, we're moving through time here, as well as moving through vocabulary. Um, persistence. Persistence is about duration above target. And it's been above target for a while now, and increasingly so. Um, and we can measure persistence in a couple of different ways. As I say, duration is one, but we can also measure it in terms of of underlying dynamics. And, and here what is presented is the underlying, um, the underlying inflation measure, which is a dynamic factor model uh, used uh, here at the, at the bank in the turquoise, but also in terms of the average inflation in the lowest volatility uh, quintile of the bucket, which is in the orange. That's something that I uh, presented last January um, and uh, saw at that time that, that it was already of, of a concern. Um, the, the lowest volatility bucket tends to operate, you know, tends to be the trend, very low volatility, not change very much, and tends to be an anchor downward. In the past, it has been an anchor downward to, um, to the underlying, uh, to overall inflation. And so if it is now well above the uh, 2% um, uh, target, it's going to be, you have to start asking the question, what is going to be below 2%? to drag us back down in terms of the, uh, in terms of the overall core. Uh, moving on to the next vocabulary word, which is the one that is kind of my favorite, which is the expectations. Again, we've heard a lot about expectations. I want to focus particularly on medium-term inflation expectations. I am not going to, to address this notion that next year's uh, inflation is expected to be high because this year's inflation is high. Salience at the, at the gas pump or salience in the grocery store, uh, that's 100% true. No, no arguments there. But what we do care about is whether or not uh, firms, uh, households, and financial markets are thinking that future inflation, three years ahead, say, is going to be well above target. Because at that point, they start making those behavioral changes today, which are the things that we worry about when we say we don't want inflation to be the driver of decision making. It's three years from now, if it's a way above target, then decisions taken today by households, firms, and investors are being predicated on inflation well above our target. And so we care about these medium-term inflation expectations. So there are, uh, we've seen a couple of um, uh, references to these uh, expectations. Um, uh, Uh-oh, something went wrong. Uh-oh. Um, so it, get, get thinking about that, uh, medium-term inflation expectations, I have two presentation, two, two, two data sets here. One um, is the decision-maker panel, which asks about um, their expectations for CPI three years ahead. Um, and it hasn't been asked as a question um, all that much. But um, you can see that it's running at 4%. Um, this, there's also uh, underpinning that is the distribution, which uh, Isabel, you mentioned uh, that's in, in your comments. The distribution of this decision-making panel is very much shifted to the right. The second set of, set of presentations that you see here, which is a much longer term time series, and so you get a better sense of what's going on, um, and this really does show you how much distribution, looking at the distribution matters. Because if you look at the, the two year ahead, uh, uh, the average, um, the weighted average response, so it's taking the buckets weighted average, it's also running at the same 4%. If you look at the median response, which is what is usually presented when there's a single number being presented, they take the median, and it looks like uh, household inflation expectations are not uh, two years ahead or not uh, of inflation two years ahead, two years from now, um, that it's not so much out of alignment. So this chart puts together both that firms and that households are looking at 4% uh, when you take account of their distributions. And I might add 
that um, also the five-year, two-year that Dave presented this morning in his financial market chart is also running at 4%. Like maybe 4% two years from now is not such a bad thing, but it is not 2%. Uh, so if we put this all together uh, is, um, is this chart, which is a way of talking about both where we are in terms of the structure of markets, both household firms and, and financial markets, but also why I care so much about medium-term inflation expectations. So here we are, we, we you know, standard Phillips curve. Um, note it, notably, it is not linear, which Ben didn't have a linear one either. And nobody has a linear Phillips curve anymore. They, sh they really shouldn't. Um, so yes, there is stickiness uh, downward, not just in wages, but there's also sticky downward in prices. And our DMP survey shows that. So there's a lot of stickiness downward. It's tough to get uh, as much deceleration in inflation as it is to get an acceleration in inflation. But more important, I'm showing you a Phillips curve that has shifted. That's the orange one. Well, what do we mean by a Phillips curve that shifts? Basically, you can always, just like we do with beverage curves, you can have a set of Phillips curves that, are, that go out over time uh, and de depending on what infl medium term inflation expectations are. And so the orange curve represents a shift in the medium term inflation expectations that we have not kept in control at, at 2%. When we talk a lot, uh, and it's been said a couple times here, when we talk about why it is so important to get inflation back uh, to target, one is this, this like predicating decisions based on too much inflation. It really alters what the behavior of firms, workers, and, uh, and financial markets are. But the other one is that it is more costly. It is more costly to get inflation down once medium-term inflation expectations have become out of control. You can see that very clearly on this chart. Inflation target is at pi star. The bottom is how much slack. If we have inflation shifting out to the orange Phillips curve, uh, we either have the same amount of slack, Y star, and much more, much higher inflation, way above target, or we have to bear a lot more cost in terms of slack in order to get us back to target. So this kind of is one uh, representation, graphical representation of what it means to say it is more costly if to get us back to target if we let inflation get out of control. Um, I think I probably have no more time left, but I'm going to say, uh, uh, okay, okay. Well, then, I, yeah. <laughs> All right. So nobody's actually given, I, I showed you a forecast earlier. This is our, this is our forecast for uh, inflation uh, under the projections, our fan charts, as you're familiar with. Um, now, of course, th this has been mentioned a couple of times that, that first, we always get back to 2%. That is also true. If you look at every vintage, we're always back to 2%, which means we totally have credibility, I guess. Um, but, uh, but I think it's also important to focus on the conditioning assumptions. That's something that, that Dave talked a lot about this morning. Energy prices and the energy price guarantee, of course, is a very important ingredient. It takes about 2% off the top of, of measured inflation. Um, but of course, the critical one is that the bank rate is inferred from uh, the market interest rates. That was also discussed uh, in the context of it being too aggressive, uh, and that part of our communication uh, in our November minutes was to, uh, uh, to deliver that message to the market. Which, by the way, if you had looked at our market, uh, our so-called MAPS data, which is on the website, which is um, the sort of the markets, uh, the, the players in the market, not the market curve, but the players in the market that we talk to on a regular basis and do represent a large fraction of, of the act, uh, actors, uh, there's a very big difference uh, between the, the market, the uh, MAPS survey implied bank rate forecast and the OIS curve. Uh, so take a look at that because it, there's a, we think there's a lot of information uh, in the gap between these two different measures of what market participants think is going to be our, uh, our uh, curve going forward. Now, the forecast drivers and the risk, uh, the risks, of course, here's a base effect. I, I already said that the base effects were really dramatic. That was in one of my first slides. Uh, secondly, the economic slack. 
from the cost of living squeeze and the market uh, interest rate assumption. Uh, for those of you who were attending uh, Governor Bailey's uh, press, uh, press conference after the, uh, after the monetary policy report was issued, uh, he showed two different, um, uh, two different uh, uh, recession scenarios, so to speak. One with a constant rate assumption, the other one with the, with the market interest rate assumption. There were both uh, recessions, but the uh, constant interest rate assumption at 3% was a dramatically smaller, uh, 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 less deep recession and, and a little bit shorter as well. So the market interest rate assumption is very key. And then the third element there that forecast drivers and risks is the assumption of moderation of inflation expectations. So to my conclusion, we all know what we did in November, uh, so I don't have to repeat that. But these uncertainties down here are all about the words that I just uh, gave you for the vocabulary. Um, will the external prices stabilize, allowing the base effects to kick in? Uh, what about the financial market expectations? We have seen them moderate to some degree after, after the November meeting. Um, Underpinning the consumption, will consumers pro, uh, smooth more than projected? This is about the extent to which the price increases that we've observed and the cost of living crisis is met with um, a reduction in savings rates and savings stock uh, or, or not. And, and in this regard, uh, reading, reading uh, the uh, annex tables that have way too num many numbers that you would never put on a slide, um, comparing the savings rate in the OBR forecast and the saving rate in our forecast, you know, just look at that one um, and, and, and think what you think. Um, how important will policy spillovers be? We're hearing a lot about what the Fed might be doing, so forth and so on. Uh, that's obviously uh, important. Um, and uh, will medium-term inflation expectations drift back down to 2%? Um, you know, uh, one of the things I like about the fan charts is, is that allows us to talk about where we are in the fan. Um, and so everybody can have their own opinion, and which is exactly how we vote. We, we vote based on our own assessments of all of those vocabulary words, and, and then, of course, many other things, including fiscal policy, et cetera. Um, but that allows us to, to live amongst a, a collective judgment um, but also to be able to, true to be true to our own uh, reading of the data and reading of uh, prospects going forward. And so I can tell you uh, that uh, I'm in the upper part of that fan by a lot. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, I feel like Catherine set us all a bit of homework um, and things to... Go and, go and look into. Um, can I get some questions? We're going to take three at a time. Um, and where are the microphones? Yes. OK, can we have a gentleman um, there first? Hello, my name's John Fender from the University of Birmingham. Birmingham. Sorry. Two quick questions, uh, one primarily to Charles. First of all, in view of these um, adverse um, demographic effects and their influence on inflation, which seem fairly persistent, what are the policy options for combating these effects? Would, for example, immigration policy have a role? What other policy options are there? And secondly, um, I think this is more to the non-MPC members of the panel, um, in view of the changes in the way in which inflation seems to be generated, is there a case for any change in the inflation target? For example, uh, one possibility would be to increase the target rate, or there could be a move to a target range, or we could target CPI core inflation, or there may be other options. So what are uh, Charles and Ben's views on this? Thank you. Can we um, have Jan next, please? Thank you. Um, so a question about uh, forecasting inflation without forecasting monetary policy. Um, so, Charles, you laid out a, a very convincing case of these very long-run persistent forces, but you didn't say anything about what monetary policy can, should, or will do about these things. Um, and so that's my question. My comment is, you know, there's this sort of facile joke 
that you know I hear a lot as a follow, former policymaker, where people in the private sector say, "Ha ha, central banks always forecast two percent inflation." What a bunch of idiots! Um, to which I say, "Okay, if it's conditional on an unchanged policy rate or conditional on some crazy policy rate, then maybe that is a little bit silly." But that's not actually what's happening. And imagine, just imagine for a second. If central banks stop forecasting 2% inflation rates, what on earth would that mean? So this is not nearly as naive and as silly and as simplistic as you think. They are basically saying, we think we can do our job. And I hope that they will continue forever to forecast 2% inflation because I'll be very worried the day they stop. Wonderful. Thank you. And third question from Patrick. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Petra Gerard, uh, University of Cambridge. Um, one thing that hasn't really been covered in the presentations that was initially mentioned is like um, how we got here, and not just referring to external factors. But um, I was wondering whether Catherine would, would consider adding a, a, an additional word or two words to her vocabulary, and that is policy mistake. So to what extent has there been a policy mistake? Um, in particular, if we go back a year ago, um, in August and September, core inflation in the UK was already about 3%. So for any central bank with a primary objective of price stability, that should have sent alarm bells ringing. Yet, policy rate, bank rate stayed at a historic low of 1.1%, and the bank continued quantitative easing. Uh, core inflation rose further to 4% in November. Only in December did the Bank of England uh, end this quantitative easing and start raising the policy rate. Uh, prima facie, this really looks like a policy mistake. I appreciate your comments on that. Wonderful. Okay, great. Well, Charles and Catherine, you have two questions each, so I'm going to go to you, and then Ben, I'm going to ask you to comment on the comments. Um, uh, Charles, do you want to go first? Uh, let me start with immigration. I was at a Ditchley Park conference on monetary policy uh, it was just a weekend ago. Um, and one of the interesting things that I didn't know was reported by someone who's involved with, closely with labor markets. And he said that one of the major factors has been that there's been a complete sea change in the way that the British population feels about immigration. It was a very anti-immigrant view about a decade ago, which happened to drive Brexit. And that has now very largely disappeared. It's quite a, in, uh, much more favorable towards immigration. I have to add that I think the British government is actually in the wrong track. Because another of the things that was said at another conference this morning is that the proportion of those going to university in our population has increased dramatically. Where we lack is things like social care and things like agriculture. I and mean, if you saw the, you know, there aren't enough people to pick the crops. So actually what we need is not the skilled people. We've got plenty of skilled people. What we need are people to do the jobs that actually are not the, the population here doesn't <coughs> want to do. Now, one other thing that I would add is that the world as a whole is not running out of working age population. Because there's one sector of the world where the working age population is growing absolutely like topsy, and that is Africa. And Africa is going to represent a massive proportion of the world's population uh, in the next 20 to 30 years. And the question of how we deal with Africa or how Africa is handled is going to be absolutely crucial to our future. We all have to think much more about Africa uh, than we have in the past. Now, on the question of what central banks should do, um, I, uh, I always thought that central banks are somewhat less independent, with the exception of the ECB, than people make out. I mean, for example, the people get appointed to the uh, central bank uh, by the politicians. Um, and I do think that uh, the politicians are going to find it very hard to run our economies at a higher unemployment rate that I think will be necessary with the scarcity of labor 
worldwide or in the advanced economies, and particularly in China, that is coming along the road. I think in due course uh, that I know we're likely to be faced with, a, in the immediate future, uh, with a degree of stagflation, because the political system will not, I think, accept uh, unemployment at, say, four and a half, five percent in order to reach two percent. Over time, it may well be uh, that the political system and society adjusts to a more scarce labor market and that we do accept running the economy at a somewhat higher unemployment rate and eventually we get back to 2%. And I agree very much that we shouldn't change the target. I just don't think we're going to hit, be allowed. Central banks are just not going to be allowed to hit the target uh, over the next two, three, four years. The, the, the effect on our societies of higher unemployment is just going to be too great. They're going to, they, sorry, central bankers, you aren't omnipotent. You have to adjust to what society and politics want overall. Wonderful. Catherine, um, <laughs> what, what, what would that adjustment look like? Uh, is there a case for a change in the inflation target? <laughs> I think it's useful to look at some of the other approaches to the inflation to to um, the objective um, of a central bank. I mean, there is a lot of examples out there of multiple uh, targets. For example, the Bank of Canada um, uses several different measures, um, weighting things differently between you know compare the ECB and the Federal Reserve and how they weight things. Uh, so you know, it's it's certainly worthy to do some uh, examination of of how others do it. It's part of you know, central banks learning from each other. Uh, to sort of cavalierly say, we can't make the target, so we're going to change it, that's probably not a good strategy. It, it gets close to Jan's sort of um, uh, what happens when you, don't, when you forecast that you can't do it. Um, so uh, the um, comment that, I, that is more directly to me, I suppose, is was there a policy mistake? Well, conveniently, um, I can say that um, my first meeting was in September uh, last year. So, uh, so I uh, and I and I did not come in guns blazing, um, but I did vote to end quantitative easing early, and I did vote to raise the bank rate. So, um, uh, if there was a policy mistake, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, that's, but that's sad. I mean, I, I think that we, it was already mentioned um, earlier, earlier today that um, the, uh, a, main, uh, a major uh, institutional mechanism of the furlough program was still in place, and it was very uncertain as to how the um, rolling off of the furlough program would affect labor market, uh, the labor market tightness. Um, and if it has been mentioned by uh, my colleagues, by other, uh, other people who are not on the Monetary Policy Committee, uh, as to how important the, uh, the difference has been in terms of what we kind of expected in terms of the labor market dynamics and where we are now in terms of labor market dynamics. There are very big differences into, in terms of what was expected and where we are. That said, one point that I do want to make with regard to sort of the labor market story is that is not the whole story. Um, we get inflation because firms can raise their prices. So one interesting question arises if you have labor market tightness and wage increases and firms realize that they do not have the capacity to raise prices. You then have the transmission mechanism uh, through earnings, through redundancy, or so bankruptcies uh, and so forth of firms. And that's a very different way in which to achieve the equilibrium uh, target of 2% than just talking about it in a labor market context. Great. Ben? <laughs> um, so maybe on the policy mistake question, I think... Um, it's probably not in my nature to be super harsh on the bank. Um, but I think it's also important to control for sort of the information set that was available to policymakers at the time of the various decisions that were made. If you actually rewind back to sort of late 2020, um, you know, people who are experts in vaccine development, say, were very pessimistic about the chances of developing a COVID vaccine. 
Um, I read one paper at the time suggesting it was a 10% chance that a vaccine would go from phase two to uh, deployment over 10 years, uh, which is incredible. And around the time I read that paper, I think um, you know, we had the first approval for use in the UK. So it just shows how far off experts can be in these various domains. So you, know, you think about this information set as it evolves over time. Think about the summer, say, of 2021. There were 3 million people on furlough in May. I think there were 2 million in June. Uh, CPI inflation was 2% in July. Um, now, there's plenty of us, you know, armchair economists who say, oh, you should have been hiking then. But I think it would have been quite tough to do that. And if you'd hiked then, I think it would have been probably quite a small uh, hike. Um, so I think that's, you know, not particularly reasonable. I think also as you get through the year, I mean, remember as we're going to December, you had this Omicron suddenly emerge. Omicron was like two to four times as transmissible as what we had previously. Um, it was a big shock. Markets reacted to it. But actually, the bank um, hiked, uh, which was the right thing, I think, to do. And so in that period of time, I'm sort of not too critical, I guess, of, of policymakers. I think what's been more challenging since has been to sort of calibrate the pace of hikes as you come off the zero bound with these risks on you know, both sides, some of which I talked about. Um, the big shock has been on the labor market. So I think you know, the big so forecast error has been there. And if you want to be critical, I think probably that's where you know, there's been a shortcoming in terms of uh, inflation dynamic uh, forecasting. Um, there's a question about sort of, you know, were the MPC like behind the curve in some way? I guess in some sense, um, you know, if you look at like how market pricing would evolve over the course of uh, this hiking cycle, it tended to be the case that markets would sort of reprice dovishly around MPC events and then would sort of rates would sell off again after the event. And then in that sort of Standard EM sort of definition. That's one, I guess, definition of of behind the curve. Um, and perhaps you know one concerning aspect this year has been the decline in sterling, which has accompanied this what is quite historically aggressive hiking cycle. I say all this. I mean, markets definitely adjusted, and so even though the policy rate was moving somewhat gradually, um, you know, real real rates have moved at an historically large and violent um, rate. Uh, they've moved trough to peak like four percentage points, which is actually pretty huge. This is a five year, the five year say, which is pretty huge uh, historically. So, um, you know, I'm not too, <laughs> not too critical about it. Okay, great. Ben providing a more robust defense than uh, some, of, some of our other panelists. <laughs> um, uh, can I get three more questions, please? Um, Yes, Charles, you said that we were already seeing a wage price spiral in the private sector. Um, and given that the private, private sector real wages are still falling, I, I, I wondered if you could talk us through why you think there's a spiral going on there. Uh, great. Thank you. I've got a, a question and a, a comment. Um, coming from the background of a mouth-breathing practitioner, so definitely the least educated person in this room. But um, the, the question is for Charles. You mentioned that, and i inclined to agree, uh, inflation does correlate very highly with low unemployment rates. Can you have a stab at forecasting or, or explaining why that was not the case in the United States from 2016 to 19, uh, where there were very low unemployment rates and, and low inflation? I have a hunch it had to do with capital being deployed in the oil and gas industry inefficiently. And then the comment I would raise is just with respect to inflation targeting. Um, you know, money is memory. You guys know this way better than me, but at the boundary, money is memory. And a 2% inflation rate means uh, not, a, not deployed capital loses half its value in 35 years, 3% in 23 years, and 4% in 17. And that has a real impact on people's savings. And so I agree with the view that 2% as a target is actually very important just because holistically, people that underdeploy their capital get, uh, get taxed very aggressively if that's not the case. Thank you. Great. And then, um, yeah, gentleman at the back. Thank you very much. Martin Wheel from King's College. I suppose I puzzle over what the policy, how one might describe the policy looking forward. You can certainly argue that uh, unless Ben takes, you know, Ben's as confident in his models or view of the world as he 
seemed to be how things were behaving normally rather than abnormally. But if one lacks that confidence, is there really any alternative to keeping raising the bank rate until it's clear that inflation has turned down? OK, wonderful. Charles, again, um, thoughts directed at you. Right. Um, um, on the US, uh, what was keeping wages down was the fact that uh, goods prices were coming ever cheaper from China and elsewhere. And when you get a, when labor gets smashed, uh, the Phillips curve becomes much more horizontal and you can run the economy at a much hotter rate. And uh, labor was in, indeed in very dire trouble. And the, the real wages of the unskilled workers in the US, and I'm speaking from memory now, I believe have not risen from 1980, no, 1985 to 2020. And that was quite extraordinary. And it was largely driven by the demography and the um, uh, geopolitics um, that we had. And the working class got absolutely stuffed in America uh, over that period. It was the greatest 30 years for capitalists ever, but I don't know. Don't be an unskilled worker in the, the conditions that you're talking about. But it's all, that's going to change. And now, uh, the wage price spiral. Uh, remember that one of the things that has happened has been the massive increase in energy prices. Now, you can't get wages fast, growing faster than prices. If wages are growing, just growing a lot faster than is consistent with the 2% target. And that means with the present pressure of demand, the tight labor markets, that prices get pushed up. And as prices get pushed up, because there's a degree of real wage resistance and there'll be more, as I mentioned, particularly in the public sector, that means that wages will go up. And the, and the, the idea that people uh, sort of set their wage demand solely looking forward is just not true. They will set their wage demands in some large part, depending on what they thought was their post-tax real incomes, uh, has been in the past. So you don't need wages to be higher than prices. It's just wages are a lot higher than necessary to keep prices stable. Uh, and that's the wage price spiral. Um, and uh, what was the final question? Um, About whether there's an alternative to, to raising rates. Um, um, yeah, let me go back to Isabel. Excellent speech. Uh, the, w the public sector debt ratio is now so high that if you leave everything to monetary policy, you're going to get stuck. John Cochrane. Effectively, what happens is that interest rates go up well above the rate of growth. Either you would talk about nominal or real, it doesn't matter. And that means that uh, the interest burden increases dramatically. And the recession that is brought about means that tax receipts go down and public expenditure goes up. Now, under those circumstances, uh, to trying to do it by monetary policy alone will actually cause uh, crises in the public sector debt market, of which our local crisis was just a forerunner of the dangers that could occur worldwide, including in the United States. So that if you are going to actually uh, pr bring inflation down on any sustainable rate, you have absolutely got to have fiscal policy work in concert with monetary policy. Having monetary policy do it by itself is just no longer viable, given the debt deficit conditions that we now have. And I couldn't agree more with virtually everything that Isabel said on that front. Great. Um, Catherine? Yeah. So uh, I, I could have had added uh, a final uh, vocabulary uh, slide. Um, which would have the words spiral and de-anchoring on it. You know, I'm, those words were supposed to represent kind of phases through time uh, of the inflation dynamic experience. 
I didn't include those because we're not there. Um, I don't see a spiral. They are both rising, but I do not see a spiral. I agree with Charles's assessment that um, wage, neither price nor wage uh, dynamics are currently consistent with a 2% objective. Uh, neither of them are, but that does not mean that there is internal spiral between the two of them. I do not see that. Uh, and for de-anchoring, uh, we have flirted with that uh, kind of uh, assessment at various times in our discussions looking at financial market metrics. But once again, I think it is important to uh, make these comparisons between uh, the uh, MAPS survey and, and the market, uh, market data. Uh, be, because I'm a, you know, have been based in the United States for a long time and done a lot of, a lot of work on that, I feel I, I do need to respond to the, to the, to the comment about, um, about the wages and unemployment link um, over the last 20 years in the US up until the last couple of years. I agree, Charles, with your assessment um, and your explanation, but I think it's very important to add in some structural um, assessment of, of market structure, labor market structure, and, and, and product market structure, uh, and relate that to the strength of aggregate demand. Um, over the time period where wages were being crushed, which is or, you know, being smashed, I think is the vocabulary word you used, um, that uh, there, was, there was tremendous wage suppression, meaning that firms did not believe they could raise their prices because demand was not strong enough. And, and the way they maintained earnings so that their asset prices would continue to be robust during that time period, think about what happened to equities, it was through the channel of suppressing wage wages. And that's, that's where the smash comes from. But it comes from an origin of, sla of relatively less or insufficient demand, which of course got completely replaced by all the checks and everything that the fiscal authority put out for the US, changed that dynamic quite a bit. And it was also, it's also that firms did not believe they could raise their prices because their competitors were not raising prices. So once again, the competition framework was a very important reason for price, low price inflation that then be, was translated into wage suppression. Great. And Ben, did you want to... Um Back to Martin's question. Yeah, Martin's question. Um, I mean, this is the high value question. When should you stop hiking bank rate? I think, I mean, it's, it's also a classic, you know, monetary policy strategy question, right? So you can sort of um, choose the point in the chain between output and inflation and sort of choose which point you want to see the data turn before you stop hiking. Um, so if you're like, uh, you know, you've got your CPI target in mind, you're going to be very focused on seeing turns in the CPI data. If you're more of a divine coincidence person, you'll probably look for turns in the activity data. Um, I personally think that um, you know, the shift has been from divine coincidence to more thinking about the actual target variable, inflation. So I think that makes a lot of sense in terms of the policy reaction function. <clears throat> and um, that data dependence, I think, will probably last until you see, you know, um, measures of, say, what I've described as real product wages start to turn, turn lower. Um, and when that happens, then I think uh, you can slow down the pace of hiking. And monetary policy strategy you can sort of turn from what is, you know, got to be hi uh, highly data dependent currently to a slightly more forecast dependent uh, mode of setting. But I would, at this point, say um, there's obviously still more work for, to be done on, the, uh, on, on seeing the data turn in a way that allows you to sort of take your foot off the, um, off the brake. Great. Okay, three more, final round, quick fire. Um, we have Michael and then Chris. Thanks very much. Uh, Michael McMahon, University of uh, Oxford. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to target this at Ben because uh, you haven't had, and, and thank you for your little framework, which I enjoyed seeing. Um, first part is a comment, which is actually the risk management idea was first introduced, at least as I saw it, by Greenspan long before the zero lower bound came in. And if you go back and look, a big concern of the FOMC under his tenure was what Marvin Goodfriend termed inflation scares, and it was precisely losing the nominal anchor 
upward. So, so it's, in some ways, it's not new. It's just we had this zero lower bound concern come in in the middle. Um, but then the sort of question, and this could be answered by anyone, at some level, you know, we were told earlier that the market curve for where bank rate would go was wrong. And you sort of showed that actually, but with that market curve, expectations are pretty much where they should be. But if the market curve was wrong and it didn't go there, wouldn't expectations be higher? And, and somewhere in that, there's an inconsistency where someone's not understanding the analysis for why one institution thinks rates don't have to go up as much and, and markets seem to assume they do. So, so what's the communication failure? Thank you. Chris Giles from the Financial Times. Um, the panel's been talking uh, across each other slightly. Charles has been saying that there's nothing you can do. Inflation's going to go up. It's going to stay high forever. And you in monetary policy making community are stuffed because you won't get it down because either the labour market won't let you or politics won't let you. And Catherine and Ben have been saying, well, it's all to do with slack, expectations, all the normal monetary policy uh, variables that we think about. So the qu quick question to the panel is, Charles, what's wrong with what Catherine and Ben have said? And Catherine and Ben, what's wrong with what Charles has said? Wonderful. We've got our sub-chair sub of this panel um, here. <laughs> really reaction. And then finally, can we have that gentleman there? Uh, yes, hello. Yunus Aksoy from Burpeck, University of London. Um, so in the previous speech, uh, Isabel already alluded to model uncertainty in general, but uh, um, for an outsider, uh, it looks like these uh, uh, policies are more like aggregate supply shocks are managed by aggregate demand. Uh, 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 aggregate supply shocks are managed by aggregate demand. Um, but uh, there is also this a lot of evidence uh, now, I think, coming from the US, particularly uh, from San Francisco Fed. The cost channels of monetary transmission are quite important. Um, and uh, so my question, I think, to the panel will be, uh, can the central bank policy uh, uh, rates in certain circumstances uh, uh, drive inflation itself? Uh, um, and what is the evidence against that? If, do you have any evidence against that? Uh, um, and the reason for that will be that, you know, if the cost of financing for firms are simply increasing due to uh, higher interest rates, whether it will be passed on uh, to the prices in general, uh, which the, I think typical uh, firm will do. Um. Great. Um, wonderful. Okay. Well, we've got um, seven minutes left, so this is going to be a speedy round. Um, uh, what's the communications failure, Ben? I think there's a confusion about means and modes <coughs> out there. So if um, you look at the MPC's mean forecast, so this is very sort of in the weeds, I guess. But <clears throat> if you look at the MPC's mean forecast for inflation at two years, it's actually not far off the inflation target. I think from recollection, it's around 190, something like this. Um, uh, whereas the communication, I think, that was delivered around November was mostly about modal cases, except in the case where they were referring to the constant rate forecast, in which case they pointed to the skew. So there's a sort of like a bit of confusion around all this stuff. Um, I would say you could, you could read the the mean forecast is all being totally consistent, like the market path looks kind of like it delivers inflation roughly at two in two years. I mean, that's a, a quick uh, take there. Um, okay, so what's wrong with Charles's view? Um, so, uh, well, I mean, my view, my view is possibly a bit doctrinaire, but it's like that real allocations don't determine nominal variables over long swathes of time. Um, would be point one, and I think demographics is probably a real uh, phenomenon. Uh, the second is that um, sort of empirically it's super difficult to tease these things out because you're talking about sort of low frequency variation in inflation. There's not much of that in the data because we've only got it since 1950. Um, and at the same time, you've had sort of like highly correlated demographic trends across countries. So if you like want to identify empirically an effect like this, it's pretty um, challenging. So I mean, that's my two cents on, on that question. Um, can higher central bank rates drive inflation higher? Um, no, is my view. Um, there's a ton of literature uh, which estimates these effects um, with varying degrees of precision and, convinced, and how convincing they are. 
the other the other piece of evidence I think is the 1970s, where there was a sort of um, kind of flipped sign view of how monetary policy would work, and there was this idea that um, if infl if output was sort of like below potential, that would actually um, push uh, you could push inflation down by pushing uh, inflation uh, output output up via a cost channel, right? So I think that that, that view was completely wrong, and we sort of we kind of know that now. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, I mean, Cristiano Arkham Baum Evans has a cost channel in it, right? And that is the sort of canonical DSGE description of this thing. There's a cost channel there, and the effect is what we think it is. I think that's my, that's my personal view. Wonderful. Uh, so the, um, well, I'm not going to talk about the communication challenge, because I think we actually communicated effectively that we needed to raise rates uh, in the short term in order to uh, meet our objective with regard to inflation, but we thought that the uh, path of the market's rates assumed or implied path for, for us going forward was inconsistent with uh, meeting that 2% uh, target in the medium term. Um, so I think there's, you know, there were two elements to the communication, and I think that, uh, that we, we landed those two. Um, on the you know, how I disagree or Charles disagrees with me or whatever, is um, so there, there are two stories about why central banks aren't going to be able to do their job. One is having to do with debt and the financial markets won't let us do our job. And the other one is pol the pol politics and somehow the populace are not going to let us do our job. Um, I guess we have to proceed with doing our job and do the best we can in the, as an independent institution against both those uh, challenges, which I, I agree there are challenges there, uh, but uh, I will continue to do my job. Um, on the, I think, uh, Ben, you've handled the cost channel answer. Great, and, and, and Charles, feel, you know, go forth and disagree with your fellow panelists. Well, one of the things that in a sense surprises me is that I was always taught, perhaps it was wrong, uh, that real interest rates were more important than nominal interest rates. Now, if you go back to the summer of 2021, uh, what we had was inflation at 2%, you were saying, and nominal interest rates, I think, were sort of minus a half. And since then, nominal interest rates have gone up by 3.5%, and inflation has gone up by 9%. So real interest rates have gone down by sort of 6% over this period. Now, according to the people who argued that real interest rates were important, one would say that actually sort of monetary policy has been relaxed. Now, that clearly isn't true, but I think we need to ask ourselves why isn't it true and how far isn't it true and are real interest rates no longer important? Um, now, Catherine has, I think, done an excellent job in saying where the differences are and the differences between us, I think, are that the, I don't see either politics uh, and also this concern about debt markets given the debt, high public sector debt ratio I think that they are going to be severe challenges, and I think that they will overrun. But Catherine is right, I and mean, if they don't overrun, you will be able to get back to, to 2%. But I, I sort, of, sort of, A, I worry about the real interest rate point, and B, the, I, the, you know, the, these are the two issues. Will politics or, and or the weakness of the public sector debt markets, given the debt ratios, and given the problems the politicians have, uh, will they dominate? Now, the question about sort of costs of finance, um, I think one of the great sadnesses of uh, the last few years have been that both nominal and real interest rates have been historically incredibly low. And yet domestic inflation, private sector business inflation, has also been terribly low. Uh, you know, 
What brings me back a bit to the Radcliffe report? That maybe interest rates aren't that important, except in certain areas. And one of the features about central banking is they always say they don't want to deal with distribution. But actually, monetary policy has very strong distribution effects, particularly on the housing market. And I think one of the things that we will look forward to seeing uh, over the next few years, virtually everywhere, is what is going to be the effect on our societies uh, of a significant downturn in housing prices. And I don't know the answer to that. Wonderful. Well, what a, what a happy note to end on. Um, uh, thank you so much for your attention and thank you to our panellists.
Good afternoon and welcome to the final panel of the day. This is a panel, panel three, on independence and accountability. Uh, in, if you were looking at the programme coming here, you would have seen the questions that we were going to ask were things like, is there merit in moving away from an inflation target? Is there enough clarity on the FPC's remit? Are, are capital markets sensitive to changes in institutional arrangements? I, I, think, I think we know the answer to that one now. Um, has the bank become overburdened and what should be done to make policymakers more accountable? These are good questions, but I think in light of recent events, some other questions also are, are pertinent. Did the Bank of England bring down a recent prime minister and is, is that appropriate? Uh, did it exceed its powers? To whom was it accountable in the recent events? Or did it save Britain when there was no grown-up in the policy-making room? And I think we can take, you can, people can take positions on that. Anyway, we've got lots to get stuck into in this session. Uh, and we've agreed that we're not going to, as a panel, make any opening statements or speeches. We're going to frame a discussion. We're going to start with recent events and then think about more fundamental and some technical issues. And I'm going to not go to the audience right at the end. I'm going to bring the audience in through, which is what we talked about recent events. I think then we can have some questions and comments from the audience uh, about recent events, and then we can move on. So I've got a stellar panel here. So on my uh, immediate right, we have Lord Andrew Tyree. Left. As far as the audience is concerned. Okay. <laughs> very, very, very good. So not your right. Very good, very good. Uh, so, so audience right, because I'm trying to help the audience. Uh, I have Lord Andrew. No, nothing to do with your politics. <laughs> Tyree, who's former chair of the Treasury Committee and chair of the CMA. And then to his right, we have Susha Wadwani, former MPC member, currently chief in investment officer at PGIM. And to his right, we have Ed Balls, who I think now TV personality is that <laughs> the best you, description. You, you former, dance. former dancer, former minister, former cabinet minister, professor at Kings, professor at Kings, and an economic advisor to a long-standing chancellor of the UK um, economy. And to his right, we've got Vicky Price, chief economic advisor at CBR. So um, I just want to get um, think about the recent events. So. Uh, before the mini-budget, um, we saw in the summer a lot of thinly veiled um, threats being made about, to the Bank of England about its independence, about its remit, um, and its accountability. Um, what impact do you think um, these sorts of things had? And w were they appropriate coming from politicians? Maybe, Ed, you can answer okay. that one first. So I think, um, uh, I don't think the Treasury orthodoxy um, was either the, the left caricature that it always wants to cut spending or the sort of more recent um, right caricature that it wants to tax and spend more. But I do think that after the ERM, a new um, Treasury orthodoxy was, was formed. Um, and the Treasury orthodoxy was about the framework within which policy gets made the inflation target, central bank independence, um, fiscal rules, transparency in their budget operation, independent audit, first with the National Audit Office and then with uh, the OBR being established. And that that framework actually allowed a quite a lot of credible discretion um, to respond to the dot-com bubble, to the financial crisis, to the, the, the pandemic. Um, and people could make quite different choices about the rates of tax or the level of spending within a established framework, which while at times contentious at the beginning, Andrew probably voted against central bank independence at the very beginning, became cross-party in its nature. And what Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwasi Kwarteng did was that they undermined that whole consensus. So it was what they said about the Bank of England, sacking Tom Scholar on day one, refusing to have the OBR forecast, not making tax decisions within a macro fiscal medium term context, arguing that, um, that you could borrow for tax cuts and not worry about its implications for macro fiscal aggregates until later. And I think that when they tried to break from that consensus, we found out why we needed it, which is small open economies only operate effectively 
and have discretion and political choices within that kind of open, transparent framework. And um, it was undoubtedly, um, things were accelerated by what was then discovered in the, uh, in the vulnerability in the pensions industry. But I think put that to one side, because that was not discovered until the next week. And very quickly, you saw the market and interest rate reaction. And the thing which has been re-established is that, that treasury orthodoxy, that macro fiscal framework. And, you know, I can disagree with quite a lot about what Jeremy Hunt did, like I did with George Osborne. And I think probably um, Rachel Reeves could and Jeremy Hunt could disagree on aspects of things. But in general, the macro fiscal framework of the last 25 years, the consensus was re-established by Jeremy Hunt. And the clear indication he was going to re-establish that was what destabilised the, the markets. And so I think that this has actually been a very, very big macro fiscal event, which ends up hugely reinforcing the credibility of our institutions because we found out why we needed them. We found out by going through an experiment of not having them in general and seeing how incredibly dangerous that was. And, and well, you come from the for, for, other part of the uh, political spectrum. Yeah, well, first of all, you know, on my voting record, uh, I, um, uh, I, I was working for um, Nigel Lawson at the time that he first developed proposals for independence and strongly supported them at the time. Um, Margaret Thatcher dismissed them in 20 <laughs> minutes, in a 20-minute meeting, uh, and uh, which was very disappointing for Nigel. Uh, and I think um, um, did some damage for the country, but that's a, another matter, well, water under the bridge. Um, in 1997, as a newly elected MP, I, uh, I don't want to delay too much on this subject, but I, I promise not to, Chris, but... <laughs> Uh, I immediately said to the whips, um, only I don't like the look of this at all. I, I, I really feel I should stay away. They said, oh, whatever you do, don't do that. You're the only person we've got who might be able to talk about this left and bearing in mind the party's been decimated. Uh, and I said, well, I really want to vote against. They said, well, you really can't do that. And they showed me some instruments of torture, which I later turned out <laughs> um, not, not to be half as um, dangerous as they looked. So uh, I you learned against an, the whip. I learned no. I learned an early lesson not to listen to the whips, but to arrive in the whips' office having made up your mind. Um, on the subject at hand, I think that the episode strengthened Bank of uh, England independence. That is the the demise of the trusts, uh, uh, quoting budget and government, has left the bank in a. Um, very strong, in some respects, at least temporarily, dangerously strong position, uh, which needs some attention by Parliament and by parliamentary committees. I uh, don't agree either that the damage was done by uh, the exchanges at that time and the veiled threats immediately preceding the budget, but have been going on for some years. Um, and not only with respect to the Bank of England, but another, a number of other regulators. There is growing and deep dis dissatisfaction within the political community about the performance of regulators, including the Bank of England, and in my view, with some justification, although less for the bank than a number of other regulators. Do you want to just say what, it, what is the dissatisfaction you've got with the bank since we're at the Bank Watchers Conference? Um, hmm. I think that there is... Uh, a concern that they are vulnerable to groupthink, that they don't explain themselves properly anymore, um, that they publish heaps of material but not the key bits you need to see. Um, for example, um, it seems that the Bank Executive Committee is becoming increasingly powerful. The minutes of the MPC, but they don't publish minutes, the um, uh, letter of indemnity that created the QE still hasn't been published and so on. Uh, so there's a heap of material out there that the public might want to see, and which I think are a legitimate source of interest for bank watchers and many more besides, which they're not getting. Um, and I think that dissatisfaction is feeding through in one way or another to Parliament, uh, and Parliament is expressing it, as well as the, of course, coalition that you often get in Parliament in parts of the Labour Party and not just on the left, and parts of the Conservative Party and not just on the right, of people who didn't really want Bank of England independence anyway and think that the, uh, these decisions should be the preserve of politicians, even if they cost more money and increase debt service costs. Great. So we've got a slightly different perspective here. I'm going to come to the audience in a second. Vicky, from, from the outside and then, and then social, I just wanted to get your view as 
from uh, on, on the same episode? I have to say what Andrew uh, just said uh, you know, resonates a little bit because, uh, for example, it's only now that everyone realises that now that the Bank of England has embarked on quantitative tightening, they uh, are covered for any losses that they make by the Treasury, well, yeah, actually having to pay them, so us having to pay them for the difference of any losses, which can actually be very significant and have been apparently quite significant already. I have to admit, as a external watcher, I hadn't quite realised that this was what was going to happen. And then you wonder, why exactly have we embarked on QT right now? And what really surprises me about the, the events that have taken place is that a day before the mini-budget, the Bank of England decided that, first of all, inflation was going to be lower because of the energy price cap that was uh, announced by... Uh, well, a freeze, rather. There was, uh, by at a certain point, by um, Liz Truss, almost on day one of becoming Prime Minister. Then, of course, we had the death of the Queen, and things were perhaps forgotten a bit. But they also knew that there was going to be a mini-budget. They also knew, because the papers had written about it, the FT had written about it, we all knew that there was not going to be an OBR report underlying the, 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 the mini-budget. And after all, you don't have to be, you know, perhaps you, one was hiding in, on some Greek island throughout the whole period, uh, as one would like to do, and I did a little bit of that, the whole period of, uh, of the Listras and Rishi Sunak um, election debates, when it was quite clear what Listras had in mind. It wasn't, uh, I'm talking now about tax cuts, but I'm going to delay them until I see, you know, how things go. No, there's going to be an announcement about tax cuts in a week. So the Bank of England must have known and yet, well, first of all, they cut interest rates by, they increased interest rates by just 50 basis points instead of the 75 that everyone thought they would do, which was a bit of a surprise. And the second thing, they announced the QT just then and how much it was going to be. So the markets react, well, they had to absorb, absorb another 60 billion of sales in addition to all the extra borrowing that the government was going to have to do because of the energy price freeze. Uh, so, and then came this great surprise the following day. There was no surprise. We knew this was going to happen. I am absolutely astounded that the bank decided to announce then that it was going to do QT and therefore gave the markets increased indigestion as a result. So you really sort of are quite close to some people on the conservative right who are saying the Bank of England was to blame, or at least as much to blame as the government itself. No, and I definitely don't want to be associated with that side. <laughs> if I may, um, but but as an external unbiased watcher, it was a very strange sequence of events. I mean, well, one of the one of the things here is there's a Bank of England obviously convention that they don't take into account fiscal policy unless it's actually announced. And do, do you think the mistake was it was effectively announced? So even if it hadn't been in a, in a budget, or we had the, Dave Ramsden uh, in the, the the morning, and and it, he had said afterwards because of course even now the Bank of England uh, forecasts that have come out, as he told us, had not taken fully into account the autumn statement, and they were going to you know look at it all again and see whether it makes any difference in the next iteration, which I found really surprising. Because, of course, he was telling us in various speeches that they're talking to the OBR all the time. I just find it quite surprising that this fiscal side wasn't taken into account and that there was a, a decision made which then you know, was almost uh, you know, uh, led to calls. In fact, it was, didn't almost. It led to calls, which I thought were wrong, I have to admit, that the, to the Bank of England meeting immediately the following day and raising interest rates by a whole one percentage point. I mean, what type of policy do you run? I mean, what, what type of policy are we running, uh, which lacks credibility instantly? Uh, let, let, jump in let, first, but just to say, it's quite possible to say what I said and actually agree with everything that yes. the, both these no, guys I, said. I, 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 I don't disagree with that, but Sushil. Uh, I'm certainly listening to this debate. Uh, I think the first thing to say is we, we need a lot more analysis of this whole episode. Uh, the factor I think that's being meaningfully underestimated is that the vast overreaction of the markets to September 23rd was caused by a phenomenon we've seen before in markets. So I'm old enough, Charles is old enough to remember October 87 and the role that portfolio insurance played uh, in, in that crash. And this is what happens when instead of having nicely downward sloping demand curves, you get upward sloping demand curves, you then get these huge discontinuous price jumps. So I think the first thing is to aim off 
that huge price reaction over September 23rd and 26th because it was hugely amplified by the LDI situation. Once you aim off that, then I think uh, uh, you realize that the unfunded tax cuts actually played a relatively small role. Uh, the undermining of the respect for the economic institutions that Ed's talked about, I think, played a much more significant role uh, than uh, the unfunded uh, tax cuts. And while I certainly hear what Vicky says about QT, uh, you know, we had a wonderful session on QT uh, this morning. Uh, I think at a minimum, uh, one can say that the effects of QT in normal times are relatively small. Uh, and therefore, to point the finger at the bank, I think, is rather unfair. So I want to now turn to the audience. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I'm going to ask you a question. You, you can ask questions in a second. I'm going to ask the audience a question of a show of hands. Um, just kind of a show of hands who thinks primarily, so not 100%, primarily the Bank of England was to blame for the trustonomics crisis? No one. The government was to blame for the trustonomics crisis? <laughs> Everyone. And, and then to, to, to head off Ed's question, perfectly legitimate, who here thinks that independent economic institutions in this country have been strengthened by the episode of the past two months? But dare I say, Chris, today was an unfair question to the audience. You said primarily. I don't think in my case, I didn't say primarily. I said that it had contributed to this. And you, we were talking about Bank of England policy. We were not talking about... But that, that, that's fair, but, but I, I, can, I can set the questions to the audience. Of course you can. So, of course. So, and, I, and I chose the one I wanted to ask. Um, uh, to what extent should we, again, before we had the crisis, we, there was a lot of talk about changing the remit on monetary policy. Um, and, it, and it's part of one. Is that now dead um, as, a, as an issue because of what's happened, Sushal? So, so certainly uh, it was interesting that Jeremy Hunt uh, was pretty clear about setting the, uh, about leaving the remit unchanged, at least for the balance of this parliament. And that was all about regaining uh, respect. But I do worry with, you know, all this discontent uh, about the Bank of England. Um, you know, it's certainly rumoured that Liz Truss wanted to change it to a nominal GDP target. And there was certainly talk I heard of... There was certainly floated. I mean, yeah. Was, I mean, oh, it, yes. Behind yes. the scenes, yeah. Yeah, of a 4.5% nominal GDP target to accompany Kwasi Kwarteng's 2.5% real growth target, <laughs> and therefore really a back, uh, a back to a role of... Uh, a, a back to a way of increasing the inflation target <laughs> while telling the country that they were actually pro-growth. Uh, and, and that brought home to me the need, actually, uh, to take away the remit from the government and instead have vague language about price stability and give power to the central bank. Uh, I can see uh, Andrew shaking his head at that. Uh, and I, I'd love to hear your response, but it seems to me to be incredibly dangerous to have a system to leave something as important as the remit in the hands uh, of the politicians, um, especially as they can then exploit differences on assumptions about potential growth. I mean, at the moment, we've got a huge difference in the assumption about potential growth, even between the bank and the OBR. OK, so I think we should go to the former or current politicians. Andrew, first. Well, you, you, you should draw up a list of all those very important decisions that are too important to be left. The decisions are too important to be left to politicians, and we'll have quite a long list very quickly. We live in a democracy. This is a very important uh, decision. The framework, I think, at that point, Ed got right. If Ed did write this policy in '97, and I think he had a big hand in it, um, uh, change the remit at your peril. Um, these things are established and become accepted only after a long period of acceptance and use. And you should never give up thinking about whether you've got it right. 
but you should be extremely cautious about changing it. And the line of responsibility for decisions has to lie through the ballot box for decisions of that type. Ed, you, you've had a very strong view on how to operationalise an independence for a long time. Do you? I do, and I... So, um, two things, and the second will be about, about the, the social agreement. First of all, you can absolutely think the institutions were strengthened during this period while simultaneously thinking that Andrew is right, that there is a wider unease about the way in which the bank now exercises broader powers um, than it used to because of its broader financial stability objectives. And also to think there were a number of things the bank did in this period which were unwise and or potentially quite destabilising. And, you know, they, they, can, they can range from um, being communicatingly and policy-wise behind the curve this summer. I don't think it was true a year ago, but it was over the course of the summer, Absolutely. to the decisions made the day before, to this convention, which I don't think was, it dates back to 1997, about not taking into account um, the latest information on fiscal policy. I'm not sure where that convention comes from. I'd be surprised if that was there when Sushil was there. We should ask him. To the Bank of England, the governor's statement on the Monday, which was the wrong statement to give because it was then contradicted by his own chief economist uh, the, the day later, to give the impression that they were um, everything was going to happen through the normal timetables, when clearly that wasn't possible. The confusion over how long the guarantee for, 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 for pension funding was going to, uh, to last. So there's a whole series of things which I think actually the bank sort of slightly uh, messed up. So I don't think that they did this particularly brilliantly. Having said that, I think the Bank of England and the Treasury have ended up stronger because of this period, because people have returned to the consensus and the way I said. And the second thing is, you know, from the beginning, we knew we were introducing Bank of England in a parliamentary democracy. This wasn't a multi-state federation, and it wasn't a multi-country multi euro area. It was a parliamentary democracy. And therefore, in the end, the credibility of the institution, the Bank of England, comes from the political support for its activities from Parliament. And that is why the government setting the inflation target was so important, because on the one hand, it made it clear that the objective of policy was owned by the government, rather than something which had been hived off to the, the Bank of England. I think it gave the bank enormous uh, cover. And, and I worry, we'll come to this later, that they haven't got the same cover on the financial stability side that they've got from the government setting the inflation target. And then its symmetry was really important, because it dealt with the deflationary bias point. And then um, the open letter system and meeting the inflation target at all times, but having a system for deviation allows you to move away from the target for periods in response to shocks. And that is all, let's be honest, a normal income target does. It allows you to, um, to manage shocks within your target. But the problem with a normal income target is that the lags are, are too long and the lack of clarity is too destabilising. And therefore, of course, what you should do is stick with the inflation target set by the government, but go out of your way always to be explaining why we're deviating from the target and what we are doing about it. And I think that in the early period, the MPC did that really well, maybe sometimes in a more benign environment. And if you become less clear in those communications, it starts to become... Which they certainly have. Exactly, and they're, they're, therefore things become obscure. So, so I, don't, I would not change the inflation target, and I would be happy to accommodate price-level shocks while, and, um, and allow the inflation to move away. I think the open letter system is really important, and the bank has got to keep explaining. But the moment you change the target, then you introduce an uncertainty or a doubt, which I don't think is necessary, because we want to get inflation back to 2.5%. But if it takes three years, that's OK. And you will make it the subject of direct uh, pa party, partisan politics, and every election will become about whether the remit should be changed. And that will be catastrophically bad. I, I think it could mean the end of independence. Fantastic. Whereas politics has been brilliant. Actually, I mean, it's usually so wrong about this. Take away the important <laughs> things and give it to the independent guys. Actually, this is an example of the political process yes. acting in a very mature consensual, cross-party manner, manner over, you know, two and a half decades. I mean, that's really good. And we have one little aberration, 
and then it was seen off. There's just one thing that I, I agree with everything you've said, Ed. There's just one thing that I would amplify, and that is when you said, you know, the bank made some mistakes, and one of them was perhaps uh, in policy very recently, but not so much earlier. I do think there's been a hell of a lot of uh, groupthink in the central banking community globally, and the Bank of England's been particularly vulnerable. If policy had been even a little tighter, a little earlier, and Charles is sitting in the front where he's arguing for this, um, so it's not as if there weren't people thinking this through, I think that the September 23rd uh, catastrophe would have been a serious problem, but not a catastrophe. Oh, and it I'm was not sure made a, it was made turned into a, turned into a catastrophe yeah. by the fact that policy was already loose. Yeah. I'll be very quick, uh, Andrew. So, uh, I mean, I'm on record as having argued for a tightening as long ago as November 2020. Yeah. So I'm in the camp that yeah. uh, that that perhaps one could have put rates up uh, sooner and uh, done something, you know, about QE as well. Mm -hmm. Having said that. Do I believe it would have made that much difference? No. If I do a back of the envelope calculation, at the, in, you know, back then in late 2021, 20, I didn't know about Ukraine. I didn't know about what, what is going to happen to the inactivity rate. If I take those two factors away, instead of inflation being 11, it might have been seven or eight. Seven or eight in the eyes of politicians would still be a failure in the eyes of the great British public, would still have been a failure. I don't think it would have made that much difference. I think they're being really unfair to, to the folks at the bank uh, about this thing. You know, we all make mistakes. This was not the world's most consequential mistake. You'd have still ended up with inflation too high. Well, I'm agreeing with the way you framed Andrew, it, but just, just not knocking down my if, point. If I can ask you a specific question with, with your experience of running the Treasury Committee, I mean, this is where accountability is supposed uh, is where the bank's accountability is supposed to lie and of course the treasury committee varies over time uh, and it's just got a new chair now so we don't know what exactly the new committee is going to be like um but ed laid out quite a lot of things that he thought the bank had got wrong i haven't heard anyone in the committee mention any one of those to anyone in the bank when they came to see them last week catherine was there uh i was there too in the room uh what's going on with the committee it doesn't seem to be very it doesn't have a lot of teeth at the moment well in defense of my erstwhile colleagues they <laughs> they, they, they as one would expect on these these occasions um i'm acting for the trade union of um uh, former Treasury Select Committee, but uh, they, they have been distracted a little recently. They've had quite a few uh, exciting things to think about, and they've taken their eye off the ball of the examination of monetary policy, although very recently Mel Stride did some good hearings on the bank. I think that, I don't know whether now is the right time to come out with the uh, express these sort of thoughts. I think that the, the given the opacity which you were alluding to that seems to have developed in the way these decisions are being explained now by the bank. Um, the uh, snowstorm of information, but the lack of the key bits, as I put it earlier. The Treasury Committee now need to be very robust and do a number of quite vigorous things. One of them might be to send in specialist advisors uh, with the right to see any document at all uh, and have them look through almost in real time uh, everything that the bank is doing and come back on report on specific issues of concern. I did that with the uh, FSA, FCA, uh, on behalf of the committee, and they reported back in the first instance to the clerk, the senior official on the committee, and then to me on what they found. And then, uh, respecting commercial confidentiality, I and or market confidentiality, I reported back to the committee on that. That's one tool that I think needs to be resuscitated that we devised during the aftermath of the crash. I think more in a more um, adventurous form, but not that much more adventurous. Parliament doesn't have the expertise to follow these issues very carefully. We're talking about one or two uh, hard-pressed officials, uh, advisors working to the Treasury Committee trying to monitor an enormous range of issues. And the uh, 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 for, to keep an eye on the bank. And one of the... Uh, 
uh, answers to this is to create a repository of expertise more akin to the NAO, and I've uh, uh, charged specifically with responsibility for um, looking at the bank or maybe the financial regulators, keeping a, a much closer eye on them and picking off issues much earlier in order to enable MPs to ask the right questions. So I am making the case for a more activist uh, Treasury Committee now that we're in a more stable period with a what appears to be a proper government led by a man with the potential to be, in my view, a first-class prime minister if his party lets him. OK, well, let's open this up to questions. We can limit questions to uh, the period we've just been in here. David. Um, Krishna. Just wait, wait, wait for a mic, David. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, my question follows on absolutely from what Andrew's just been saying. Uh, shouldn't this be put in the charge of a retired high court judge or something like that? Shouldn't there be a proper investigation into the events leading up to and after the 23rd of September from all sides? You know, who said what to whom? What letters were exchanged? What WhatsApp was sent? Which people did the Chancellor see? Uh, either before or afterwards. It seems to me that if there's rules preventing the Bank of England from talking to people during sensitive periods, there should be a rule about the chance of the Exchequer as well. So without this descending into party politics, shouldn't one try to have a proper investigation into this rather unusual episode? Krishna. Thank you. If I may, a comment and a question. So the comment is when we say the institutions in the UK have been strengthened by this episode, strengthened relative to what? So strengthened relative to po domestic populist pressures, clearly. Strengthened in the eyes of global capital markets, no. There has been lasting damage in my assessment and in my discussions, I'm mostly based in the US, with global investors uh, in terms of the confidence they have in UK frameworks. Mm -hmm. And that has an enduring cost in terms of the actions that fiscal and monetary authorities and regulators will need to take over many years to restore that credibility. My question has to do with a, a further disconnect that I observe in this, in this discussion, which is when you talk to global investors about this episode, the, the centrality of the post-Brexit experience is part of the framing of that discussion, that in the post-Brexit environment, uh, that the U UK assets, sterling assets, are much more peripheral to the holdings of global investors than they were in the prior period. It's a much more discretionary asset. You can hold it, you don't have to hold it. And so given that you're running large twin deficits, the, there is a, a much greater need to be attentive to the demands and concerns of global investors, which to me reinforces the importance of Ed's point about you know, the frameworks are absolutely crucial to retain this. There's also a concern that you know, while we generally talk about steepening Phillips curves globally, in, in upward movements in the intersects of Phillips curves, again, the reduced contestability of British labor and capital markets and commercial markets post-Brexit is seen globally as making Britain more prone to enduring stagflationary dynamics and more generally at risk of a situation where populist politicians can't tolerate the lousy economic performance that lies ahead for households and therefore have to try to you know, bust out beyond the confines of conventional economic policy making. So it, are global investors just simply wrong to be putting those Brexit-related concerns as a first-order part of the story? Or is it just that we still can't talk about them rationally in the UK? Vicky, do you want to go? Yeah. Well, uh, yes, uh, very good points. I think it's the second we can't talk rationally about in the UK, but uh, the investors are quite right yes. because... Of course, even if you look at what happened to the exchange rate, yes, it's been going up and down a little bit recently. Forget for a moment the, the September 23rd impact um, because of a, of, a, of a slightly weaker uh, dollar because obviously there are assumptions made there about how fast interest rates are going to rise, which now look perhaps not so great. Uh, so maybe the, the pace will be a bit less so the dollar has suffered. But uh, there is no doubt that, that the, the weakness of the, of the dollar, sorry, of the pound since the Brexit vote has been due to a recalibration of what the growth uh, implications were going to be for the UK economy, which is basically slower growth. Uh, and we've seen that, you know, your, your points have been completely reinforced by the latest OECD forecast. Now, you may, you know, all forecasts are wrong and they will be proven wrong at some point, but 
but it does show how the, the UK is really uh, in a flatlining and will flatline. And it will flatline also in relation to its attractiveness to, to foreign investors. And you're absolutely right, in my view. I mean, after all, this is what Rishi Sunak, if we leave our prime minister even for a second, uh, he said, well, the markets, we have to be careful about what the capital markets think and therefore we'll be reversing all these things and do this, that and the other. So, yes, I think we're much more vulnerable now than we were before. A combination of factors, we've just discussed them. Uh, but it isn't just the September 23rd thing. It is really the longer term expectations for the UK economy, which have been downgraded and probably, I mean, the OBR uh, is probably quite right in its estimates of the 4% uh, reduction in, in growth and also our trading um, intensity has gone down. And of course, that affects productivity and growth. And, and that's where we are, I'm afraid. So um, I'm not sure I agree um, with that, and I'll explain. Um, by the way, just for David, I would do, you know, I think a proper Treasury Committee investigation where they ask all the questions, ask for the papers, and, and do the hearings, and then do a report is the best first thing. I'm not sure whether you need a judge, um, or I'm not sure this is an independent inquiry kind of, kind of thing. Um, I totally agree um, with what the gentleman said about the hit to our international standing and that being a weakening. Um, when I asked, when I answered about the Treasury and the Bank being strengthened, that was as expert independent institutions relative to their standing before um, Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng came in. So I think they're stronger than they were earlier in the year. And there's been a bit of a rebuff, rebuff to the anti-expertness within UK um, politics, but there's undoubtedly a weakening. I am not persuaded, and you can tell me uh, I'm wrong, that this is a Brexit effect. Uh, and I'm not saying that there's not a Brexit effect going on, but I mean, I'm not totally sure why this was um, suddenly re-evaluated so dramatically in a particular few weeks in, in, in September. That feels to me this is a much more long-term process to go through. And, you know, we have been a small open economy with the floating exchange rates outside the euro for 20 years. I'm not sure whether, 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 whether Brexit, or in particular Brexit in September um, 2022 is a moment of calibration. I think actually there was something else going on, which is a different kind of canary in the coal mine effect um, that, we, that we've seen, which partly goes to populism, but actually is sort of more international um, and partly explained why the IMF, the IMF statement in the days after was extraordinary. I mean, I would have been furious if they'd put that statement out when we were in the Treasury. What are they doing commenting on inequality in our tax rates? So that was outside their, their remit. Similarly, by the way, I thought the Bank of England chart, where they tried to pin the UK effect against the global effect in the last, um, you know, at the last press conference was also more than I would have expected the bank to do. There's like kind of quite a lot of... But what was going on with the IMF? And I think that the answer is that you've had, you know, we've had two once-in-a-generation, once-in-a-century events in the, the last 10 years, the global financial crisis and the pandemic. We've got rather used to this idea that um, it's OK to spend a load of money in a moment of emergency. And I think the markets were starting to think to themselves, well, actually, maybe governments have gotten, got a bit used to this. And maybe governments, you know, <laughs> maybe there'll never be another big corporate bankruptcy anymore because, because it seems that we can do these things and get away with it. And therefore, suddenly you had, and we were the first economy under pressure, bit of faltering, um, energy um, price guarantee, hugely expensive. Uh, the first you know, small, open economy, I'm not talking about America. Um, and suddenly we were going to throw a huge amount of money borrowed to solve an immediate spending. And the markets thought, oh, my God, is that what they're all going to do? And the IMF thought, oh, my God, I've got the, in two weeks' time, the international meetings, this has got to be slapped down. And so I think the markets were worried. Maybe this was the thin end of the wedge. Maybe we were the canary. And so actually what then happened was the disciplining of that then kind of impacted more widely. I think other governments will be less inclined to do this now than they might have been um, a month ago. It might be that we'll end up with a more of a recession next year as a result because bank, central banks will raise rates more. Fiscal policy will be less active. But I feel as though this might be to do with, you know, a worry about post-pandemic governments thinking they can spend and borrow and no, that we have just to... just unleashing a 200 billion euros as a support package for businesses and individuals. So it's going the other way, in fact. Well, well Germany's unusual. Here. But it is, is this the... Um, is this the fact that the UK now, that other, 
other countries always put anything to do with the UK in a Brexit context, whether it's Brexit or not, and that we are now we're st big enough still to be consequential, so we can be something that you can demonstrate, point the finger at the UK and say you're being bad boys and other countries shouldn't follow you, but we're not big enough to moan and cause them a lot of trouble oh, if we do. About the Brexit point, I think what... I think that Sushil underestimates the worry about kind of unfunded tax and spending becoming something which becomes routine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let's find another once-in-a-generation event which excuses, you know, debt's gone, we were talking about, from 35% of GDP when, we, when I was last yeah. in the Treasury to 90-something percent, in every instance, justifiable. But you start to accumulate this and you think, well, you know, <laughs> is this happening too often? So the markets were worrying about that happening in open economies, especially from governments who looked populous and a bit reckless. Oh, and by the way, Britain seems to be a bit populous and reckless these days because they made another popular, slightly reckless decision a few years ago. Maybe this is endemic. But I'm not sure. I think the idea that the markets recalibrated the trade effect of Brexit and took a different view in a few weeks, that feels to be less plausible than there, there was something about the nature of policy making in this time which, 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 which spooked markets about what the real objective of policy was. So I don't want to be misunderstood. I definitely wasn't saying unfunded tax cuts are OK. No, no. They, they clearly had an impact. I was merely saying that the lack of respect for the economic institutions was much, much, I much that, more important. I agree with that as well. uh, and uh, you know, certainly at an anecdotal level, I completely agree uh, with, with, with what you were saying. So virtually any meeting I have with overseas investors, uh, they have re-evaluated the role of the UK in their portfolios. So I certainly hear the same anecdote. The thing that puzzles me for the moment is that if I look at gilt yield spreads, CDS spreads, I find it very difficult to find much trace of that effect at this point. Catherine was saying earlier that in one of her models, there is an impact on sterling. But I always find trying to calibrate that sort of effect from an exchange rate model is sort of much more questionable. It's much purer in a CDS spread or a bond yield spread. Uh, and, and there, it's not obviously <coughs> discernible. Having said that, uh, you know, uh, I mean, these people who I respect a lot don't think my idea of strengthening the economic institutions by allowing the Bank of England to define price stability for itself will work. But I think we then have to be creative and look for some other ways of demonstrating to overseas investors that we've learned from this episode and that we're actually going to strengthen our independent economic institutions. And, and, and do you want to, to take David's point as well about yeah. I'll be very quick on the first point. We've been through a period of sustained uh, uncertainty and instability economically and politically, and one way or another that's ended up priced in greater scepticism about um, UK economic policy internationally. And exactly what triggered it uh, is difficult to know. How long will it last? Um, it won't go overnight, but it, uh, there are, the UK has a lot of things going for it, one of which is the very political stability that seems it, we seem capable of absorbing extraordinary political shocks without widespread civil unrest or more serious political dislocation, which is itself worth a heck of a lot and which the Brits tend to take for granted. On the inquiry point, yes, I probably should have launched uh, uh, an inquiry into the bank's performance during the um, crash in 2010. We discussed it as a committee. Um, I was under a lot of pressure from George and from... Um, uh, I was under a lot of pressure from George and a, uh, the governor not to, um, particularly the governor, uh, who, were making, uh, who were making the point that, which had some credibility, that we were now spinning into a, um, a Eurozone crisis. Now is not the time. And it was the do <laughs> doctrine of unripe time. 
which, uh, uh, as you, you've heard, as I'm very susceptible and naive and easily taken in, and uh, 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 as I was over the Bank of England vote, and so it seems that happened to me there too, to some degree. But of course, we did then have the, the banking uh, commission, which was critical of the of the. Uh, bank and we did launch an investigation into Bank of England accountability which led to substantial reform uh, of the bank's governance although not enough in my view in retrospect which we might come on to later. Yes we should have an investigation, no we shouldn't have a high court judge, they take three years to set up the inquiry by which time we've all forgotten what they're supposed to be looking at. <laughs> they also cost a packet and um, all of this needs to be done in, if an investigation is launched within a 12-month cycle, top weight. But you do need to allow Parliament to have some independent resources to achieve it, which is back to my point that we need some kind of new body within Parliament capable of handling investigations of this type with uh, inherited memory, with, with memory, a, a, a collective memory, which can build up over time to make investigations uh, high quality. Um, and it's just, just uh, as a point of information for everyone in the room, the former governor who everyone's been talking about, Mervyn King, is giving a speech tonight, uh, which I, I've read, has got, I've got it under a bug, I can't, I can't say exactly what's in it, but let's say he's much more willing to learn lessons about who's at fault this time round <laughs> than, than he was uh, in the 2010-2011 uh, period. I had a meeting with uh, Mervyn in 2012. And I said to him, Mervyn, I said, I think you look back on 2006 7 and think, shouldn't we have rung the alarm bell and seen what was happening? Because you've got the financial stability wing and a financial stability governor. Shouldn't we have done that? And he said, Eddie said, go back and look at the financial stability reports. It was all there. It was <laughs> all there. It was all there. And I said to him, Mervyn, I was a financial services minister and I met with you every month. And not <laughs> once in the whole year, did you ever raise with me any concerns at all um, reflecting those financial stability issues? Shall we look at some, some more technical issues? I mean, one, one thing that's very important. Far more fun to do all the <laughs> ad hominem investigations, <laughs> particularly if, if we've got the man uh, up before the beat this evening, by the sound of it. Um, so FPC and financial policy versus MPC, this is one, one key issue of accountability. Um, does the, does the, in your view, in the panel, think, do you think the links between the two committees, do they work? Are they sufficiently transparent? Does the government, ha has it given the FPC a sufficiently clear remit? Is it, is it working, I suppose, is the, is the overriding question. Andrew. Um, one weakness of the FPC right from the start I'm not going to mention Mervyn's strong um, support for creating it in this way, but it, it's an embedded weakness, is that they seek consensus um, before any of them speak publicly. Mm. And one of the strengths of the early MPC was you could find yourself listening in successive days to speeches vigorously differing on a key aspect of monetary policy, stimulating a very important national and international debate about where, where monetary policy should be, all to the good, in my view. And that's how I thought the FPC, within certain parameters, you, it, it's more difficult in financial policy in some respects, but not impossible, should have been conducted. But I've, I'm slowly bringing myself round to what I thought until I had a word with him just beforehand, was in fact Charles Goodhart's view when he came before the committee um, to give evidence on this in about 2011. Um, which is that I'm not sure we should have an FPC. I'm coming round to the view that we should have something more akin to the Fed Open Markets Committee and join these two together um, and uh, have the same membership. I'm becoming increasingly concerned that neither of these committees any longer are quite the force that they were, uh, that a good number of the decisions that they were taking have been sucked away from them uh, as a consequence partly, mainly, uh, as a consequence of, of QE uh, to the bank's executive, uh, and that this is an opaque way of taking decisions, um, which will, in the long run, 
weaken bank independence because it lacks the adequate uh, level of accountability in a parliamentary democracy. Um, I'm drawn to that view reluctantly because I don't like changing the pieces on the, on the institutional um, uh, on the institutional chessboard uh, uh, unless you absolutely have to. And I'm not yet fully convinced of the view, but I think that debate should now take place in Britain. Do we need one single committee? Do we also need more outsiders? I'm becoming a bit concerned that the, the body is uh, an insider's uh, uh, institution, that the two committees... Um, External, external members don't have, yes, don't have sufficient heft. Uh, and uh, it, that we, this may lead in the long run to not attracting good enough people into these jobs, but it certainly means that um, the public are denied the kind of debate, the informed public, that they need if with a sustained consent for these very important decisions they're now taking. So... I'm in favour of a public debate on quite significant reform of the um, shape of these two key policy-making committees. Vicky? Uh, well, what we know, and we heard it earlier as well, is that the two committees have slightly different objectives, if you like, so, and which could work completely the wrong way, you know, opposite each other. And we saw that exactly now in the latest events when the Bank of England intervened, could not do QT, uh, and the, the FPC decided talking, of course, to the MPC, that they were going to go ahead and, and do this intervention, um, which is, of course, completely contrary to what the Bank of England was trying to do. The fact that that calm was restored and therefore they've been able to go back to what they intended to do so is... So you weren't convinced by Hugh's explanation of exactly how it fitted perfectly He's sitting together. up there, I, know I don't you. know. I'll Still take up. his word for it. But, um, but <laughs> certainly from, from the outside, it looks like the two are, are, are conflicting. So the question of putting them together is... Is, is a problem. And, but yes, this transparency, I agree with Andrew, is, is, is lacking. But we've got to bear in mind what, and remember what Ed, in fact, did at the beginning, which was take away all the financial stability, um, no, uh, well, financial sort stability. of, well, a, a certain amount of the, the bank, from the Bank there of was, England. There was one deputy governor, yeah. and there became two, one of whom was introduced for the first time as the deputy governor for financial stability. For financial stability. So the financial stability of the Bank of England was strengthened by the 97 reforms. Well, you did take out the. You no, did we'll, abolish the bank of boarding, uh, the the bank of uh, the, the the board of banking uh, supervision, which albeit was largely micro pru. Uh, uh, right, you did a. Okay. You did right. abolish. So, 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 nine so, years later. Yeah, this is a digression. Yeah, this is a digression. Let's stick to the FPC where we are now. No, it's the question of changing the structure again. I mean, it took quite some time. For example, if you just think of of putting committees together, which is what, or putting, you know. Or taking one committee, putting it with something else, or having it separate, like like they do in the US, uh, it takes time to do these sort of things and to establish the credibility again. And we saw that with the formation of the FSA, how how it actually you know was putting putting all these other regulators together, and arguably took its eye off the ball. And when the whole crash sort of happened, it wasn't really in control of what the regulation in that area should be. So we have to just watch you know, new bodies and how they are set up if we're going to be doing that. So you, you say you think it's not quite working for the... because it didn't work in the... but you don't want to change it, is that the sort... but you... Yes, yeah. yes. Ed. So, I do... Um, I wrote a paper on this in 2016. I don't think this is an equilibrium, and, um, and I, do, I do think we need more change. Um, and I think there's a number of elements to this. So, first of all, the MPC worked because there was a clear objective... Um, by the way, a clear objective which applied to everybody broadly, uniformly in the country, and where you consciously went out to have independent members who were appointed to have strong voices. I mean, we deliberately chose Charles Wilhelm Sushil to be strong voices, to open up the debate. And it was quite controversial at the time because, for example, Mervyn was very worried about these strong voices coming in. Um, but it was deliberately done, and with opinions and votes recorded. <laughs> and I think there is an ish question as to whether the MPC has had appointments which have encouraged that strength of voice on the MPC side. As Andrew said, that clearly hasn't happened on the FPC side, partly because there isn't a clear objective and there also aren't published votes. It's done consensually. So there is not an encouragement about a debate. The second thing is I worry about the overlap 
of objectives, not least because of the lack of clarity of the financial stability objective. And you have this problem as to where decisions are being made which impact upon whose accountability. Now, you can choose to have an MPC and an FPC, although if the only people who are common to both committees are the executive, and you have different independent members, that is potentially disempowering for both sets of independent members. Um, they solve that, I think, in Thailand by allowing any member of either committee to trigger a joint meeting of the two committees collectively whenever they fear that a decision is being made in the other committee which might undermine their own accountability for their objective. And I absolutely think decisions being made by the FPC a few weeks ago, if I was an independent MPC member out of the room, I would have been quite worried about what decisions were being made without my involvement and how they impacted upon my accountability for the, for the inflation target. And if you're going to have two committees, you have to have more transparency and also some way of coming together. My personal, Paul Tucker, when I say this to him, always says, you can't merge them because then you lose the focus of the FPC on financial stability issues. I understand that argument, but I'm not sure that is as important as the ambiguity of the objective and the undermining, potentially, of one committee and the other. You think so, the Thai so, model is the best one, well, right? No, I, I personally would, um, would, would, I think, merge the MPC and the FPC into one uh, committee, but I think you could make them both work if you had clearer procedures about their relationship. But allowing this to happen de facto on the basis of the decisions only of the executives feels to me to be not a stable equilibrium. But then, of course, that then takes you to the issue of the objective, which is the most difficult one, because I said to, to Sushil why it was so important the government sets the objective, but the clarity of the objective and therefore the transparency and accountability for that objective is so important. On the FPC side, you have a range of instruments which can have a first-order differential effect on different citizens in different places or in different institutions in order to achieve an objective which is opaque and undefined and therefore um, the accountability is necessarily weaker. And that worries me. And actually it worries me as much for the Bank of England's standing because look, the reason why the Bank of England has got into trouble in the past on financial stability issues is because they made mistakes. And if they make mistakes again through the FPC, then it worries me about what impact you might have back onto the, 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 the Bank of England. But I'm quite neutral, by the way, about whether or not um, prudential regulation is happening um, within the bank or in a different institution. I think that's less important. You can argue it both ways. The reason we did what we did in 1997, because we were worried the bank hadn't done it very well, and we were moving to statutory regulation for all the non-bank regulation, and it was better, in our view at the time, to let the bank concentrate on monetary policy and financial stability and let the FSA establish a new independent statutory regulator for the first time. We can argue about that, whether that's the right thing, but that, the point is that the government sucks up political risk on inflation in the macroeconomy from the bank. The bank is the agent of the government in setting the inflation target. On financial stability, I think at the moment, what George ended up doing is piling all of the risk onto the bank. And if something goes wrong, that could be very destabilising for the bank and there'll be a ten temptation for the Treasury to say, what were they doing down there? And that's why what I've always wanted, it goes further than your, um, than your um, Open Markets Committee idea. I actually like, in a British context, the FSOC in the US. What I would do is have a regular meeting chaired by the Chancellor with the Governor and Deputy Governors, it could be every six months, in which you set out what we mean by delivering financial stability and in which the, gov the, the government blesses what that means de facto in broad terms and then the FPC's job or the FPC, MPC if you merge them, is then to implement those priorities as you, you set by government. the MPC model and try and... In, in I would try and, but I don't think you can do it by setting a very simple target. But what I would like is for the, for the in normal times, the government to have more ownership of the financial stability objective, and therefore then in a crisis, to have already established a regular way in which the Chancellor and the different Deputy Governors come together 
At the moment, what the, the rules say is that the governor and the chancellor will establish what ad hoc committees they may want from time to time. The trouble is, if you are, I mean, I've lived through this in my own experience. If you have a governor who says to the chancellor, moral hazard means we shouldn't act, and I speak for the bank, you can have a deputy governor down the road who's very worried about prudential stability, but they're not in the room at the moment, necessarily. And I think that is very, so I don't think this is an equilibrium. And if you, personally, I would look at merging the NPC, the FPC. I don't feel dogmatic about that. I think there should be an objective for financial stability, which is discussed in a remit regularly. And I think the chancellor should own that. And it shouldn't be owned by the bank because it's easy when it's going well. And when it goes badly, the Bank of England could be hugely yeah, damaged it's by it's something going wrong. Awesome. Um, and it's, well, it's, it's very clear that in the LDI um, crisis we've just had, that it's not clear where the buck stops because the bank says, well, it wasn't, it wasn't really us, it was the FCA. And this FCA says, well, it's the pensions regulator. There would have been an immediate yeah. meeting uh, of the, the FSOC equivalent, chaired by the Chancellor. There would have been a discussion that have said, where are we? The bank would have said, this is where we are. The Chancellor said, well, given my financial stability remit to you over the last six months, you must take the necessary action. They would go and do it but it would be clear that it was owned by the Chancellor. And the idea, Sushil, that if you don't do that and instead just leave it to the bank, that's fine until it goes wrong. And suddenly in that moment, your independent central bank looks very exposed. Vicky, okay, you well, to the central bank okay, or the FPC are no longer independent under your scenario. So we go back to actually the government. Well, is the FPC not independent? Well, it won't be under the scenario no, no, you just no, described. It's, it's, it's operational independence well, is the independence to take okay. action but, to be an objective okay, set by the government. It was a slight different point, which was that, you know, no, no, uh, okay. Uh, the point that I was coming on to, to talk about, to say, is that you're quite right about the, the, the lack of clarity of what an FPC or anything, like, even independent uh, authority would have. Because I'm afraid even if you have an, an independent one, trying to have more clarity as to what is expected, there are no real benchmarks. Every, yeah, every regulatory authority has of similar course. problems. So it's not unique to here. It's almost like saying that every central bank right now is not meeting its, its, its uh, inflation targets either. So, so you just don't solve it, but just but you know, the US restructure. Has the, the problem still shared by the Treasury Secretary. Susha, yes. you've been the only person on the panel who's been on any, any of these committees. Um, so I think your view is very, very valuable. No, you're very kind, Chris. Uh, but, and since everyone's mentioning their articles, I also wrote an article <laughs> in, in 2010, arguing at the time uh, when uh, George Osborne was putting his proposals forward that actually the NPC and FPC should be a single body. Uh, and everyone uh, except Charles I, I, yes. <laughs> tells me it wasn't Charles after all. Uh, and I in fact appeared before your committee, but in which oh, you oh. argued for it. Yes. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. So, but uh, but but anyway, I mean that's all. But everything that's happened since then has only reinforced my conviction that there should be a single body. Um, I, I mean, I mean to me, uh, there's such a relationship between financial stability and and appropriate monetary policy if, if what you're trying to do is achieve your inflation target at all horizons, that it's incumbent on the same body to discuss them. Now, the objections you normally get is that you can't get people with sufficient expertise to do both. I find that wholly implausible. Um, and, and, and finally, uh, as always, I found Hugh very persuasive this morning. The, uh, so perhaps this time it was OK. The only point I would say is I wonder if, Hugh, if you'd had a piece of bad luck and things hadn't stabilized in the gilts market and gilt yields had continued going up, uh, then with the status of the LDI sector, the bank would have found itself married to these pension funds and could have had to repeatedly go in uh, and intervene. Uh, and that would have been very subversive of monetary policy which is why I think it's critically important we learn from uh, what I think was a lucky escape and put the responsibility within one body. And I agree with Andrew, it would then be transparent and it wouldn't be with the bank executive. Questions from the audience? Yep, one, one there, and we'll take, we'll take two. One, this gentleman here with this. Jack, only if we can have a mic, please, sorry. And a um, gentleman here with the beard. Um, uh, 
Jim Smith, Resolution Foundation. Um, really striking difference between the conversation we were having about QE earlier, where we basically decided QE does nothing outside of a market meltdown, and the conversation during the Tory leadership campaign, where I sat and listened to Tom Tugendhat say that the only reason inflation was in double digits was because of QE. Um, I would be super interested to know what the panel thinks is the source of that kind of recklessness. Is it, is it the political debate? Is it Brexit? Is it the post-financial crisis dire macro performance? Is it the merging of fiscal and monetary policy under QE? I can think of lots of candidates, maybe all of these things contribute to it, but um, it's clear that we're in a different world of debate and from the US, um, you can see that that debate has, has scope to, to get even worse. So we'll, 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 what is the source and what can we do about it? Just, just, just wait a second. We'll take it on the question first. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, Phil Rush from Hedronomics, plus my beard, apparently. Um, so uh, the FPC MPC, uh, FPC MPC merger stuff is you know, a very interesting issue. But there's also uh, kind of overlapping institutional issues that have become more acute in the world of, of QT. Uh, you know, we've addressed on earlier panels the kind of fiscal monetary aspects of it. But there is also the debt management aspect. You know, one of the other uh, classic reforms was pushing uh, the DMO out as a, an independent debt management office. And yet... Now in the UK, we have two large-scale issuers of bonds. We have a central bank that is having direct fiscal implications on the occasions when it chooses to sell its bonds back. And this program you know, was, was a kind of a, announced uh, at a time with a, uh, the idea that it would be set on a kind of cruise control for a year, um, a time-dependent policy, and then it quickly ran into the wall of a state-dependent problem, uh, and it had to immediately adjust, putting on hold at uh, the start of those guilt sales. It's now already had to kind of resume, but not doing the long-end ones. Uh, and it's kind of innovating by having this open window to sell bonds back that's different from the kind of direct unwind of, QT, uh, of, of QE, might be the active um, auction sales. So... Rather than kind of do a direct unwind, sh should we not be kind of recognizing that maybe there are some inherent issues and maybe a direct unwind of QE is not the optimal way of the bank shrinking down its balance sheet? There are other ways of doing it. It is a little bit messy institutionally, but maybe it's better than the alternative, which is very messy institutional overlap between the Treasury the bank and the DMO. Richard, do you want to come in here first? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I got carried away. Uh, but but it, was, uh, it was what James was saying, which was, uh, I mean, really interesting to me. But I think it's a commentary on the sad state of the economics discipline and the sad state of the central banking community that people like Tom uh, essentially get sucker from people, including former governors of the Bank of England. So there is a former governor of the Bank of England going around telling the story yeah. that this inflation that we've seen was completely predictable mm. on the basis of monetary aggregates. Yes. Uh, going to do so tonight again. Again, yes. yeah. And, I mean, what he's forgetting is that it was the monetary aggregates that abandoned us rather than the other way around. Um, and that these monetary aggregates have given us false signals on many occasions, but for some reason, parts of Andrew's party have, you know, completely focused in on on on, on monetary aggregates, and then, you know, from there they, they go to QE, uh, and it's a lot of that debate is just intellectually dishonest, mm -hmm. if I may say so, and very depressing. And do you want to take Phil's uh, question as well about the overlap about the the, the different ways that the different issuers we have now of debt with the DMO and we have the Bank of England. Should the DMO be managing the, the, the unwinding the of QE? Or should we not unwind it quite like that? That's really the question. Um, pass. 
Okay. <laughs> who, who would like to take first yes. question? Um, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, we, we heard about the, the, the ECB up, uh, up to a point. I mean, the ECB, first of all, decided, as far as I understand it, not to do uh, QT for the time being until the rates are normalized, whatever that means. Uh, and the second thing is that there will be something in December, I think we'll hear a bit more about what the intentions are, uh, which will include probably starting by just not, um, not replacing whatever matures. So you can actually get to the point of, of reducing your balance sheet, if that really matters. But we were hearing earlier from, from Jan that it hardly matters what the size of your balance sheet is. You can carry on having a big balance sheet. And what's the real, what's the real pressure in doing something as, as, as soon as this? Uh, so especially when you're still going to have to be issuing an awful lot of bonds in the market to fund uh, you know, deficits which we're going to have for years to come. Andrew. I haven't made up my mind about the DMO. It seems to me that the DMO is a peacetime type institution, but not so handy to have around in wartime. And we could do perhaps with one institution rather than two that's looking after every aspect of debt management. Um, I, I haven't made up my mind about that either. It's a very tricky issue. Um, but I do note that when the government when any government gets into deep fiscal constraint, when it gets into a wartime environment, it's very difficult for it to hold at arm's length completely funding policy. Its funding policy and its fiscal policy become um, quite closely bound up together. So I don't have an answer to your question. I just know that there's another issue that we'll, we'll need to start thinking about. Um, I'd wanted to pick up on a couple of other things, if I may. Uh, the question that came in from the right is very broad-based, really, which is how, uh, where do all these funny ideas, wild ideas, come from? Um, they've been around these very purist approaches to monetary policy for a very long time, mainly on the right, but also to some degree on the left. They're, um, uh, they have a, a much readier audience now among quite a wide range of people in Parliament since you left, since I left, people uh, who are reflecting a deep disillusion with um, the way the economy is run, that they feel the economy is run for other people, that they're just vulnerable to uh, rip-offs. Um, there's been a decline in deference, rise in educational standards, and social media is enabling people to express this discontent more easily. The politicians who come along with these populist views are reflecting to a substantial degree what's in the electorate's minds. And it's important that we should, not all the electorate, but part of the electorate's minds, and it's important to that extent that we should see... Um, the pressures that get created as a consequence as a reflection of a democracy working, not a democracy broken. But we need to, democracies proceed by argument and we need to argue the case against these, uh, against these views. And I think there are good points to make. One of which, if I can just make a point that isn't related to either, very, very quickly. Um, you know, I was been talking about the opacity of, and how da damaging it can be the opacity of the way the bank takes decisions and the development of opacity as a result of these two committees, which is a point that I was making earlier, which is a tiny subset of this big issue of the way uh, you can help or hinder, uh, you can further consent or weaken consent if you don't get these things right. Hands up in the audience uh, who has heard of the concordats that the Bank of England has published uh, between the MPC uh, and the bank's executive, effectively, uh, and the FPC. Hands up, those of you who know about these documents. Okay, okay. well, this is about the most specialist audience that you'll, <laughs> you'll ever find. And I've got about, what have I got there, 15 20%. Um, if you look at this document, uh, at these documents, it is extremely difficult, even though I've been spending many years reading them, to work out exactly what they say. Did you put your hand up, Chris? Mm. You did. Well, I won't, I won't do a sort of three-stage uh, quiz on, on <laughs> what it contains, but I can tell you 
that uh, you'll be left none the wiser when you really want to know who's taking what decisions on what. <laughs> um, th these are uh, unacceptable, and a long time ago they should have been given a good shredding uh, by a Parliament, and if not by Parliament, uh, by a minister uh, quietly with the threat that he's going to go public with it. They've really got to do better than that. It's that sort of thing. I think the bank does quite well in transparency, but it's got to do much, much better now it's taking responsibility for such big decisions. Good. And um, Ed? So the, um, so on the, on, on the Q on, Q on first, I um, kind of gave evidence to the House of Lords Committee last year and had to go through the process of the one person on the committee who's obsessed by this, this um, issue. Um, I mean, from my perspective, at a time of really quite low interest rates, at the beginning of the pandemic, the Bank of England made a whole series of decisions very quickly, which were entirely justified by the inflation target. There was then a period of time when there was great uncertainty, um, in particular what the impact was going to be on the, the economy of the pandemic and how quickly. Um, I think I was always felt slightly more optimistic. Others were much more pessimistic. The Bank of England was the first to um, raise interest rates for the main central banks. I do think it got a bit behind the curve this year. But... Our economic history has been so badly undermined by foolish people who look back at past economic relationships and try to draw from that a, a policy rule. I mean, it, it sort of, it, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. And I think doing the same thing in speeches in order to, um, <laughs> to undermine institutions is also very, um, very dangerous. And I, it, it feels to me as though this is a, um, is somebody looking for a stick. Um, rather than a truth. That's how I, I um, feel about it. Um, on, the, on the DMO point, though, I mean, interestingly, this goes to opacity. Um, we had this whole plan to make the Bank of England independent. We'd written the letter on the, um, the Monday before the election on the Thursday. Um, hadn't discussed this with um, Terry Burns. It was the one thing which we hadn't talked to the Treasury about. Uh, the Treasury um, and the bank were convinced that we would make the Bank of England independent in a Maastricht-compliant way as a signal about the euro at some point in this first, second or third year of the government. So they were entirely unprepared for us not only moving on the first day, but in a Maastricht non-compliant um, way, which was a deliberate decision for the reasons we talked about, about accountability, yeah. but it was not what they expected. I spoke the day before to Gus O'Donnell, senior treasury guy. I'd met him a couple of times about something else the day before the election. And he said, oh, by the way, he said, if at any point you're ever thinking about making the Bank of England independent. He says, one thing you should do is, is set up an independent debt management agency that I would. And to be honest, almost no public debate about this in the previous years. Never discussed. I just wrote one sentence in, because actually, it looked interesting. We will establish an independent <laughs> debt management agency. We, we, you know, we've done loads and loads of work on loads of other aspects of it. Just once, just because I thought, you know, throw it in. And that one issue caused more ructions than anything else by far. The idea that Eddie George was annoyed at us about financial stability, they were so destabilised by, but Ian Plenderly's life was managing uh, debt. And then what you found out afterwards was the Treasury, unknown to me, had spent years having these massive yeah, rows terrible, with terrible. Bank of England opacity, you know, you know, you get a call at four in the afternoon saying the governor wants to tap out half a yard. And the Treasury would think, ah, oh, what, 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 who's in charge? And so what the DMO did was it established, separate from the Treasury or the bank, with a clear remit, a professional way of doing this. And that has been really, it's been really, really good. And that, now, you've got, you've got a complication in this period um, for, I think, good reasons. But, I mean, the one thing you don't want to do is go back to another round of bank debt management opacity. And the bank doesn't own its balance sheet. The taxpayer fundamentally um, manages this whole process. So I think it's, you know, I haven't not thought about this deeply, um, I should just say, because I'm not an expert on this at all. But, the, the, I mean, but of course, there should be a coordinated approach to this, using the debt management officer's expertise. And I would say that the one thing which has been a great strength of the Bank of England in the last 25 years has been using proper transparency to get good policy making. I worry in the financial stability side that we have a bit of opacity there. 
And what we don't want to do is go back to pre-1997 um, debt management opacity. So you are right to ask the question. I'm not sure I could, you know, a bit like Sushil and uh, Andrew and Vicky, I'm not sure I could precisely say I know in detail what the answer should be, but the, the one answer should not be to muddle through. And the DMO has been really good, and I would be using its expertise. Right, we are now out of time. Uh, we, I know we started late, but we're eight minutes over, so I'm going to have one last question, which is Jan. Uh, so if we could have a mic down to Jan now, and then we will wrap up, because I know there's drinks upstairs. There are, there are drinks upstairs. Oh, no, David, are you shaking your head when, when I said that? Have I just offered offer drinks and, uh, <laughs> and there aren't any? <laughs> Oh, well, it seems to be on me, then. <laughs> there, are, there are no drinks. <laughs> Jan. Thanks. Sorry, this is a, a, maybe too nerdy a point to end on, but um, you were saying I'm not sure what the answer is. I, I think there, there is a, a beautiful answer, which other countries have already applied, uh, and which I think would be very well suited to the UK, which is you let the DMO take care of QT. You just give the bonds back to the DMO. They decide either we sell those same bonds or we cancel them and we issue new ones that people want more. Um, they have the expertise. They've been doing it for decades. I think the answer is there. The only reason I didn't say that was because I was slightly worried that there would be somebody who knew a really, really good reason why that was a bad idea. I, so I if there's somebody who knows why it's a bad idea, they should tell us. But it seems to me to be a bit of a no-brainer, I, I would think. Maybe the Bank of England has an answer. You? You? <laughs> no cash in there. There's a mic coming from here. Mic's coming. Uh, the desire for greater transparency. Uh, desire for great, greater transparency and the recognition that there was a certain amount of uh, good luck, to use uh, um, Sushil's words. I think that is something that has to be recognised. Um, where, I, where I have a kind of broader question, and of course this is part of it, is, I mean, the big question is, I think a very good point was made about the clarity of the principal agent relationship on monetary policy and how that promotes transparency and has been effective over the last 25 years on average. Whereas having a committee which has multiple responsibilities, which I think is the logical conclusion of what you're describing, is one that then may cloud that element of the success. So I, I think there's a little bit, uh, in my mind, of an inconsistency here. And I think some of that falls into this discussion of Debt Management Office too. Um, I mean, it has been discussed internally, the, some version of what's just been mentioned. But if you think about, actually, I'm sitting next to Petra. So Petra asked this question this morning around, um, why don't you sterilize? But you could also ask the question, if the, if the issue is, there were too many long-dated guilds out there. Why not have held on LDI balance sheets? Why not, in a leveraged way, why not have them swapped with shorter data guilds at the DMO? And you keep the bank out of it. So, you know, I think it, it sort of illustrates the point that either you put everything together or you draw lines. And once you draw lines, there's quite a lot of ambiguity. And what works in real time, in wartime conditions, I think that's a very good analogy, I think, um, uh, of course, what works works and what doesn't work doesn't work. Those are things that are judged after the fact. But trying to have in the peacetime the patience to work your way through that system, I think that's what we should try and do. How but I think it is a different. How would the handle everything going to the DMO? How would they feel about that, well, really? I mean, as someone who as, sits... As a former you know, observer, indeed, participant in these meetings and funding meetings, over many years between the Treasury and the bank, many in the 80s, where there used to be blood and teeth all over the place, <laughs> in, just as you yeah. said. Well, I mean, I think it does get to this question of, you know, different parts of the bank or different objectives have different responsibilities. So, I mean, I think the beauty, and I think it is a certain beauty of the 1997 arrangement, is that it has this clarity of what the MPC is trying to do, which gives this priority to price stability expressed by the inflation target over these type of issues. And I think that's something which has been hard won and is very consistent with, I think, the ambitions and can easily be lost. So, I mean, that, that's a, not really an answer to your question, but I think that the, the, the point is 
once you start giving the bank other responsibilities, or perhaps giving the MPC within the bank those other responsibilities, or merging the MPC with other parts of the bank, um, I think some of that clarity is lost. And as someone who is sitting from the monetary policy side of the bank, right, so I'm not speaking for others, uh, and being a relative newcomer to that world, I think there is something powerful about this which I would be worried if I thought we were going to lose. And have you looked at the Thailand model? <laughs> I, <laughs> I've well, looked, at, I've looked at the looking, Cambodian model. Everyone will be <laughs> looking up the Thailand model now, but I do think we have to wrap it up. Can I ask you just one very oh, quick supplementary? Oh, this is, it's, getting out, it's getting out of control now. Okay, yeah. sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I do think it's great that Hugh's answering questions here as a, as a, as a piece of transparency. Yeah. But go ahead, Sushil. Sure. I'm sorry. So, so uh, I mean, I hear you loud and clear, and a, a, a lot of what you just said made a lot of sense. It's, but when I was on the MPC, when I was on the MPC, we were always looking for other tools, and I, I still remember David Clementi was a deputy governor talking about these ridiculous mortgages that Northern Rock was giving. And we desperately wanted an, another tool, and we wanted it in that committee. Uh, and so, so I guess my argument would be that having a unified MPC, FPC, would give that body more tools to actually deliver the monetary policy mandate better. If you read this concorda, it tells you that the tools are at the discretion of the bank executive, or it appears yes. to, not the uh, MPC. Not right, the MPC. I think we are, we are actually going to have to wrap it up. Sorry, Catherine, we are now going to wrap it up. Um, I just wanted to say thank you very much to the panel. I think, look, I think we, I'm actually going to wrap it. It's nothing to do with Catherine, but we, otherwise it's just going to go on and on. I mean, people can have a conversation afterwards, and I would encourage that. Um, I think we've learnt that the economic institutions of the UK have certainly improved over the past. Their, their reputation has been enhanced and improved, and that's a very good thing, although not necessarily globally. They've been, domestically, yes. Globally, there's still uh, work to do. And that means that this sort of panel will be very important in years to come to chew over how much progress we've made, hopefully, in the second Bank of England Watchers Conference this time next year. Thank you very much, everyone.